Let's be seated. We'll begin shortly. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, 2023 International Conference Tackling Disruptive Technology in the Era of Digital Transformation, hosted by KIPA, Korea Institute of Public Administration. Uh, my name is Sung Hon Hong. I'm a member of the organizing committee and also working at KIPA. Uh, this today conference is co-organized by KIPA and Korea Legislation Research Institute and the Northern Territory Academic Center for Cybersecurity and Innovation at Charles Darwin University. And also generously supported by the Ministry of Education, the National Research Foundation, and Amazon Web Services and WINS. Um, let me briefly tell you about the conference. The conference has uh, three sessions over two days. Uh, the first session is on AI-based public service, which is in this morning. And the second session is about AI ethics in the, this afternoon. And tomorrow morning, we'll have the third session on cybersecurity. Okay, before starting uh, our sessions, uh, we have three distinguished speakers who join us kindly today to celebrate it. So first of all, please join me welcome Dr. Sang Han Cho, Cho uh, Chue, uh, the president of KIPA, who is going to deliver opening remarks. <웃음> 안녕하세요. 어, 한국행정연구원장 최상한이라고 합니다. 오늘은 제가 한국말로 인사를 드려야 되는데요. 어, 한국말이 유창하지 않았어. 여기 있는 우리 사회를 보는 홍성은 박사께서 영어로 인사하는 게 좋겠다 해서 유창하지 않지만 <웃음> 영어로 인사를 <웃음> 드리겠습니다. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this year's international conference hosted by my institute. Special welcome to Chairperson Jung Hae Gu of the National Research Council. President Han Young Su of the Korea Registration Research Institute and President Kwon Ho Yeol of the Korea Information Society Development Institute. Before we get started, I would also like to thank our partners and supporters for their kind cooperation and generous support. A special thanks to Anti Academic Center for Cybersecurity and Innovation at Charles Darwin University, the Ministry of Education, the National Research Foundation, Amazon Web Services, and WINS. As we all know, digital technologies have transformed every corner of our society. Big techs are in the fierce global competition to develop AI technologies and services that provide a bespoke customer experience. Governments worldwide are utilizing AI and big data analysis to modernize their administrative systems and deliver more efficient public services. We all know that AI can empower human capabilities through diverse private and public enterprises. However, it also brings about considerable ethical concerns, social disruptions, and security risks that must be addressed. For the next two days, certain papers will be presented and discussed in this room. We are honored to have this distinguished group joining us to share their latest research findings and engage in productive discussions. 
I hope that this conference will provide a platform to address the ethical challenges of AI technologies. Before I close, I want to give a special thanks to the organizing committee and our staff for preparing this wonderful occasion. Once again, I thank you all for attending and I look forward to this conference. Thank you, President. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Han Young, the President of Korea Legislation Research Institute, will deliver welcome remarks. Please join me and welcome him. Uh,今朝,おねる,はくすりへんさえ,uh,参加へじゅしん,けんげいもんさえ、よんごえ,uh,はんごくへんじょんよんごえ,ほじゅ、さいぼぼぼんへくしんよんごせんた,とうり、は
우리 법제연구원의 실무자들께도 그 수고에 대해서 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 오늘 참석해 주신 데 대해서 다시 한번 감사의 말씀을 드리면서 여기 계신 모든 분들의 건강과 행운, 발전을 기원합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you, President, for your insightful uh, remark. Uh, next, Dr. Jong Hae Gu, a chairperson of the National Research Council, will deliver his congratulatory remarks. Please join me welcome him. Yeah, 여러분 안녕하십니까? 경제 임무사의 연구의 이사장 정의구입니다. 어, 디지털 혁명 시대 기술 혁신, 혁신의 도전과 대응이라는 주제로 오늘과 내일 이틀 동안 진행되는 2023 국제 컨퍼런스 개최를 진심으로 축하합니다. 우선 이 국제 컨퍼런스는 한국 행정 연구원 주체로 개최되는데 에, 컨퍼런스 개최를 위해 해외 유수의 전문가들과 교류하고 협력하면서 어, 수고를 아끼지 않으신 한국 행정 연구원 최상한 원장님과 관계자 여러분들에게. 감사드립니다. 또한 이 행사를 공동 주관해 주신 한국법제연구원의 한영수 원장님 그리고 호주 북부 사이버 보안 및 혁신센터의 마문 알라잡 센터장님께도 감사의 마음을 전합니다. 이 국제 컨퍼런스는 한국연구재단 교육부 그리고 아마존 웹서비스 측에서도 후원을 해 주시는데 이 자리를 빌어 어, 감사드립니다. 이틀 전환이 언급된 지가 얼마 되지 않은 듯 한데 코로나19 위기를 거치면서 비대면 소통과 물류가 본격화되었고 최근에는 챗GPT와 같은 거대 언어 모델의 인공지능까지 등장하게 이르렀습니다. 기술 발전을 통해 짧은 시간 내에 급속한 디지털 전환이 이루어지는 그야말로 디지털 혁명의 시대가 아닐 수 없습니다. 이와 관련하여 시장에서는 글로벌 차원의 디지털 플랫폼 기업이 등장하는 한편 각 국가에서도 어, 디지털 기술을 통해 정부 혁신을 도모하고자 하는 노력 또한 아, 강화되고 있습니다. 아, 그러나 인공지능을 비롯하여 급속도로 이루어지고 있는 이러한 디지털 혁명이 향후 사람들의 삶에 어떤 결과를 초래할 것인지는 의문입니다. 아, 그 결과가 긍정적인 것이라면 이에 의해 사람들의 삶은 매우 향상될 것입니다. 아, 반면 그 결과가 부정적인 것이라면 그것은 사람들의 삶에 막대한 피해를 가져올 가능성이 큽니다. 아, 따라서 인공지능을 비롯하여 디지털 혁명을 바라보는 우리의 시선은 한편으로 매우 큰 기대를 다른 한편으로는 두려움의 우려를 동시에 가지고 있는 것이 사실입니다. 아, 이를테면 현재 급속히 부상하고 있는 디지털 플랫폼 기업은 한편으로는 새로운 비즈니스 모델을 제공함으로써 어, 새로운 경제를 만들어내고 있지만 아, 다른 한편으로는 독과점의 문제와 플랫폼 노동 등 노동의 분절화를 가져오는 것도 사실입니다. 아, 또한 정부의 경우 디지털 기술은 국민들에게 더 좋은 공공서비스를 제공하는 데큰 도움이 될 수도 있겠지만 에, 그것이 모든 국민들을 에, 속속히 감시할 수 있는 빅브라더가 되지 않으리라는 보장도 없습니다. 아, 이번 국제 컨퍼런스에서는 디지털 혁명을 둘싸고 이야기되고 있는 이러한 문제들 에, 특히 AI를 활용한 공공서비스 혁신의 문제 AI 활용에 있어서 윤리의 문제, 그리고 사이버 보안에 관한 문제들에 대해 논의합니다. 아, 디지털 혁명이 가져올 양가적인 결과에 있어 결국 관건은 긍정적인 결과를 더욱 촉진시키고 어, 부정적인 결과에 대해서는 그것을 사전에 예방하고 어, 줄여나가는 것이 아닐까 합니다. 아, 그러므로써 디지털 혁명이 궁극적으로, 궁극적으로는 인류의 삶에 기여할 수 있도록 만드는 것일 것, 것입니다. 이번 국제 컨퍼런스에서는 이런 문제들에 대해 많은 논의들이 이루어질 수 있기를 바랍니다. 디지털 혁명의 부정적인 결과가 아직은 본격화되지 않은 지금의 시점에서 이러한 논의는 향후 디지털 혁명의 방향 설정에 매우 귀중한 안내를 제공해 줄 것이라 믿습니다. 끝으로 이번 국제 컨퍼런스에 참여해 주신 발표자 토론자 여러분들에게 그리고 오프라인과 온라인으로 참여해 주신 모든 분들에게 감사의 마음을 전합니다. 고맙습니다. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, today's conference is actually broadcasted online uh, through uh, the Kipa YouTube channel. So 
there are a lot of people who actually join us today. And um, we are a little bit ahead of our schedule, but we will, uh, so we will have a five minute short break before starting the first session. So we'll be back at uh, uh, 10 before 10, okay? So please have a cup of coffee and um, uh, thank you. And we will, we, we are uh, the presenter as an uh, discussant and moderator, please step, make your way forward for this session one. Thank you very much.
everyone. I'm Song Jun Kim. I'm a professor of the Gyeongbuk National University. Uh, this is my great uh, pleasure and honor to be a moderator of this first session. Uh, the title is, is very hard. Uh, Data-driven public service reform, issues and challenges. This is quite intriguing. Um, as for me, there are two notable features of this whole conference. The first is the top topic. As you see here, tackling, this step, tackling disruptive technology in the era of digital transformation. Uh, one of them, one of the president of, uh, with, with a remark that he just you know, heard my saying with uh, Dr. Kwan. Yeah, I, I wonder why we're using that word, disruptive. And disruptive in this case, just not destructive or, or is a negative meaning of this whole thing. So that's the reason why we discussed about that. The second thing is that um, this is quite a unique conferences in terms of uh, we have a quite interdisciplinary field from all over the world and all of the fields, like computer scientists here, and we have uh, engineers and social scientists. So this is quite unique in, in, uh, in Korea, too. So we have a, a great uh, guest here. So let me briefly introduce. Uh, we have uh, four speakers and three discussants. Um, the first presenter is Moff Kim, or uh, Dr. Kim kyu -shik. He's from, I'm sorry, I have to take off my glasses. Group head of the Data Governance, Operation, and Enterprise Services Westpac Group. Uh, his title is Adoption of AI ML in the Context of Australian Federal Government. The second speaker is Dr. Ha Huang from KIPA. Uh, his topic is Reducing Human Labeling Errors in Developing AI-Based Public Service. And third presenter is uh, Dr. Yubong Li from CLE, AI-Based Legislative Impact Assessment. As you know, in Korea, we have a legislation for the, all of the regulation with the um, regulatory impact ass assessment or impact analysis. I think this is one of the uh, legislative side of the impact assessment from all of the uh, registrations. Finally, um, CEO of the, of the CADET, Ms. Chang ji uh, she's talking about chat GPT which is the hottest topic of these days, I believe, and how will it transform public services? And we also have a wonderful discussion here. Um, the president of the Korea Information Society Development Institute, uh, Mr. Kwan ho Yeol, and the professor of the Hanban National University, ki Kwan, and the professor of the Tech University of Korea, uh, Dr. Kim Ho Kyung. So, with these all members, we're going to have a very interesting and very um, informative, or sometimes sometimes educational conferences of today. Okay. Now, so what's the next step? Okay. Okay. So organizers told us we have a you know presenter by presenter. And then we, uh, after all the presentation, we get all together, we then discuss. Uh, I'm gonna have uh, some comments or remarks from the uh, floors too, okay? Great. Hello everyone, my name is Mav. Um, I think that everyone will remember my name. <laughs> I think um, anybody who saw, uh, saw Top Gun, Maverick, so that is where 
I actually got my name 20 years ago, and in Australia, everybody calls me Maverick. But if you come to Australia down under and go, oh, who's Mav? Everybody, there's only one Mav in Australia, so you'll remember me. So today, um, I'm going to talk about the adoption of AI machine learning uh, in the context of Australian federal government. Now, you'll probably have this question saying that, oh, this, well, what is this bank executive doing in France talking about federal government today? Okay, so this goes back uh, to 2016 um, when I worked as a director over in IP Australia. So this is Intellectual Property Australia where I worked there for about two years, um, appointed by the Director General, um, and the first mission over there was, hey Mav, I know that you can create something out of nowhere, and I said, okay, sure. Can you actually come and um, set up this AI branch? I heard it from the media, and I said, okay, I know nothing about machine learning or, and AI, but I would try to do my best, and at that time, the branch was first set up, um, and the, the use cases that I'll be talking about today um, is one of the first uh, that was done in the context of Australian federal government and more widely um, in the world in WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization. Now, <coughs> I've been doing this presentation a lot, of, uh, a, a, a lot um, and what I would like to do or provide you with a little bit more value is I have also implemented this in the context of financial institution. So the bank that I work, Westpac, is the first company in Australia, which has a history of 200 years. Um, and it is one of the big four banks. Um, and I look after all the data governance, operation, as well as AI and enterprise services. Okay. So just quickly touching on the IP Australia's vision. IP Australia, uh, it, does everybody know what IP Australia does to Kochong? So what they do is they um, examine um, patents, they, do, they examine trademarks, plan breeders' rights, as well as design. Today's focus will be on trademarks. Their vision was to create a world-leading IP system building prosperity for Australia. So big vision statement. Underneath that, You'll see a lot of words of cognitive futures. Cognitive futures at that time, um, we used it more for machine learning and AI. So when the branch was all set up, we wanted these smart solutions to um, do four things. One was to build the capability of our people and our organization. This is Intellectual Property Australia. Then improve IP administration and professional registration, increase the awareness from the public. A lot of people in the organisations actually know Intellectual Property Australia, uh, Intellectual Property, but small and medium um, firms, particularly the focus of these days, um, I think that the Korean word over here is Changop. A lot of people does Changop, but we wanted to make sure that the small and medium uh, business increase awareness in the IP uh, system by utilising these smart tools. Then we actually had a cognitive futures goal, and this is to build the capability that enables IP Australia to research, develop and embed smart systems that are capable. The keywords over here was solving problems, making decisions, and learning and improving the way we do business. Now, how do we do that? Then we set up some guiding principles. And the six guiding fr uh, principles that we used, which I'll be touching on that later in the presentation, was first start from the top, okay? AI solution, I think that um, Professor was keep on alluding uh, to disruptive. It is disruptive. That actually means that there's a lot of challenge in change management, psychological change, job security, Hence, when you first develop the use case, you need to have very, very strong top management support. In the case of IP Australia, the person who had the most visionary um, support was, as well as the funding, was the Director General of IP Australia, Patricia Kelly. The second a guiding principle was partner to succeed. Everybody would by now. I've been using this for eight years. AI and machine learning is just one component of a computer system, okay? And it is a team sport, which actually means that data operation, data governance, 
system application development, all of these areas need to work together. You will not have all of these skill sets within an organization. Hence, we also um, put in a guiding principle saying that we need to partner to succeed. Also, leveraging the power of, I think that there's a couple of people from AWS today, that is that principle. The third one is user come first. There's a lot of chats in the um, in big organizations or enterprises where a lot of people really think about, oh, what technology is really good? What technology will actually make our lives easier? But you need to flip that around and think from more from a user side. At the end of the day, if you, do, if, if you can't get the user buy-in, that actually means that it will just be on the shelf. Wow, we spent millions of dollars, nobody uses it. Okay, so that is the next guiding principle. Quickly going through the um, next three things, be agile and iterative. Buy-in is very important from the people because they will go underneath the change management. Hence, quickly building prototypes and showing them and collecting feedback and addressing that into the solution is critical. Fifth one is fail fast and learn. This, I think federal government does much better than um, uh, private sector. Private sector, if you invest money, you all heard about ROI, which actually means I need to pocket some money out from this investment. Government, on the other hand, they can do it right because they can, they have the time and they do have the money in order to uh, fail fast and learn from it and reinvest um, the lessons learned that, that they have uh, implemented. The last one is embrace a change. I think that I touched on that in the um, other guiding principles, so I won't elaborate on that any further. Okay, these um, are the three key systems um, or AI machine learning enabled systems that we have implemented in IP Australia during 2016 and 2017. A lot of people these days talk about these type of things in 2011, uh, 2020, 21, 22, 23. Very happy to share this. The first one was Chatbot, not ChatGPT, but this is Chatbot. Chatbot was first introduced um, to IP Australia back in 2016. Just talking some numbers, when we deployed the, um, uh, the Chatbot, uh, there was over 46,000 virtual assistant responses to uh, general people. What this actually led to, was direct cost benefit. The reason why we could make direct cost benefit was there was a lot of call centers uh, scattered around Australia. Okay? But the decision was made because 75% of the virtual assisted first contact resolution rate was achieved. What this actually means is if a customer actually contacts for any complaints or kind of inquiries, if you can solve, if the chatbot can solve their questions at a very higher rate, that actually mean, uh, means that you can actually reduce the contact center. Given that this is a federal government agency, what we could do then is reduce or close down all the contact center or really half of it and reinvest these money to, for more value added uh, services for patents and trademarks. The next one was Australian trademark search. So <clears throat> for those who are familiar with trademark registration, you need to go and search whether you have a similar type of image mark, word mark, or even trademarks, their smell, okay? I, th I think that nobody really knew about that, but <clears throat> they need to go and search it. And they use a search engine called Australian trademark search. In the past for word mark, it was exact word mark. So if I'll give you an example, if it was Apple, it will actually come back with whether there was an Apple trademark or not. The new solution was, okay, if it's Apple, then apple -y, okay? They needed to come and look at those type of uh, very close terms because in the Trademark Act, there is a section called, is there any, is this trademark deceptively similar? This probably might be the only word that you wanna bring um, after this presentation. Is there any deceptively similar, which actually involves human judgment in identifying and making decision making? Also, this uh, trademark search also included image mark. So <clears throat> if you had an apple and you had a bite on the right side and you registered on the left side, can this be registered? If I actually ask this question, probably half of them will say no, half of them will say yes. 
These are subjective decisions that the trademark examiners actually make when they conduct the examination. So that was deployed. Today's focus is really on trademark assist. Trademark assist is using natural language processing as well as image, um, image mark search in order to help the small and medium enterprises to quickly and successfully register their trademark, which does not violate with any of those trademarks on the register. 77% of the survey result was SMEs were very positive and they said that it's very um, easy and cost effective. The reason why I'm saying it's very cost effective is that you don't need to involve attorneys in Korean Pyolisa, which cost you a lot, okay? So given that Australian federal government's aim is to help the public, that actually was a significant benefit for the SMEs as well as the registration rates went spontaneously high. Okay, this is this slide I'll quickly go over. This is to give you a quick understanding of what the trademark life cycle is. So you go through pre-application. I actually went through this. I have a trip. There. There's pre-application, then you put in application, examination, acceptance, and you do the registration and you renew it every 10 years. This is the landscape of the trademark. In Australia, these are the stats from 2015, so approximately 20% more. That will be a reasonable estimation presenting 2023. Now, <clears throat> one of the problems that we actually face, given that I said in the guiding principle that user is the most important thing, there was 41.4% adverse issues. So if the application actually comes through, the trademark examiners are very busy. Why? Because there are so many adverse issues. So we broke that down. We found our couple, five of the main core reasons. And the reason why I'm outlining all of these is not all of these are machine learning AI use cases. The ones is the first one, S44, which is a section 44 in the Trademark Act 1995. And the third one, Goods and Services. The first one, the key word over there is other similar or identical trademarks, which actually involves machine learning algorithms to actually determine what are the deceptively similar trademarks and what, are the, what is the decision that we're going to make. And the third one, goods and services, is more categorization. There are 60,000 categories across 45 classes where the people need to select the right things. What I mean by that is if you look at the right side, gelato, so if I'm running a gelato business, normally people go and put gelato. Okay, but if you want to make it protected, then you'll need to go and find sorbet, dessert mousse, cream desserts. All of these are from the 60,000 different categories. So the tool or the engine that we have built that we plugged in was to help the SMEs or the cell filers, or what we um, talk, to choose and get a comprehensive protection of their trademark. Now, this is an uh, additional slide that I actually put in. So, Mav, in Westpac, what did you do? So, I did a very similar type of um, tool. So, when a banking um, uh, develops new products or services, they go through a new product lifecycle. And at the end, uh, the lawyers and the compliance officers are engaged, and they look at the new products, terms and conditions, whether the marketing brochure is saying the same thing um, or overstating, understating. They go through this legal review. So what we have developed in Westpac is a legal and compliance review robot. It's not robotics, it's robot. So it actually looks at the marketing brochures or the direct mail or the email content and it goes through all the legal requirements. One of the tricky ones, not all of them are subjective, a lot of them are binary. But there are certain things like, is this sentence overstatement or understatement? Are we actually promising the customer something that we're not really providing? All of those um, can be captured within two seconds. The normal time that it took was 13 weeks. And what the lawyers need to do now is they don't go through and review everything. They look at what the system has reviewed and they go and tick X, tick X, which then that information is used to further train the uh, tool moving forward. What that actually gives, the bank actually can push a more safer product and services out in the market, which makes 
everybody in the chain win. Now, there are some benefits, and I think that you can go through them. I'm just going to touch, just being, uh, just being mindful of time. There are already a lot of benefits that I mentioned, but I want, what I want to touch quickly is on the challenges. Challenges is, I cannot stress out more, change management. So when the trademark was developed or the trademark examiners were saying, our job is gone. Yes, correct. Did all the trademark examiners' job gone? No. Nah. What did you do? We actually used it for a quality assurance mechanism. Not doing sample checking of the quality assessments, but we did a 100% sample check of the work that they have conducted. So the point that I want to make over here is AI and machine learning is not always about taking away people's job. It can actually make people's job actually stronger. Okay. The second one. The second one is top management support, uh, which uh, I have touched on. Specialized resource, there are so many people who say that they can do this, but not many people can do it. So there are some skill challenges. Debuggability and auditability. I was once an auditor as well. So if something goes wrong, if something is always good, there's no problem. If something goes wrong or fishy or question mark, the most biggest problem is debuggability and auditability. It's very difficult to explain how this type of outcome actually came. So those are still a couple of the challenges and the unknown. You'll hear a lot of people saying we do a lot of training data, training the algorithm, and we validate that. That's all good. But how much is enough? Because in the uh, context of federal government, and Monica, you might know this, we're very, and Mamoon, we're very sensitive with Aboriginals. So in the natural language processing, when they were identifying synonyms, there was a very hostile word that actually came out uh, for Aboriginals. So we then had to hard code those. Okay? So well, the unknowns are something to, uh, we need to think about. In this last slide, I just want to touch on the three box in the middle, actually, consider, decide, act. When people talk about decision making, decision making is consists of three things. It is first you need to consider, and then you decide, and then you act. This all three is packaged up as decision making. Now then people will need to think about in which decision making process should we actually have AI and machine learning plugged in. So a lot of these were unpacked while we were deploying it given that uh, there was a lot of question marks from the risk and legal practitioners. The last one, which actually tells you why I'm in uh, data governance and data quality within a, a big bank, is data quality, availability, and accessibility is really, really important. Probably if you think a little bit about this in a little bit more deeper, that will explain you why the bank, who has gigantic amount of volume of data, is so slow in coming up with um, AI solutions for the public versus Google, Facebook, and all these other areas um, speeding up and making good progress in the AI machine learning space. But I'll park that for next time to talk about it. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. I forgot to tell every sh uh, Presenter, we have only uh, 15 or 20 minutes, specs, but I didn't tell Mr. Kim, but he wonderfully finished his time. Thank you very much. The next presenter is Dr. Huang. He's talking about the human labeling errors. Um, if you're ready, just please, please. I have uh, so many slides, so let me go over quickly. Um, I'm honored to speak at this significant event today. Mm -hmm. I'll be discussing ways to reduce human labeling errors in AI development. I believe this is a topic that must be addressed in the development of AI services in the public sector to strengthen accountability. Uh, we have been developing AI services in the regulatory field for the past two years. Uh, FinTech has developed to cope with the cost of regulatory compliance since the global finance crisis. 
And with the emergence of innovative technologies and services, regulatory uh, supervision and compliance have become increasingly difficult. Uh, in particular, the increasing cost of regulatory compliance can be a hindrance to the growth of the innovative industry, making the introduction of AI services in the field necessary. Next. We are currently developing a regulatory navigator, and this is the blueprint of the service. Uh, this service operates based on statutory database and user input information and is composed of three language models. The human in the loop AI concept is applied in the output information production process and include reinforcement learning process through uh, user feedback. Today's presentation is about the final stage, the regulatory classification model. In this stage, we determine what information will be provided as information on regulation. Next. In South Korea, uh, regulations are registered by article in the process of enacting laws, and regulatory articles are marked as like this uh, to indicate. Next. According to uh, Article 2 of the FAAR, regulations are defined as something that, uh, that infringes on or imposes duties on citizens. However, not only is the scope of the regulation that is registered narrow, uh, but also um, they are excluded from regulations that correspond to Article 2. Therefore, there is a discrepancy between the registered regulation and the information on regulations. Next. Moreover, there are issues of ambiguity in the regulatory judgment criteria and a lack of expertise among the regulatory registration personnel, leading to problems of reliability of registered and unregistered regulations. To summarize, we need to solve a complex problem in accurate labeling of information as regulations and determining what information should be delivered as information on regulation. Uh, we have defined this problem as the task of uh, correcting human labeling errors Next slide. Uh, in a situation where there is no ground truth. Uh, first, let me show you uh, examples of human labeling errors. These are the data sets widely used in the field of machine learning. Uh, and I have brought some image data examples for you. As you can see, uh, there are labeling errors that are quite unpleasant. And some of them stem from uh, cultural differences. Uh, for example, these four, two pictures were originally written as fours. But no Korean do write four in this way. Next. And these two pictures were originally drawn as, can you imagine? Potatoes. Yeah, in countries where potatoes are staple food, when you draw a squashy circle, it's a potato. Um, yeah, next. The success of AI services and machine learning heavily relies on quality of uh, labeled data and human labeling errors, which results from subjectivity in the labeling process, can negatively impact the performance of AI systems. Um, implementing quality control measures, such as double-checking labels, annotator training, and statistical analysis can help ensure accuracy and consistency in labeling. Next. The challenges of correcting human labeling errors becomes even more complex when there is no firm ground truth available. This is because we have to uh, set the ground truth to identify errors. And it is a process of acknowledging and incorporating human diversity and ambiguity, uncertainty, in machine learning tasks. 
Next slide. We conducted four expert workshops to create labeling guidelines and created a validation uh, data sets for model evaluation. And using the agreed upon labeling guidelines, multiple labelers were employed to label the same sets of articles to ensure accuracy and consistency. Next. We adopted an uh, active learning process, which selects the most informative data for training. Uh, instead of random sample extraction, it is comprised of six steps. And by evol involving experts in the step four, we applied a human in the loop AI concept. Next. We set the information, uh, informative data points as the articles having different values between the original and predicted labels. Through the process of pre-survey, expert workshop, and post-survey, we conducted a real labeling uh, process for the extracted data points. By repeating four rounds of active running, we could derive a ground truth for information on regulation and a pre-trained classification model. Uh, the training data consists of laws, enforcement decrees, and enforcement rules from uh, the three, the most frequently mentioned field in the Korean regulatory sandbox with a total of 3,620 articles. Next. For the validation data set, we selected laws related to personal information protection and workplace safety, which are currently issues not only in Korea, but globally. We trained two models uh, through the active learning process. The first model is, is the one that is trained only on domain-specific data, while the other model is a fine-tuned model of GPT-3. According to a report published by Stanford University, the future of AI ecosystem is centered around foundation model, like GPT, which will solve as the basis for adaptation or fine-tuning models uh, to use for specific tasks. I wondered whether pre-trained large data would serve as, a, as additional information or result in noise for performing highly specialized tasks. Next. Uh, this is the basic structure of the first model. The training data set was created by tokenizing the input data and performing a matrix multiplication with the weighted values generated through embedding. We attached the regulatory information label to this and trained it through deep learning. Um, all of the training were performed through cloud computing. And for GPT, uh, GPT fine tuning, in the beginning, we used the most powerful model, DaVinci. But we soon realized that we couldn't afford the cost. Just a one-shot training, uh, fine-tuning, it cost more than $160. So we decided to use the cheapest model, ADA. <laughs> uh, next slide. And the, these are the results of the active learning. As you see, it's a training and a model prediction and expert relabeling process. Uh, through the four iteration, 114, 78, 73, and 118 labels were modified and retrained. Next. Through this process, firstly, we have derived the following ground truth, the labeling scheme for information on regulation. Um, among them, some conditions match the ones for registration, while others do not. The remaining task is how to present this information to users in a clear and organized way. Next. And I just compiled these results last night, uh, so my apology is to presenting too much information all at once. Next. And just let me uh, summarize the final model evaluation results. Looking at the F1 score, both models are showing very similar performance but the language model, the first one, slightly outperforms the GPT model. Looking at precision and recall values, we can see that both models have a low probability 
of providing non-regulatory information, uh, but there is a chance of missing some information on regulations. A thorough examination of misclassified articles seems necessary, and it may need to classify the type of regulatory information in more detail. Next. There are three points to discuss. First, people are concerned that AI will replace human experts. However, the current direction of AI development requires experts in various fields. This is because high quality data produced by experts is essential for training AI. Human in the loop AI is a process where humans are involved in the learning process of AI, recognizing um, and utilizing human diversity. Through this process, AI should evolve in a direction that respects the diversity of human society rather than homogenizing it. More importantly, removing inherent biases in humans is an important task for creating more inclusive and equal public AI service. Next. Second, uh, regulatory AI services are expected to increase the accountability of uh, accessibility of regulatory compliance for small and medium-sized enterprises, thereby providing innovative growth. And lastly, I suggest that the ultimate strategy for AI services in the public sector is to build a hyper-integrated integrated database and use it as a basis for creating a foundation model. The public sector lacks a driving force, capability, and expertise to create a large-scale pre-trained AI model like GPT. However, uh, adopting private foundation models raises the issues of uh, concerning about uh, accountability and reliability. Meanwhile, public AI services are being developed through research institutions and private outsourcing. In this situation, the government's role is to integrate the data produced and accumulated through uh, search AI services. This is the concept of hyper-integrated database. I believe building this foundation is the cornerstone for creating an AI-based government that is not only accountable, but also uh, competitive with the private sector. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Our next guest is uh, prof uh, Dr. Lee from the CLE. He's talking about the AI-based legislative impact assessment. Uh, as I know, he is speaking, yeah, yeah, she, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She is speaking in Korean, so why don't you use your translating devices on your desk? Uh, then we have some simultaneous translations. Okay, please. Oh, hello. Um, I'm uh, Yubong Lee from uh, Korea Legislation Research Institute. Um, I'm very glad to have a great opportunity to make a presentation in front of great uh, guests from abroad and a great audience uh, who is very uh, uh, in, who is very intelligent um, knowledge about uh, these very special sectors. Uh, but uh, for a better explanation, I will speak in Korean from now on uh, to save the time because we have a great, great uh, translators uh, behind. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, 네, 한국말로 말씀드리겠습니다. 네, 오늘 그 발표 주제는 그 AI based public service and legislation impact assessment. 어, 그 말하자면 AI 기반 그 공공 서비스와 그 어, 입법 영향 평가로 잡았는데요. 사실 어, 그 조금 다양한 측면에서 이제 영향 평가 AI와 관련된 영향 평가에 대해서 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. <목소리> 어, 네, 그래서 첫 번째 이제 시간이 많이 사실 없는 관계로. 그 AI의 어떤 현황, 현황에 대해서 간단히 살펴보고 그 다음에 정의에 대해서 살펴본 다음에요. 
어, 물론 이제 약간 법적인 측면에서 살펴보는 것이기 때문에 일반적으로 많은 것과는 조금 차이가 있을 수 있습니다. 그 다음에, 어, AI 영향 평가에 대해서, 어, 다음에 살펴볼 것이고요. 그 다음에, 어, 입법, AI와 관련된 입법에 대한 입법 영향 평가에 대해서 살펴보고 마지막으로 입법 영향 평가를 하는데 AI를 어떻게 활용할 것인가. 이세 가지 측면에서 조금 다른 개념인데 약간 우리가 사실 좀 혼동할 수 있는 부분이어서 어, 한번 어, 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. 네, 이거는, 그, 저희가 많이 이제, 여기 전문가 분들이라서 이제 이런 장면을 많이 보셨을 텐데요. 그, 지금 이게 하나의 차한 대가 다 데이터 이제 한 값인 거죠. 그래서 이렇게 계속 도로에서 이제 지나다니는 이 자동차의 흐름을, 어, 사람이 이것을 다 일일이 한다는 것은 상당히 어렵고 굉장히 수고스러운 일이겠지만, 이 계속 AI가 모니터링을 하면서 이 자동차의 흐름을 잡고 이것을 데이터화해서 그 값을 이제 어 계산해 내는 것은 어 굉장히 휴, 그렇다면 이제 효율적인 일이 될 것이기 때문에 사실 이제 어 한국 법에서 저기 보면 로드 스트럭처 앤 퍼실리티 스탠다드 룰이라는 어 그런 규칙인데요. 그 도로 어 구조 그다음에 그 시설 기준에 관한 규칙인데 거기에 보면 이제 지능형 교통 체계를 이제 통해서 그이 도로의 어떤 상태를 확인하고 어그 관리할 수 있도록 하고 있는데 사실 이 법이 만들 이 규칙이 만들어진 건 굉장히 오래 전 2010년에 만들어졌어요. 그래서 이제 지능형이라는 것은 물론 그 당시에는 AI를 염두에 둔 것은 아니겠지만 어 오늘날 역시 이제 AI가 이 규정을 그대로 이제 받아서 활용될 수 있는 상황이라서, 네, 어, 또 이제, 또 하나를 더 보시면, 많이 보셨을 장면인데요. 작년에 이제 그, 유크라인에서 이제 그 딥페이크, 젤렌스키의 어떤 화면이 좀 문제가 됐었고, 또 한국에서는 올해 그 대통령 선거가 있었을 때, 이 장면이 이제 또 문제가 되면서, 그, 좀, 뉴스에 그 나온 것들을 기억하실 것입니다. 그래서 이제 국회에 이것, 이 문제 때문에 법안이 하나 만들어졌는데요. 공직선거법인데, 그, 딥페이크를 이제 기술을 사용해서 어떤 영상을 만들어서 제작하거나 배포했을 경우에 이 딥페이크 기술을 사용했다라는 걸 반드시 알려야 된다. 그래서 이제 그렇지 못한 경우에는 이제 처벌을 받도록 그렇게 하는 법안이 이제 올라와 있습니다. 그래서 이미 이제 인공지능이 저희 생활에 굉장히 이제 가깝게 와 있는 상태이고 여러 가지로 많이 영향을 미치고 있는 상태인데 어 그래서 작년에 저희가 연구하면서 조사를 한 부분을 잠깐 소개를 드리면 보통 이제 일반 시민들한테 인공지능에 대해서 갖고 있는 이미지에 대해서 물어봤습니다. 그래서 하나는 그 어, 어떤 특정 영역의 문제를 해결하기 위한 어떤 특정 분야의 기술, 예를 들면, 뭐, 영상 인식이라든지, 음성 인식, 이제 이런 거고요. 두 번째는, 사람과 비슷한 수준의 어떤 사고와, 그 다음에 행동, 그 다음에, 을할수 있는, 그런 로봇, 우리가 그, 뭐, 영화나, 아니면은 뭐, 애니메이션에서 많이, 그, 접한 그런 이미지들인데 이두 개를 가지고서 이제 어떤 이미지 만약에 공공 영역에 AI가 도입된다면 어떤 이미지를 더 많이 연상을 하느냐 이렇게 물어봤을 때그 한국 국민 어 대답은 어 그래도 비어 현실적인 대답의 어떤 비율이 높았죠. 76.2%가 그어 어떤 특정 분야의 문제를 해결하는 그런 것이라고 답했고 근데 여전히 23.8%는 이런 공상과학적인 상상을 하고 있다는 것도 사실 굉장히 놀라운 부분인 것 같습니다. 그 그리고 그 다음에 이제 어떤 정부 영역의 어떤 기능상에서의 어떤 선호도에 관한 부분이 오른쪽 차트에 나와 있는데 가장 높은 비율로 어 이런 서비스에 대해서 어 선호한다라고 말해 대답한 것이 어, 정보 제공입니다. 정보 제공이 85.7% 그다음에 위험 업무에 투입하는 그런 부분에 대해서도 이제 그 
어, 선호도가 좀 있었고요. 근데 인간이 판단하는 뭐 법률 해석이라든지 아니면 뭐그 의사결정이라든지 이런 부분에 있어서는 조금 약간 신중한 그런 태도를, 어, 보였습니다. 그래서 사실 앞서 이제 말, 그 설명조사에서 한그두 가지 개념이 이제, 어, 그, 어, 입법에도 사실 이제 그 활용되었던 그런 개념 정의인데요. 미국에서 이제 나왔던 2017년도에 그 AI의 미래, The Future of AI Act라는 그런 법이 있었는데, 그 법에는 이제 weak AI와 그다음 strong AI를 그렇게 그와 유사한 취지로 이제 개념 정의를 하고 있었습니다. 그렇지만 요즘은 조금 더그 정의가 구체화돼서 기술적 요소를 많이 반영을 하고 있는데요. 그 EU에서 이제 그 장, 어, 재작년에 그 어, EU AI Directive라고 이제 법안이 나왔을 때 거기 이제 정의를 보면 어, 상당히 어, 어떤 기술적인 특정 기술적인 요소를 열거를 하고 그 기술적인 요소를 사용해서 뭐 예측이나 추천 의사 결정을 만들어내는 어떤 소프트웨어다 해서 어 로봇 뭐 어떤 그 하드웨어적인 것보다는 소프트웨어적인 것으로 이제 정의를 하고 있고요 기술적인 요소에는 뭐 딥러닝 뭐 머신러닝 뭐 통계 메이지한 추론 뭐 이런 것들에 대해서 열거를 하고 있습니다. 그 다음에 밑에 부분은 이제 한국에서의 그 어떤 입법안에 대한 정의 부분인데요. 어, 한국도 굉장히 뭐좀 추상적으로 약간 그런 규정을 어, 가지고 있는데, 어, 밑에 부분 보시면 인간의 지능을 가지는 어, 학습, 추론, 지각, 판단, 자연 언어의 이해 등, 그러니까 인간이 지능이 하, 수행하는 어떤 특정 활동을 이제 전자적 방법으로 구현한 것이다 이렇게 정의를 하고 있, 있습니다. 그다음에 어 이제 화, 현황을 한번 이제 살펴보시겠는데요. 이제 AI를 어떻게 이제 활용을 하고 있나 이게 기술적인 요소별로 아니면 기능적 요소별로 아니면 사용 목적에 따라서 여러 가지로 이제 활용을 하고 할 수가 있는데 작년에 나온 이제 EU에서의 어떤 그 보고서를 보면 어 EU에서 이제 그어 제일 위쪽에 나온 것이 이제 네, 제 위, 위쪽에 있는 그래프 보면, 최근에 이제 그 AI를 도입하는 어떤 행, 공공 행정 영역에서의 사례가 많이 급증하고 있는 것을 보실 수가 있고요. 하단에 왼쪽에 보시면, 그 기능별로는 이제 그 영역별로는 일반 행정 서비스에 가장 많이 활용이 되고 있습니다. 그 다음에 두 번째가 경제, 그 다음에 세 번째가 이제 보건, 헬스, 그 다음에 네 번째가 뭐, 뭐, 방범, 뭐, 이렇게 경찰 행정과 관련된 그런 부분이고요. 그 다음에, 오른쪽 부분의 그래프는 약간 기능적인 부분, 기술적인 부분, 기술적인 유형에 약간 혼도, 혼재를 해서 이제 통계를 만들어서 조금, 어, 혼란의 여지가 있어서 안 쓰려고 했는데, 워낙 이제 신뢰받는 보고서에서 나온 것이기 때문에 썼는데요. 다른 이제 연구 결과들을 살펴보면 자연어 처리가 가장 많고요. 자연 NLP가 가장 많고, 그 다음에 두 번째 패턴 인식, 세 번째 이미지 인식 이렇게 나와 있었습니다. EU의 경우에요. 뭐 한국의 경우를 한번 살펴보도록 하겠습니다. 한국의 경우는, 어, 그 보건 의료가 가장 이제 행정 영역에서 가장 사용도가 높았고, 그 다음이 일반 행정, 일반 행정이 마찬가지로 높게 나왔고, 그 다음에 에너지 환경, 그 다음에 기상, 재난 안전, 이런 순으로, 어, 사용도가 있는 것으로 이렇게 조사가 되었고요. 그 다음에, 어, 기술적인 요인을 보면, 어, 자연어 처리가, 그러니까 언어 지능이라는, 어, 랭귀지 인텔리전스라는 그 자연어 처리 기술이 가장 많이 활용되고 있는 것으로 이제 나타났고, 그 다음에 두 번째가, 어, 추론, 추론 있고, 세 번째가 시각 지능, 이미지, 어, 그, 에 관한, 이, 그, 인식입니다. 요 조사는 작년에, 어, 그, 어, 소프트웨어, 그, 어, 연구원에서 408개의 공공기관을 상대로 이제 조사한 거라서 상당히 광범위하게 조사를 했고, 어, 그 중에서, 어, 뭐, 41개 그, 어, 정부기관, 그 다음에 어, 17개 광역 정부 지방 자치 단체 다 포함이 되고 350개 어, 공공 기관이 포함됐습니다. 그 중에서 약 절반 이상이 인공지능을 도입하거나 도입했거나 도입할 계획이 있다라고 이렇게 대답을 했습니다. 그래서 물론 아직 이제 
저희가 체감되고 있는 이 공공지능을 활용한 이제 그런 행정 서비스, 물론 교통 분야에서 상당히 많이 활용되고 있는 것을 볼 수가 있는데, 기타 영역에서도 앞으로 굉장히 많은 부분에서 사용이 될 것으로 어, 기대를 하고 있습니다. 그래서 이제 이런 현황을 전제로 해서 세 가지 부분에 있어서의 영향 평가의 측면을 살펴보도록 하려고 하는데요. 어, 시간을 너무 많이 잡아먹으면 안 되니까. 네. 그, 첫 번째 부분은 이제 AI 영향 평가인데요. 이거는 이제 AI의 위험성에 대해서, 사회적 영향에 대해서 평가를 하는 거고요. 두 번째는 AI와 관련된 법에 대해서 평가를 하는 입법 평가입니다. 입법 영, 입법의 영향에 대해서 평가를 하는 것이고요. 저희가 이제 오늘 사실 주제랑 제일 관, 관련이 높다고 생각되는 부분은 이런 영향 평가를 하는데 어떻게 AI를 활용할 것인가. 이세 번째 측면인데요. 그세 번째 측면이 오늘 여기 계신 분들의 관심사와 굉장히 밀접하게 관련이 있다고 생각이 듭니다. 두 번째, 어, 그, 그세 가지 중에 첫 번째, 그 AI의 영향평가에 대해서, 어, 간략하게 살펴보도록 하겠습니다. 이게, 사실 뭐, 찬반된 의견이 서로 이제 다를 수가 있겠지만, AI의 어떤 영향력에 대해서 상당히 이제 우려하는 목소리를 어떤 그, 어, 인류사에 있어서 어떤 족적을 남긴 석학들이 그렇게 말씀을 하셨고, 그 다음에 실제로 국민들도 그렇게 많이 시민들도 우려하고 있는 편입니다. 그래서, 어, 이 스티빈 호풍 박사님도 그, 뭐, 거의 그, 작고 전에, 어, AI에 대한 어떤 위험성과, 그 다음에 통제의 필요성에 대해서 말씀을 하셨고, 그 다음에 최근에 이제 챗 GPT가 뭐, 나오기 전부터 그랬지만, 또 나오고 나서, 뭐, 그 뉴욕타임스에 이제 기고문이 나왔는데, 이제 유발 하라리 교수님도 이제 이 속도가 개발 속도가 인간이 통제하는 수준으로 속도를 진행해야지 너무나 급속하게 그 진행이 되면 어 굉장히 위험하다. 그래서 이제 인류사의 어떤 변곡점에 와 있는 이 시점에서 이것을 어떤 재앙이 되지 않으려면 그것을 통제하는 것들에 대해서 먼저 어그 여기서 이런 말씀도 하셨어요. 어 through strict safety test. 그러니까 굉장히 엄격한 어떤 그런 평가를 통해서 백신이나 이런 것들이 이제, 어, 그, 토, 그, 사회에 나오듯이 이제 그런 것들을 거쳐야 된다. 일종의 이제 AI 영향 평가의 필요성에 대해서 말씀해 주신 거라고 생각이 드는데요. 그래서, 어, 또 이제 석학들 뿐만이 아니라 일반 국민들, 한국 국민들의 경우에도 이 부분에 상당히 우려를 하는 그 비율이 상당히 높았습니다. 그래서 AI가 사회에 어떤 해악을 미칠 것이냐에 대해서 67.8%가 이제, 어, 우려를, 어, 동의를 했지만, 어, 그 영향도에 있어서는 개인과 사회적 영향을 나눠서 물어봤을 때, 개인보다 사회적 영향에 대해서 더그큰 영향이 미칠, 미칠 것이다. 어, 그런, 이건 물론 이제 긍정일 수도 있고 부정일 수도 있는 그런 영향을 말씀드리는 건데요. 어쨌든 자신의 어떤 삶보다는 전체 사회에 AI가 더큰 영향을 미칠 수 있다는 건 결국 정부 영역에서의 영, 역할이 굉장히 중요할 수 있다는 점을 말, 어, 말씀드리고 싶습니다. 그리고 어, 모두에서 이 디스럽티브 테크놀로지에 대해서 상당히 많은 논의가 있었고 저도 이걸 하면서 계속 이제 궁금했어요. 디스럽티브가 도대체 뭔가 그래서 한번 찾아봤는데요. 그래서 저, 제가 전문가가 아니기 때문에 사실 나중에 다른 말씀을 해주셔서 좋습니다. 그이 그래프를 보면, 거기, 이제, 그, 어떤, 시장의 영향이 가장 높은, 어, 신기술을 통해서 시장의 영향을, 어, 그, 시장의, 기존 시장을 어떻게, 어, 완전히 이제 패러다임적 변화를 가져오는 경우에, 디스트럽티브를 쓰는, 라는 말을 쓰는 것 같고, 그 다음에, 어떤 혁신적인 부분에 있어서도 이제 기존의 서스테이닝 이노베이션 말고 디스럽티브 이노베이션이라는 것은 굉장한 이제 급격한 어떤 그런 변화를 줄수 있는 이제 그런 부분인데 어 사실 뭐 여기에는 굉장히 뭐 브레이크스루나 레디칼 그 다음에 레볼루셔널리 뭐 디스컨티뉴스 이런 말들 같이 쓰는 것 같습니다. 근데 공공 영역에서 이제 그런 요소들이 이제 그 어, AI 공공역에서 활용되는 이제 AI가 이제 어떠한 변혁적 요소를 가지고 있는지를 살펴봤 
그런 보고서에 나온 어, 첫 표가 있었는데요. 보면 디스럽티브 체인지를 가지는 것은 사실 만인 비율적으로 좀 낮다고 보여지고요. 일반적으로는 어, 서스테인 체인지나 뭐 인크로멘탈 체인지 이 정도로 이제 사용되고 있는 요소들이 이제 어, 실제로는 활용되고 있는 것 같습니다. 그 다음에 이제 여기서도 이제 게임 체인저라는 것이 이제 그 어떤 어 긍정적인 의미에서 이제 정말 그 AI를 활용한 공공 서비스가 게임 체인저가 될 것이냐. 어 근데 그 전제 조건은 이 긍정적인 부분과 부정적인 부분이 잘 밸런스가 맞춰지고 이것이 관리 부정적인 부분이 잘 관리될 수 있을 때어 이런 게임 체인지가 될수 있는 어 역할을 할수 있다 이렇게 하면서 EU에서도 그 위험성에 대해서 어떤 규제의 어떤 기초를 가지고 네 단계로 나누고 어 그다음에 하이 리스크 같은 경우에는 어그 어느 어 어느 셉터블 리스크 같은 경우 아예 이제 시장에 출시가 안 되는 거고요. 그다음에 하이 리스크는 어좀 많은 규제들이 이제 어 의무가 부과되는 이제 그런 경우를 어로 형태로 규제를 하고 있습니다. 그 다음에 그래서 이제 하이 리스크의 개념이 상당히 중요하고 이제 이 부분이 나라마다 사실 조금씩은 어 법안에서 나온 내용, 내용을 보면 상당히 좀 다른데요. 미국은 이제 편견, 뭐 차별, 이제 보안, 뭐 개인 정보 그런 경우 대단위 위치 모니터링 이런 부분에 대해서 어그 영향을 줄수 있는 이런 요소들을 하이 리스크라고 보고 있고. 캐나다는 그 다음에 조금 뉴트럴한 입장에 있는 것 같은데요. 그 어떤 영향의 정도와 지속성을 기준으로 해서 4단계로 그 영향도를 나누고 있습니다. 그 다음에, 어, EU에서는 이제, 어, 위해성이나, 네, 위, 어, 위해성이나 그 다음에 안전 그 다음에 법 적용 대상 여부에 대해서 어, 를 기준으로 하고 있고요. 한국은 어, 이런 것들을 조금 약간 융합적으로 규정을 하고 있는데요. 주로 이제 기본권에 침해되는지 여부 뭐 중요한 사회 기반 시설인지 아니면 고용이나 권리에 영향을 미치는지 여부 이제 이런 것에 따라서 하이 리스크를 이제 법안에서 하고 있는데요. 시간이 많이 없는 관계로 또 이제 이거 스키, 다음 부분은 스킵하고 이런 것들이 이제 AI 그런 어떤 영향 그런 그 평가 절차로 이제 제한이 되어 있는 어떤 그런 이유에서 나와 있는 제한 그 개념도입니다. 그 다음에 한국에서도 이런 부분들이 어떤 학교에서 활용되는, 도, 도입되는 이제 AI에 이제 그 활용될 수 있는 가이드라인이 이 매트릭스로 나와 있는 그런 사례가 있었고요. 그 다음에 실제로 이제 요 차트는 일일이 말씀드리지는 않겠습니다만, 어, 한국에서, 그 다음에 공공영역에서 AI가 도, 도입됐을 때 기대하는 바, 기대하는 바도 상당히 많습니다. 특히 신속성이라든지 뭐 원칙에 입각한 거, 근데 그런 부분들이 있었고요. 그 다음에, 어, 그, 그렇지만 이제 우려하는 바가 사실 조금 더 높은데요. 뭐, 이를테면 보통 사람들 같은 경우에는 일자리에 대해 상실에 대한 우려가 굉장히 높게 나타나고, 그 다음에 보안에 관한, 데이터 보안에 관한 문제도 이제 크게 나타나고, 의, 편향적 의사 결정, 요런 부분도 굉장히 크게 나타나고 있습니다. 그 다음에 이제 이거는 행정 영역별로 이제 긍정, 부정을 살펴보면, 긍정이 좀더 많은 행정 영역이 있고, 부정이 좀더 많은 행정 영역이 있는데요. 어, 교통 분야가 가장 긍정적인 분야가 이제 제일 많은 분야로 나타나고 있고요. 그 다음에 부정도가 좀 높은 거는 입법, 사법, 집행, 이제 이런 아무래도 이제 리걸 쪽인데 사실 리걸 쪽을 활용하려는 입장에서 조금 신중할 수 있는 이제 그런 부분인 것 같습니다. 그 다음에 이 부분은 좀 뛰어넘도록 하겠습니다. 시간이 없어서요. 그뭐 간단한 것이지만 한국에서의 입법이 이제 현재 나와 있는 이제 그런 상태를 좀 살펴보고 입법, 어, 영향 평가를 어떻게 진행을 하는지를 어, 한번 보고 입법 영향 평가라고 하는 것은 입법에 들어가 있는 내용에 대해서 공, 어떤, 어느 정도로 이것이 수용 가능한지 국민들의 의사를 살펴보는 것도 있고요. 실제로 사회적 영향을 뭐 
예측 모델을 통해서 예측하는 것도 있고요. 데이터를 통해서 예측하는 것도 있고 뭐 여러 가지가 있습니다만 저희는 이제 사회 조사 방법을 써서 이제 각그 어떤 책임 부분이라든지 아니면은 절차적인 요건 이제 그런 요건에서 일반 국민들이 어떻게 생각하는지에 대해서 서베이를 한건한 한 결과인데요. 이거는 좀 시간상 넘어가도록 하겠습니다. 그래서 이런 그 부분이 이제 어, 한국 행정기본법이 2021년에 제정이 되었는데 거기에 자동적 행정처분의 일환으로서 인공지능을 활용할 수 있도록 되어 있습니다. 그래서 그 인공지능을 어, 그 활용하는 경우에 그렇지만 제, 사람의 재량이 그 포함되어 있는 그런 경우는 안 되고요. 법의 요건이 정확하게 기술되어 있는 경우만 그 인공지능을 활용할 수 있도록 그렇게 되어 있습니다. 그래서 그 요건에 대해서 이제 그 세부적으로 물어본 이제 서베이 결과는 넘어가도록 하겠습니다. 그래서 한 10개 이상의 법안들이 한국에서 이제 인공지능과 관련해서 올라오고 있고 지금 굉장히 무서운 속도로 각 영역에서는 개별 이제 그 AI를 활용하기 위한 근거 법령들이 올라오고 있습니다. 네, 마지막으로 이제 말씀드릴 부분은 어, AI를 어떻게 그럼 이러한 인, 입법 영향 평가에 활용을 할 것인가 이제 저희가 몇 가지 연구를 한몇년 동안 수행을 했었는데요 하나 하나만 이제 소개해드리고 이제 마치도록 하겠습니다 이 부분은 사실 이제 어, 미국의 그 저기 연방 정부에서 규제와 관련된 업무들을 AI를 활용한 규제와 관련된 업무들을 이제 카테고리화 하는 건데요. 두 번째 부분이 저희가 조금 약간 그 관심 있게 보는 부분인데 규제를 조사하고 분석, 그러니까 법률을 조사, 분석, 모니터링 하는 이제 이런 체계들을 AI를 활용해서 이제 그 리걸 테크나 레그 테크로 이제 활용할 수 있겠다. 이렇게 이렇게 생각이 들고 저희가 했던 연구 중에 하나는 어, 법률과 법률의 관계를 이제 이렇게 시, 데이터화해서 이제 그 어, 매부, 매파 시킨 것입니다. 그래서 이제 법률은 사실 굉장히 다단계로 이루어지고 있고 또 가, 다른 과의 법률과의 관계가 굉장히 어, 연관성을 굉장히 어, 치밀하게 보아야 되는 부분이 있기 때문에 그거를 사실 저희가 연구하는 입장에서는 일일이 타고 들어가서 이제 문헌으로 그냥 다 보게 되는데요. 그 일이 굉장히 사실 노고스럽고 시간도 많이 타임 컨슈밍 되는 그런 일이다 보니까 이제 이런 관계도에 관한 어떤 데이터화를 하고 그것도 법률이 시시각히 변하기 때문에 그것들을 모니터링화해서 어 AI 기술을 활용을 해서 어 저희가 필요한 지식을 굉장히 빨리 어 적은 어떤 어 노력으로 효율적으로 찾아내는 이제 그런 방법들이 어 지금은 사실 좀 그러니까 그런 수준은 아닌. 이다만 저희가 이제 그런 것들을 비전을 가지고 그렇게 연구를 진행하고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 이 그림도 이제 한국의 에너지 법령의 각 조문들 간의 어떤 관계도를 이제 다 이제 어, 그 데이터화한 그런 그런 어, 연구였습니다. 예, 오늘 발표는 이상으로 마치겠습니다. 감사합니다. Okay. Our final presenter. Is Ms. j u n g j i u n from the c o t i t She's presenting the Chat GPT. How will it transform the public services? Please. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. And also, obviously, the last is always the best. So I will try my best to give you a very good presentation. So um, everyone's obviously so hyped about Chat GPT and what it will mean and. Every part of businesses try to incorporate that into ChatGPT, and ChatGPT is obviously, you mean OpenAI is very open about plug-ins. You know, so where a lot of different businesses are already plugging into OpenAI, and uh, today we, I want to talk about how that's actually going to transform public services. It's a lot of imagination going in here as well, but I'll talk to you about that. Yeah. Uh, just to give you a brief introduction about who I am, um, I am the founder of Coded, which is basically gathering, we gather a lot of uh, public data related to uh, public policy, legislation, um, news outlets, a lot of remarks from the National Assembly meetings, all kinds of uh, remarks on the social media and all of those data into our platform so that you know you can very easily understand what's happening in the government affairs industry and see what affects you and 
how what you should fo be following up. Before finding this company, I used to work at the OECD as a policy analyst, uh, working on 35 different countries' data. And we, I've been looking into policy differences in different countries and what it means in terms of digital transformation, inclusive growth, and many other um, aspects of things. But when I was working there, I realized that technology is definitely needed in this sector. Not just in Korea, but obviously in many other countries. They all really need um, to leverage technology in terms of you know, making decisions in the government, as well as making businesses understand better about what the policy means, and also what the citizens need to do in terms of um, translating that information in a very easy um, way. And I'm also working with a lot of different ministries, um, uh, you know, the committees and so on within the Korean government at the moment to really incorporate technology into their everyday uh, policy area. So just to give you a brief introduction about that, data is number one key thing. Do you, do you have proprietary data within your system? You know, how much of it is actually, uh, you know, usable and not just, you know, unstructured data, but can users actually use it? And can, do you have that data in real time? And this is one of the things that I struggled the most when I was working at the OECD. Whenever we are requesting data from the countries, usually the gap is about a year and a half. So you get, you're talking about data that is very, very outdated and things are changing so rapidly that, you know, you can obviously write reports about it, but you know, it's very outdated most of the times. So, you know, that having that real time key data is important and that's what uh, Coded has been doing over the last three years. And the most important thing is that using that data, what does that actually mean into your business? How does it actually affect you? This is something um, else. So just to give an example, there are so many remarks happening in the National Assembly, three million plus you know, discussions are happening. And our point was, it's the data, with the data, the, the best thing that you can do is that because it's so many hours and remarks of things to get an insight of what it means um, in a very short period of time, then data and technology is the most useful pattern of that. So whenever your company name is mentioned, anything related to your things, you, you get an alert from uh, saying that you know the National is, Assembly is discussing about you or your industry, and then you can understand what it means quickly. Uh, to move on to the generative AI and ChatGPT, obviously I had to ask ChatGPT what what you think, you know, what what the um, you know public sector will look like using you, you know, and it said you know about it talked about five different things. Number one was, you know, citizens will be able to get responses obviously twenty four seven, and it will be much quicker. Uh, number two is governments the government will get help from ChatGPT in terms of allocating resources more effectively. And then number three, it says, obviously, a lot of automation will happen in terms of very repetitive administrative tasks. Number four is um, a lot of insights can be drawn from large volumes of data, unstructured data, in terms of social media posts, what's happening, and, and so on. Um, usually, this, this has been a very expensive activity, and it will be done in a much quicker way. And number five is AI-empowered decision-making will be possible in the government officials. Um, obviously, these were very good answers, and I think you summarized everything, but going beyond that, Obviously, human input had to be inserted there as well. So my idea was that a lot of these answers are mixing up citizen-related um, issues and business-related issues and policy-maker-related issues. So we need to divide these issues and really tackle each one separately. In terms of citizen-facing services related to public service, um, this is a very different type of thing than you know policymakers uh, trying to get insights from large volumes of data. Uh, because when you're facing citizens, uh, you do need accuracy and fairness corrected very well. And this is where, where I'm going to talk about, obviously, the risk-related issues. But, you know, um, the point here is not so much about talking about what the risks will be, but what kind of solutions can we find in terms of the risk? So, obviously, we know um, that there is risk and opportunity in everything. And we what we are trying to do here is that we don't want to not t take this opportunity, but really take the opportunity and minimize the risk. How can we manage the risk as much as possible so that we can increase opportunity? So when we when we go back to the citizen level, 
the point here is that, you know, I just had last week a meeting with the uh, Ministry of Interior and Safety. And because I'm part of the digital government uh, platform committee under the presidential uh, committee, and they were talking about, can we do chapel service with ChatGPT within our, you know, uh, public services? The citizen facing problem is what, what it is. The accuracy is going to be a very crucial thing. Can we directly give ChatGPT to uh, our citizens now? Probably not. So the solution is that you're already having people uh, looking at customer services. Can you help the customer service people to deliver messages to the citizens? Yes, I think there is very big possibility. So um, I think it will be much slower to give citizens directly ChatGPT related um, answers, but there will be it will be helping the public officers a lot more in order to deliver those those um, services. Another thing about the policy um, and lawmakers related issue is that, you know, in order for, you, for policymakers to really understand what's happening and also understand the past policy histories and come up with the new ideas that can solve public issues, it's actually extremely difficult. For one, usually you don't have a lot of public officers doing that. So that will definitely help you to uh, chat GPT type of, um, you know, generative AI can be very helpful. And in terms of businesses, you know, there are a lot of companies also operating in Korea uh, that are multinational companies having language barriers in terms of understanding what the legislative mean, uh, bills. We have a lot of clients like that, and definitely this will help in terms of uh, overcoming those language barriers. So going deeper into that, the traditional way, piling up things, it's never going to work anymore. And we knew that already, and there has been a lot of movements on that already. But uh, the, the new ways, obviously, in the past, the big data, AI, and experts were gathered together to come up with something. But what the key change now is that before we used to enter keyword searches so that you know one or two keywords were entering and you get a list of links that are very relevant. But now with the chat GPT, it's more about narrative questioning so you, that you're actually talking and getting answers narratively which will change in terms of uh, not knowing what exactly you need to search, you will be able to, you know, uh, keep that conversation going and change that. Um, and with the chat GPT-4 that was kind of preliminary launched in March, the, the difference is that now the longer context input is possible. So, you know, instead of just giving very short text input, you can now have longer you know, pages of information that you can put in. It's still 25,000, so, you know, there is obviously a limitation, but how many of you, you know, who are writing papers kind of wish that you can put in all kinds of uh, papers into it and do literature review in two seconds instead of you doing it or your assistant doing it? You know, if you could put a lot of pages into the system, then it would be so much easier. And um, with the current system, the output is also limited in terms of what the uh, chat GPT can give you, but this will be will allow longer context input. And in, in that, what does that mean in terms of public services? I think what happens is that instead of giving uh, your public or the, the policymakers or businesses a long list of papers or you know links to things, you can definitely have a summary of what all of these things mean to you in a very simple and easy language. In terms of creative writing, now, you know, it has been doing that already, like imagining a lot of the information, but, you know, they can now write songs. Speech writing can be very easy now, so a lot of the, you know, CEOs or, you know, the top level giving speeches at, at, at the beginning, you can definitely uh, ha have ChatGPT do it for you. A lot of um, already CEOs are using it already in terms of, you know, your staff members giving you uh, probably a preliminary draft and then make it shorter or translate it. They're already doing that, but speech writing will be one of the things. And novel and stories can be possible. So in that sense, uh, this creative writing will definitely have an impact to a lot of artists, uh, different citizens that are, that are, you know, already doing this for them. And last thing that I wanted to kind of talk about is 
the speech to text related uh, issues. So there's something called whisper within GPT-4 and this is something that uh, a lot of people obviously have tried. Like in Korea also, Naver, uh, Naver also has that. Uh, KT already has that. You know, they, they have been, you know, trying this uh, a lot. But then what the difference here is that, you know, when they listen to the context and then, you know, find out what, what it means and then put out an output, then translate it into different languages. You know, a lot of the models that in Korea didn't have very good translation um, issue. There was that limitation, but with this, it's going to be possible. So, and it's going to be in real time. So that's just another thing. So in terms of uh, national assembly members, they're having, I just show you, hours of National Assembly meeting, and a lot of times it takes uh, people to actually type it. It's in Korea, still people are typing. There are job categories of typists still in Korea in terms of uh, getting the National Assembly meeting records. And a lot of that will be probably replaced by this and can be provided in real time and with translation and summary and so on. And, and another interesting thing, this can be in the public sector, is that, you know, there are uh, disaster-related uh, calls. Um, a lot of calls are coming through to the public service. So um, there, I have a friend who ha owns a company who translates uh, speech to text and then making it as a as text level so that they can you know use it for other purposes but in the fire stations and so many uh, places they're getting calls and it, it, is, it is very expensive and heavy process and can you imagine how fast this will will be uh, in terms of uh, emergency calls and so on getting very uh, a lot of people's calls and then quickly uh, directing that call to someone else or interpreting this quickly and then sending it uh, outside so this will be another thing uh, one thing this image creation related ones that is, you know that you know dali in chatgpt but dali 2 is coming out and that that is also looking at variation of things so in terms of public service it's more like you know if you give lengthy paper or information, can they translate that into infographics and send it to public, you know, uh, use or as at least give you as a draft so that you can uh, quickly do that. And then this, what this does is, is not only putting variation in different images, but it can also correct within the um, image, it can correct uh, the painting itself, you know, if, if you give them, them right direction. So this will obviously image related um, issue will change. and. A lot of times now, um, you can type information and then image will be coming up or you can put an image and ask questions and it will kind of answer with the image and this already has been coming up and this can be very useful in the public sector as well. How many posters and how many information uh, flyers are going around and can you make that much more efficient? This is the thing. And let me... Uh, I have about two, three minutes, so let me go into the risk-related issue, but focusing more on the solution related to the risks. So, you know, obviously we already talked about data security-related issues and fake news and voices and so on, which is can be obviously used as a phishing mechanism, can be very difficult in terms of the public issue. So, for example, it says uh, in the public services, if uh, generative AI can, is used and say, create an image of a fire in a certain place, in fact, it doesn't have it, but then it can give uh, wrong alerts if they uh, get hold of public public's, uh, information and send those information quickly, it's going to be very difficult to you know control that. There will be obviously that kind of risks. And then uh, in terms of the bias and inappropriate contents, there are always gonna be that kind of issues. Uh, job displacement, we already talked about that, but in, in detail, um, for example, in the legal services and research assisting paralegal uh, related, any kind of research assistant related jobs will be very, very quickly uh, displaced. But then the last thing about cost is that in the public services, the same thing kind of talk, was talked about in the uh, ministries. If they want to really incorporate this into their system, how much will that cost? You know, for them, the, the government does it because usually it goes with the budget system in every year. Can they afford, you know, doing maintaining and training? Obviously, that's going to be difficult, and they have to hire somebody to actually uh, train that. So there is a lot of risk in that. But I think the prop the the problems are already outlined even before ChatGPT came out, but obviously it's highlighted more now. The question is, if the public service really wants to incorporate this into their uh, service, in the policy and so on, 
there can be uh, ways to manage this. Basically, you have to work in a very controlled, still very controlled format. You don't give directly the services to the citizens. There will be second tier or third tier there. Uh, in terms of job displacement, um, this is going to be a big problem for the government as well because they their a lot of their goals are about you know creating jobs so how quickly can your country really create jobs related to using you know making use of ChatGPT? because now the question is a lot of companies uh you know we we got investment recently last year and the questions that investors usually ask do you have technology that is different from other com companies or other you know competitors but in fact the funny thing is Technology dis, you know, differences are not anymore a question now. You can definitely use what's out there, but can you actually apply it in your sector quickly and get more uh, people? So then, you know, job displacement is definitely going to be something that you uh, have to work on. The public really has to, the public service and public policymakers need to think about what jobs need to be uh, now created and how can they help you. The last thing about uh, ChatGPT's answers to the risk, they also pinpointed about the accuracy issues. It also talked about its own limitations about it. And we are also using OpenAI for our service. But the problem is that uh, you think that you can put in all kinds of data into it and get answers. But in fact, uh, there is so much limitation in terms of the data that you can put in. And in terms of the data, even if you ask the same question, you get different answers each time. So it's very, very difficult to control. And that's why even in our service, in terms of legal, legislative accuracy is number one thing. So we cannot use it directly for the you know services there. And then privacy issue is obviously one thing. And you know even as a company, we're kind of thinking we have... Um, we are putting in data for in within OpenAI system. A lot of companies are doing that. So, you know, how much of of that will be kind of used for our from our competitors? You know, we we have proprietary data at the beginning. It's also only on our server, but now it's it's going to be uploaded and people are going to use it. So, did it really matter that we had all these data? So that that's one thing. So. Privacy is something that you know businesses also worry about, and this is the number one thing that the government needs to really worry about. That the last thing is the user experience issue, but I think the user experience uh, is going to be now number one important uh, thing. Everyone can use ChatGPT or similar types. Like we've also used Facebook's Llama, for example, which can be more fine tuned. So we've been using that, but you know a lot of technology can be used. But in terms of how user friendly it is and can we actually deliver exactly what the users are wanting? That's going to be uh, a race in terms of how fast you, you are going to do that. So I'll end it here. And thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have heard four speakers for each topic with a different view, uh, view, uh, kind of view. Uh, now we have to move on for our designated discussants three distinguished scholars from each field. The first discussant is uh, Dr. Kwan from the KISD, the president. Good morning. I am Hoyeol Gwam. I am a friend of KISD, Korea Information Society Development Institute. Uh, let me talk in Korean mother tongue uh, for better communication with you. Uh, 오늘, uh, tackling disruptive technologies uh, in the era of uh, digital uh, uh, transformation uh, conference, uh, data driven public services uh, reform session, a toron hagi deso, beu, uh, young guangs roke senga kamida. Uri session eso, abso palpashin, divine palpe eso, mani persmida, kamsa trimida. Chonun, pagejog, hoxing stradian, chong check jog, tenge, te, masm drigojamida. Palpoja gaundeso, tkberi, mab kim nim, 
그리고 의봉 리님의 발표 내용과 관련이 깊습니다. 현재 한국의 데이터 기반 공공 서비스 개혁의 가장 중요한 이슈 중에 하나는 디지털 플랫폼 정부를 어떻게 만들어갈 것인가 하는 문제입니다. 작년 9월 윤석열 대통령께서는 뉴욕 구상을 발표하셨습니다. 뉴욕 구상에서는 디지털 혁명이라는 전환기를 맞아서 대한민국이 디지털 시대의 세계적 모범 국가로서 디지털 비전을 전 세계와 공유하고 우리가 추구해온 자유와 인권, 연대라는 인류의 보편적 가치를 지키온 새로운 디지털 질서를 제시하였습니다. 이 뉴욕 구상이 대한민국 디지털 정책의 출발점이 된다고 봐도 과언이 아닙니다. 뉴욕 구상에 이어 발표된 대한민국 디지털 전략이 있습니다. 대한민국 디지털 전략은 뉴욕 구상에 담긴 기조와 철학을 반영하여 국민과 함께 세계의 모범이 되는 디지털 강국, 대한민국 실현의 비전을 세우고 다시 도약하고 함께 잘 사는 디지털 경제사회의 구현이라는 목표를 설정했습니다. 이를 구체적으로 실현하기 위해서 첫째, 세계 최고의 디지털 역량, 둘째, 확장되는 디지털 경제, 셋째, 포용하는 디지털 사회, 네 번째, 함께하는 디지털 플랫폼 정부, 디지털 플랫폼 정부가 네 번째에 나오고 있습니다. 다섯 번째, 혁신한 디지털 문화 등 5대 전략과 이에 관계된 19대 과제를 제시하였습니다. 특히 대한민국 디지털 전략에서 제시된 디지털 플랫폼 정부는 모든 데이터가 연결되는 디지털 플랫폼 위에서 국민, 기업, 정부가 함께 사회 문제를 해결하고 새로운 가치를 창출하는 정부로서 디지털 플랫폼을 통해 시스템들을 연계하고 데이터와 서비스를 전면 개방하며 정부 주도를 민관 협업 중심으로 바꾸어 민간 혁신 역량을 수용하는 기반을 마련함으로써 인공지능, 데이터 등 첨단 인프라 기반 위에서 선제적 맞춤형 서비스 제공, 과학적 정책 결정, 혁신적 비즈니스 창출을 목표로 하고 있습니다. 이와 관련하여 주목되는 정책이 올해 1월에 발표된 인공지능 일상화 및 산업 고도화 계획입니다. 인공지능 일상화 및 산업 고도화 계획은 국민과 디지털 혜택을 공유하고 대규모 인공지능의 수요를 창출하고 어, 산업 혁신을 위한 인공지능 사업 추진을 하는 것으로 제시하였습니다. 주요 내용은 첫째, 국민의 일상생활, 행정, 입법, 사법 등 공공영역, 전 산업 분야로 인공지능을 전면적으로 확산하도록 한다. 둘째, 데이터, 컴퓨팅 파워 등 인공지능 기반, 초거대 인공지능, 인공지능과 데이터 이용권 등 인공지능 기업의 성장을 지원한다. 셋째, 차세대 인공지능, 난제해결 인공지능 등 초격차 기술을 확보하고 국산 인공지능 반도체 기반, 이른바 K-클라우드, K는 음, 한국을 의미합니다. 코리아를 의미하는 K-클라우드를 추진한다. 어, 네 번째, 매우 주목이 되는 부분이 네 번째 나옵니다. 디지털 권리 장전, 인공지능 기본법, 인공지능 윤리 신뢰성을 선도하는 디지털 신질서를 정립한다. 이렇게 네 가지가 되어 있습니다. 그뿐만 아니고 올해 3월, 바로 지난달이 되겠습니다. 올해 3월에는 과학기술정보통신부에서 초거대 AI 산업 발전을 위한 인공지능 최고위 전략 대화를 개최했습니다. 여기에서 논의한 것은 첫째, 초거대 AI 경쟁력 강화 및 산업 생태계 조성 방안. 둘째, 채 GPT 등 초거대 AI 확산에 따른 사회적, 문화적 영향력. 어, 셋째, 인공지능, 관, 인공지능 관련 규제 개선 및 윤리 신뢰성, 윤리와 신뢰성을 제고하는 방안 등을 논의하였고, 어, 이 논의 끝에 초거대 AI 산업을 어, 지원하는 정책 방향도 곧 발표될 예정으로 있습니다. 이러한 일련의 정책적 노력은 기술 혁신을 촉진하고 산업의 발전을 견인하는 그런 것들이 전통적인 정책의 큰 역할이었습니다만 그뿐만 아니고 어, 기술을 다루는 그런 부처에서조차 
윤리 및 신뢰성 제고에 큰 비중을 두고 있다 이런 것이 굉장히 큰 특징으로 볼수 있습니다 이제 마음의 말씀을 드리겠습니다 한국에서 공공서비스에 적용되는 이른바 파괴적 기술에 대한 정책적 대응은 이미 시작되었습니다 그러나 채 GPT와 같은 혁신 기술이 만들어내는 미래 사회에 존재하는 모든 위험 요소를 미리 예측하기에는 한계가 있다고 보여집니다 따라서 앞으로 공공서비스 정책은 국가 디지털 전략의 바탕 위에서 디지털 플랫폼 정부 같은 플래그십 정책을 중심으로 하되 인공지능과 데이터 등 디지털 전환 시대의 파괴적 기술의 혁신성과 같은 긍정적인 점은 극대화하되 신뢰성과 윤리에 관계된 그런 위험성과 같은 부정적인 면은 예방 또는 완화시키는 방향으로 발전하여야 할 것입니다. 이를 위해서 파괴적 혁신 기술이 초기 설계 단계부터 과거에는 주로 이런 기술 설계의 초기 단계는 기술자의 몫이었습니다. 그러나 앞으로는 이런 혁신 기술의 초기 단계, 초기 설계 단계부터 공학자는 물론이고 행정학자와 법학자, 바로 오늘 행사를 그 오곤하지 않 굉장히 중요한 두 개의 기관이 행정연구원과 또 어, 법제연구원이 아닐 수 없습니다. 어, 그래서 어, 공학자는 물론 행정학자와 법학자 그리고 사회학자와 정책을 다루는 사람 그런 전문가들의 참여와 협업이 더욱 강화되어야 한다고 생각합니다. 이상으로 토론을 마치겠습니다. 경청해 주셔서 감사합니다. Thank you. Uh, our next designated discussant is Professor Kwon from the Hanbadu National University. Hello, uh, my name is Kisok Kwon from Hanbad National University. Uh, I'd like to um, talk about uh, um, some uh, one or two points for each presentation, and then I'd like to um, uh, summarize some common lessons from the four presentations. Uh, firstly, the first presentation talk about the Australian cases. So um, for presenter, I'd like to ask uh, one issue. Uh, it's about the um, exp explainability or accountability issue. So um, if, uh, if AI uh, did a kind of mistake of, uh, when we accept or process processing the trademark, how can we uh, deal with uh, deal, uh, this issue? The um, real human being should uh, maybe uh, could be involved in this process. Um, I'd like to uh, hear the answer. And also the Australian case reminds me um, our Korean case. Uh, if you visit the data Geochung KR, and then uh, we can find many data, but it is very hard for AI to learn. <laughs> it's, um, the file is uh, in the form of Hangul, it's a Korean uh, original uh, program. So um, in terms of electronic government, it's, uh, Korea, Korea is uh, number one, the length number one, but the, in terms of uh, AI learning, uh, so really we have to change our uh, public um, information pro pro provision. And secondly, uh, the uh, very technical presentation uh, by Dr. Hwang Ha. I think um, the uh, prepare, preparation of the uh, pair data between the, uh, between the real, um, whether uh, this uh, uh, legislative content is uh, regulation or not, uh, which means that uh, this is, um, uh, Hang, Dr. Hwang Ha uh, expressed this uh, ground truth so um, many uh, data is needed to be accumulated for uh, AI uh, to learn uh, which is the regulation, which is not a regulation. So that uh, issue is uh, really important. Um, uh, massive data uh, need to be gathered, I guess. And also, uh, Huang Ha's uh, presentation also linked to uh, presentation, third presentation. So uh, the uh, impact assessment of legislation uh, is uh, really uh, is uh, technically related to presentation two. So uh, the te 
technique uh, presented in pre uh, second presentation could be a solution for uh, presentation three. Uh, in presentation three, um, there was uh, some concern about the uh, uh, advance of AI technology, but I don't think uh, we can not, we can I don't think we can control the advance of uh, AI technology. So instead, uh, we have to adapt this technology. So in this uh, regard, uh, we uh, rather than control the technological uh, technological uh, developmental path, uh, we have to uh, tackle. We have to find some uh, the case level uh, uh, case level uh, uh, situation, I guess. And finally, number four also uh, accountability issue. I, I guess is is really important. Uh, as uh, the presenter mentioned, the accuracy issue was important. So, um, if the public service uh, AI uh, committed uh, uh, inaccurate information, and then who have to <laughs> be accountable for that? So, uh, this kind of issue should be addressed in the future uh, public service provision. And finally, um, based on four presentations, uh, I, I'd like to summarize the lesson from the uh, four presentations. As the pre President Kwan mentioned, the uh, collaboration between the, uh, the engineer and the policy makers, policy scientists, uh, is really important. And also, um, rather than the macro level strategy for AI, but street level uh, approach is really important, I guess. So, um, more specific and more case-based uh, approach is uh, uh, needed in the future, I guess. So that's my uh, less, that's my uh, impression from the full presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our final discussant, Professor Kim Ho Kyung from the Tech University of Korea. Uh, after her comments, uh, all of the panels, speakers, and discussants, please come to the uh, table and grab the seats. And we're going to have uh, some voices from the floor and have a uh, free discussions. Thank you for inviting me here. And uh, it's harder to look at this screen and all the people. But uh, this is a Hogan game. You can call me Julia, whatever. But uh, anyway, my comment would be go to. Uh, uh, three presenters, including the left one. Anyway, the first one, uh, I'm going to start uh, with the death. Uh, as we all know, uh, although we spend uh, all of our time on spending, collecting or analyzing data, the first presenter mentioned data, 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 and then what does it mean? Because uh, uh, we talk about the size of data or accuracy or quality of data, but how my question would be, how much data we need to uh, um, to get uh, all the issues. So you mentioned uh, the importance of uh, data, but uh, it triggered uh, one question, how much training data is required for machine learning and that sort of thing. So whenever we analyze the data, the question uh, need to be figured out is uh, how or why we use the data for what purpose. So that is the main reason to doing that. So I would like to ask that question. That is a big question in all other main general question, but um, when you mention data, I would like to ask the, what kind of data you mean. <laughs> and the second presenter, um, all of the question I have, but the one thing is uh, the importance of a human expert. And the second presenter, oh yes. And uh, I can count to all of our cases, like uh, in 2019, uh, Babylon Health, a British digital telemedicine company, launched AI-based uh, uh, health chatbot. But uh, it delivered good news to patients who are unable to visit hospitals. However, uh, they found that two hypothetical 59-year-old male and female smokers and confound gender bias. 
And I can count the number of cases like gender bias, because um, as we all know, sometimes AI use uh, job marketing or interview that kind of things. But uh, the main reason is uh, the many of the people who work at AI uh, domainly are men. So the information from the, the machine learning AI, I, all kinds of things are dominant by men. So they, the AI machine learning or computer programs, they learn the program or language learning from the men, dominant to not the women. So how can we evaluate or, or judge that kind of issue, the gender issue? The gender issue is a general issue, and uh, but uh, always, when you talk about the information or data, and then the expert, even though you mentioned the importance of a human uh, expert who make a judgment, a kind of error we can justify. But the, if that expert are dominated by men, and then what about boys of women or other uh, minority or colored people, that kind of issues? So even though we all know the importance of a human right or, or human expert, but uh, if the human experts are the dominated by the small group of members in this society, then how, how we can get the reliable data? So that's my question. And the third uh, presenter. Third presenter, uh, yeah, here. Yes, I can s Tom. <laughs> Tom. <laughs> OK, so I can see her. So. The next question would be goes here. As we all know, the global big companies like, uh, even though Amazon, AWS uh, uh, sponsored this big event, but uh, Amazon, Google, Twitter, Facebook, they fired the number of people this year or even last year. As you will know, the Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, Meta, that kind of a big company <coughs> fired AI ethic teams. So we talk about the ethical issues and all the kind of, we focus on utilization, how we can use the data to make a better place. But the question is, what if the global big companies fired big, huge ethical members in the company, and how can we get the reliable data? So that's my question to go to the um, presenter. And let's do the number list two for four uh, presenter. Okay, then. Uh, the one thing, uh, one question would be uh, goes here. When researcher at uh, OpenAI and the Pennsylvania University investigate uh, what if ChatGPT dominant to our society, what kind of a job will be hired or, or abandoned or fired? And uh, Judgment to go here. Restaurant dishwasher, motorcycle repairman, and instant cooking cookers not damaged at all. But the, on the other hand, maybe some of us, including me, maybe <laughs> huge damage by ChatGPT. So my question would go here. Some people, all our people actually, including me, uh, worry about uh, the power of ChatGPT or all kind of AI programs. And then you mentioned. Uh, a lot of questions and then danger and harmless uh, to our society. But the big issue, one thing, if we can simplify these whole issues to one thing, what would you worry about? That's my whole question. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, let's go to the table. Um, why don't we give an uh, opportunity for the uh, all the discussions and questions from the, uh, uh, our designated discussants uh, to the speaker. So I'd like to give them first reply to the, all the questions. And then uh, any comments or remarks from the floors would be welcomed. OK, so well, Kim uh, Chosun, Oh, microphone, please. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Kim and Dr. Kwon, uh, for your questions. I'll first uh, touch on uh, Professor Kwon's um, question. I think that this question was an excellent question. Um, I'm not going to say that I prepared for this, but <clears throat> I'll be, uh, 
I'm very happy to um, answer that question. So, <coughs> so uh, while implementing these AI machine learning tools, yes, there was um, challenges in relation to the explain, um, uh, explain explaining why the outcome actually came out, the responsibilities, etc. Now. Yeah. When we have implemented it, we face the same issue, hence we didn't actually make the tool to make decision. So that's not the final decision point. The end user, where we actually got um, that the tool to be implemented is right before the formal outcome is released to the public or the applicants. So the main users are thousands of lawyers um, who are the trademark examiners and the patent examiners. They are the main users validating and retraining on a daily basis, but at the same time validating uh, the results that is coming out uh, from, the, from the tool. Now, what I'm trying to say over there is the final decision maker point is involving a lot of human judgment. But then when we were implementing or developing and designing the tool, uh, the lawyers were actually one of the most active participants in developing this machine learning AI tool. They had, they had to interpret the, um, the Trademark Act 1995. They decoded it. They worked with the BAs as well as the developers in order to come up with uh, the rules. When they trained the tools, the people who validated the, uh, the, um, the accuracy was actually the lawyers. So the lawyers at, at the end of the day knew that they were getting um, at least 94% accuracy rate, which is above and beyond the ISO 9001 quality management standards. Um, hence, that's how we control the um, quality of uh, the tool. So I hope that that, um, that answers your question. Uh, moving on to um, Professor Kim's uh, question in relation to data, data, data. So I'll go straight to the answer. There's no right or wrong answer uh, how much volume of data you require. There is a lot of um, claims or theories saying that 2080 split or 3070% split um, to train the, train the algorithms in order to come up with the most um, um, uh, ultimate um, accuracy. However, from practical experience, that's not normally the case. And um, I'll be a little bit more specific. In the case of Intellectual Property Australia, they have, the, the volume isn't a problem because they have kept 200 years of trademark as well as patent data in the absolute structure that you can think of that they come up with um, a lot of analysis. However, in Westpac perspective, when I was implementing the tool, the most biggest challenge is the volume because at the time, the data set that was available was only 30. Okay, so you're comparing against millions of data set, millions of data rows, and, you're, uh, and in Westpac's case, there's only 30. Now, in those cases, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't implement the tool. The most important thing, once again, is even in Westpac case, we involved Allens. I think that that's um, it's a global legal uh, legal panel firm that we have, as well as internal um, uh, lawyers to come and help even create dummy data uh, that we can use um, and validate the accuracy rate. In those circumstances where there's a low amount of data that you need to train the algorithm, uh, we made sure that the accuracy was met, and that's when we actually um, deployed um, for the lawyers to use. Once again, the decision point was not directly to the public. It was a tool that the lawyers actually use um, to make the final decision. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Question solved. Okay, Dr. Wang. Uh, the AI solution we are developing is, I think it's quite similar to uh, larger language models like developing uh, in giant companies like GPT or BERT, but very simplified version uh, with just one specific purpose. Why uh, the foundation models have multimodal like functions. So um, using our model to solve the, uh, the issue of the presenter three, uh, could be possible if we can uh, 
like uh, replace some functions into others. Uh, so it's kind of backbone uh, structure. So we can expand to various services as well. And oh, how much data do we need? It's, it's not my question, but it is rela related to uh, the question of the diversity of uh, experts. Um, these days, um, OpenAI and um, Google are employing a lot of experts to create some answer sheets. Uh, it's kind of questions and answers uh, in order to uh, develop uh, their language models uh, to a more advanced level. It's very critical data, kind of uh, question and answer sheet. And all of them are money. So how much data? Uh, more data is better, but it takes more money. And uh, the, the question for me was that, uh, what if uh, there is lack of diversity in experts, right? Um, data reflects our society. So the data itself has bias in it because our society is biased. So one important uh, issue in human in the loop AI is to tackling such bias. But what if uh, the expert group is biased? Yeah, that's a very important question, and that is the one that we have to consider in uh, making an expert group. So we try to <laughs> incorporate many women experts, but unfortunately, we only have one woman expert in our group. Uh, it is true that, uh, as as Professor uh, mentioned, uh, there is only a few women experts in machine learning field. So making a, a like a fair ground. Uh, for competing a woman in that field is very uh, important issue uh, for making uh, our uh, um, uh, for tackling uh, the bias issue in human in the loop AI. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, um, I think the first uh, discussant, uh, President Kwan Huyer, um, um highlights the uh, importance uh, to uh, engage in the first stage uh, by the, uh, not only by the uh, scientists, but also by um, the policymaker and lawmaker as well. Uh, in that sense, I think it's an very um, important to um, prepare the some standard or the process to um, uh, make uh, more balanced uh, models uh, in the f uh, first stage like uh, what you uh, means uh, I mean is the impact of, like impact assessment is very uh, important to <coughs> be applied in the first stage. And then second uh, opinion is, um, I, I think it's a, uh, there are some very um, controversial issue. Um, before coming to uh, coming here, I um, discussed with my uh, colleagues um, uh, in my institute, and then, but we, I, I recognize that there is a very uh, big uh, gap uh, between the thinking uh, way um, between he and me uh, because uh, I rather more uh, concerned about uh, the, uh, the negative issue in developing AI but uh, many uh, people also uh, thinks uh, the restriction of the development is a uh, more important issue for developing AI in Korea. So, um, it's, so it depends on the point of view, uh, people by people. And so the last opinion from uh, Professor Kim said um, that the Huge uh, companies like Google's uh, fired uh, experts on ethical issues 
uh, which he, I don't know exactly why, and but uh, it could be uh, some hurdle uh, for development for the company, and uh, but uh, I think uh, we uh, need to more concern about uh, the ethical issue as well for developing in the first stage, and so the. That's the reason why the law, uh, we have more, <clears throat> uh, we, we need uh, some, uh, uh, the system, the more stricter system in law uh, for that kind of issue. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions and uh, things that, you know, as the discussion mentions about things, I kind of, a lot of other things came to my mind and uh, realized that simply, I think, you know, a uh, professor was asking, what would be the most worrisome thing out of the old things, you know, and I, and what should we be doing about that? And I think number one thing that comes to my mind is, make more friends, you know, because I think now acquiring knowledge has, it will come to an end. I think uh, getting more understanding of what's happening, you can always ask quickly to ChatGPT or that other types of forms, but uh, in terms of meaningful network you have, people relationship that you have, in terms of uh, getting things done, I think it, it's something that uh, ChatGPT cannot really replace uh, in many ways. So if you do have that kind of a, a relationship that could be p pretty powerful. And I think another thing that really worries uh, me about is being getting behind of all these technology because things are moving so fast and if the because of the concerns that we have already on many different issues if we just ignore it and say oh you know we, we can't really do this we completely block it at this point then i think a lot of possibilities with it uh will, will country the country itself or the business or government will probably fall behind so i i would rather uh, consider more about what kind of solutions that we can find to resolve these risks and move on in terms of uh, making use of it in our, uh, you know, services. Um, another thing about, you know, applying these things to citizens, I kind of forgot to mention about how easy that will be in terms of uh, filling in text forms and a lot of forms that we have to fill in with the public services. There are so many hours that we spend in, in businesses also getting license, licenses, uh, different business administrative issues. We have to fill in, in Korean uh, Hangul file. We have to you know put in all these information in there and it will be so much easier if it, the forms can be filled in by the you know ChatGPT, which is uh, in some ways happening with uh, a lot of the services that are add on to ChatGPT. And lastly about, you know, also Dr. Hang Ha also mentioned about what is regulation and what is not regulation. And one other use case that uh, we've seen with a regulation related issue is that uh, government itself feels like, you know, there is very explicit uh, mention that this is a regulation, they have put it in there, but in terms of businesses and citizens, how they kind of perceive regulation is different. Even if it's not labeled as regulation, in real life, a lot of uh, hidden regulation, we also call it shadow regulation, is always there. And w using the language model within, within our company as well, we have been helping ministries in terms of identifying r regulation that uh, what doesn't have the label, but it could potentially have a high, very high regulation score. Then you know you should look into it and see you know what it means. And in the data behind that is that the data we got from the businesses and individuals who said that you know these are regulations that are hindering our, our you know services. So these kind of use cases are going to be there. And if if we don't directly use it as a final source of information, but use it as assistant, I think that a lot of improvements can be made because we thought that ministries or you know regulatory uh, bodies would already know everything, but obviously uh, the, the government officers wouldn't be able to find out very specific details of the regulation that is out there. Um, and if you're new to the, you know, obviously the, the job as well, that would be very difficult. So how to help is another thing. And last thing, I met with uh, one of the large, large companies in Korea yesterday about, you know, applying this into their uh, regulatory related issues into their services. 
One thing that I realized is a lot of large companies in Korea, and I'm sure in other countries, since they are so worried about data privacy, they don't want to use cloud-based information. This is the same thing with the government. The gov Korean government doesn't use cloud-based yet. And this is the discussion that is ongoing. So they don't want to uh, you know, upload data into the cloud service that is not within their, obviously, server. And obviously, a lot of data is still kept into, into that system. So in terms of answering how much data do we need, in terms of the core essential data that is out there, not a lot of them are actually uh, available. So it, it's not about the number or the volume of the data itself, but more about the quality of data that, that are actually needed in terms of uh, making the system better. And we don't yet have so much uh, out there. And and you know we do have a lot of the financial institutions like JP Moore already blocking you know ChatGPT and so on. So it's it's not going to be like tomorrow that everything is going to be available in terms of the data. But uh, provided that we have very restricted, uh, restricted privacy issue, we could still probably get hold of those data and train it in, in a way that can be more useful. But it will, I think it will take time. Okay, uh, Mr. Kim requested a little short time to remark. So we'll give it a chance. Um, um, I just want to be a little bit more direct on the question um, in relation to the accountability. So when you have a, um, a, a machine learning or AI-based solution, the uh, accountability doesn't disappear. In any organization, you'll have delegate uh, authority framework or statement of accountability that actually prescribes what you will need to do. The tool itself um, cannot be transferred. That's at least a position that um, uh, the Westpac or um, the, uh, the, uh, or the federal government um, um, is standing. Now, when the person who actually makes and needs to make the decision and has the power to make the decision, uh, they need to be comfortable of that. And in order to be comfortable of that, they will need to be involved in the development process so that they can evidence what the accuracy rate is. So all that I want to say is I'm making a little bit of relationship so that you can understand it in a little bit more direct sense. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, I'd like to give you an opportunity for the audiences from the floor. This is open session, so anything uh, any questions for the speakers or discussants or Dr. Hong? Please, Dr. Hong. So, so I wanted to ask. It, I wanted to ask something about accuracy, you know, in relation to Chat GPT, and also about bias. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Ji Un said what we need to do is make more friends. But I don't agree with that. I mean, it's not friends one needs, it's, it's more like experts, because you can ask a lot of friends who know about some subjects as little as you do, um, but they can say things that are plausible. Uh, and that's what, what makes ChatGPT you know, so seductive. It sounds like a reasonable person speaking to you, but it's potentially useless <laughs> because it's false. And uh, I think that's what seems to me to be crucial here, that when you have ChatGPT, which has uh, got a language model behind it, but doesn't have, <laughs> you know, the, the difference between um, well, it doesn't have ground truth behind it. Um, you get into into real difficulties in some of the most tempting applications of of that technology, viz. Essays. What you were saying, you you, you were saying, research assistants. That's really uh, something that ChatGPT is in its element for, but I think that's wrong. It's not in its element unless the research assistant knows the difference between true and false. And that's the, that's the really difficult uh, thing, um, is getting that connection with fact. And you can sort of make progress with that by having experts, because what does an expert mean? An expert is someone who does know in areas where it's possible to make the distinction between knowledge and non-knowledge. But you know that seems to me to be the, the basic question is how do we know things? 
and what is it to acquire knowledge. And chat GPT, when I hear people really worry about it, um, there are some cases where I can understand the worry, but you know, if it's basically predicting uh, statistically combinations of words that will make sense and that will you know, seem natural, why on earth would anyone expect that to tell you the truth? Sure. You know, if, if that message can get over, it may not be good for your business, <laughs> but it might help to reassure people um, who are worried about what might happen with ChatGPT. My feeling is they should be less worried, not more worried. And that what the reason that they should be less worried is because ChatGPT cannot solve the problem of knowing the truth. That is only solved by hard work. You know, it's hard for human beings and it's hard for machines to find the truth. Anyway, that's what I want to say. I 110% agree with you. That, that makes it even more true. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other voices from the floor? Sure, Monica. Um, I really enjoyed everyone's presentations, I must say. Um, uh, I guess I want to reinforce uh, Tom's point as well, uh, that I think we do need to make it transparent where the limitations are of chat GPT, because what I worry about then, so like the example of get you know, the students or the RAs to do a literature review as an example. That that set alarm bells for me as, as someone that works at a university, but more because what do you get out of that? One, it's probably wrong because it won't know the expertise to understand what are the key points in each of those papers, but also what what is the RA going to learn from seeing that? So um, I think understanding where its limits are, but also Obviously, there's opportunities, but what, what's going to happen, I guess, looking at the long run, if we rely on this technology to do things that actually might stop learning and also might interfere with creativity as well? So, you know, we've used um, AI a lot uh, in, in creativity, but I, I guess what, where are the losses from, from doing that? And, and the losses in, in skills, human skills as well, and what might we want to do about that as well. Um, and the last point, the, the human bias is obviously an important point, and it's been with us for a long time, and I don't think we've addressed it properly, because one, it's not just the human in the loop and, and who they should be, because I, I absolutely agree, we ab absolutely have to nail that. But also the data that comes to us is going to be biased anyway. So, and the, we're not having that critical lens on. So hearing these discussions, yay, you know, this tool could be wonderful, but we really need to bracket where those biases are and our limitations as well. I wanted to ask this kind of something is slightly different because there was something in uh, Speaker Lee presentation that I did not expect. And so I would be like to have also the opinion of the other panelists because th there are the usual things what AI, I expect AI to do, 11%, 90% reduce jobs and so on. And there was one that a 75% of the people thinks it will be used for corruption. And so this will be something I would like to have the feedback from the other panelists, how they think this is a realistic opportunity, if you want, of using AI for corruption that's normally a traditionally human uh, activity. But so how do you think this is realistic? Or how do you think this is a threat to the use of AI in the public services where corruption is normally something that happens all the time? I wanted to uh, thank you for the uh, comments uh, because uh, uh, I recognize that that's a very uh, great uh, approach to um, uh, 
give us some good, uh, good, uh, good uh, uh, image for AI for lay uh, lay uh, citizen because uh, in Korea also in in China in China case also I heard that uh, they um, when they uh, introduce AI service in the uh, uh, public service uh, that that kind of uh, corruption issue uh, reduced a lot and so. Uh, that's very a uh, great point uh, in a public area to adopt uh, AI system. Thank you. Okay, I would like to start with this analogy. That uh, technology, um, start with this analogy which says that um, when car was first introduced, um, seat belt was not there, uh, was produced without even a brake, Right, and there is no safety. There is, uh, we we focus too much on the operation side, right? And later on, we discovered a oh, brake to you know, accelerate to brake uh, seat belts, and we improve this technology. And I feel that the com the conversation today, the advancement of the AI technology, is completely different to that sort of classic technology development. I feel like with the advancement technology like like uh, large modeling like chat gpt has a massive negative social behavior on us you know Mo uh, monica talked about the skills gap in the generations um, uh, the laziness in the humanity brains um, we're focusing too much about output without capturing the other sides of governance we talked about accuracy but we never thought about the trustworthiness, the responsibility, the transparencies, the bias. Um, and I think these issues are not going to be solved really soon. And I think by the time we're going to address these issues, that will leave us with a huge, huge amount of impact on the, on the humanities as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a very negative impact which is the, the absence of skills, the over-reliance on technology. Um, basically, uh, the humanity <coughs> is a kind of, uh, would be replaced because they want to be replaced because it's, it's, it, would, it would make uh, too much convenience. And that skills gap will disappear. And that skill set and the expertise would kind of also be thinned a bit. So I think in my view here, like the analogy of the cars and the analogy of the, of the AI advancement is a kind of a really serious issues that is uh, leaving us, yes, I agree with the huge advantage of the developments of the AI, the, the advancement of it um, in many aspects. Um, I mean, and, we, and we've seen it today um, in, in the respective panels, presentations. But also, I think uh, technology itself is moving too fast where we are in embark on this and uh, being used um, and can be abu abused uh, in many in many ways thanks how I understand why we have a title with tackling disruptive technology yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay if you have any or further questions or comments well it's time to wrap this up it's my boss <laughs> no, no, please. Uh, I actually had to go back and forth to manage something, so I might miss something important. But I, what I wanted to uh, uh, stress when we talk about uh, using AI for public service is that public service is something that you can't choose, right? Yeah, if AI is used by many different private enterprises, then you can actually opt for the other options, right? But as you are living in Korea, if you are not satisfied with the uh, public service based uh, using AI, then you can't, you have to move to another country. Otherwise, you have to abide by it, right? You need to, if there is any uh, public service, uh, 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 AI-based public service, or AI-based public faking services, like, like well, if, as, for example, like a care is provided based on some AI algorithm, then there's nothing you can do about it if there's any bias or any problem. That's why we need to think um, 
we need to be careful ex extraordinarily when, uh, especially employing, for example, like ChatGPT for the public service. Yeah, that's my comment. I'm a person who works for ICT, but I'm a person who works for this. Can I ask you a question? I'm a person who works for a mic. I'm a person who works for a mic. I'm a person who works for a mic. 어, 방금 전에 예, 여러분들이 아주 중요한 지적들을 하셨습니다. 그런데 특히 모니카 어, 교수께서 말씀하신 분에 난 굉장히 중요한 부분을 지적했다고 생각을 해요. 어, 사실은 그 이게 에, 그 이렇습니다. 아, 이 인공지능을 개발하는 입장에서 보면 개발자가 필요한데 이, 이미 최치 PD가 대학 졸업한 후 3년 정도의 경력이 있는 사람 정도의 능력으로 프로그램을 한다는 거예요. 그래서 이게 무슨 이야기냐. 대개 3년 정도 경력 있는 사람들은 어, 한국식으로 보면 은 연봉이 그 간접비 하면 한 1억 정도가 나갈 수가 있습니다. 어, 그렇게 해서 1억이라는 것은 한 사람의 인건비가 한 10만 불 US 달러 정도 되는 굉장히 큰 비용이 절약될 수 있는 그런 기회가 온 거지요. 어, 그래서 어, 이 기업가들이 이제는 더 이상 어, 신참 어, 소프트 엔지니어들을 이제 에, 그 에, 뽑 채용하지 않을 것이다 한 걱정이 굉장히 현실적으로 나타나고 있고요. 어, 지금 모니카 교수께서 말씀하신 것은 아마도 어, 그 우리가 전화기가에 뭐 전화기가 대신 그 전화번호 를 기억하니까 우리가 전화번호 를 외우지 못합니다. 가족 거 외에는 되게 그런 상황이고. 늘 우리가 아는 길을 갔었는데 옛날에 지도 보고 찾아서 가서 그 길을 잘 아는데 내비게이션이 있으니까 길도 기억을 못해요. 이제 없으면 큰일이 나는 거죠. 어, 그런데 에, 이 부분은 최근에 아마 지난주인가요? 그 일론 머스크도 그러고 몇 명이 에, AI에 대한 연구를 중지하라. 이거 너무 위험하다. 아, 그렇게 해서 얘기가 됐었고 한쪽에서는 우린 중지해도 중지하지 않는 나라도 있을 것이다. 그럼 우리만 손해보는 거 아니냐. 이런 걱정을 하는 것도 같이 나와 있는데 한국에서도 굉장히 그 토론이 뜨겁습니다. 아, 그래서 한국에서는 되게 엔지니어들은 무슨 말이냐 이거 빨리빨리 개발도 하고 거기서 문제점을 찾아서 개선을 해야지 하고 있고요. 어, 엔지니어가 아니면 그게 어떻게 될지 나도 몰라. 그러나 이게 위험을 알, 안 고, 그, 알면서 그냥 갈 수는 없지 않는, 않는가 하는 이런 의견이 굉장히 많습니다. 그럼 한국 전체로는 어떨까요? 아마 한국 전체로 봐서는 그래도 빨리빨리 이 개발해야 될 거야. 그쪽이 좀 많을지도 모릅니다. 제가 드리고 싶은 말씀은 어, 저는 이 부분이 아까 그 이런 기술자들이 AI를 개발하고 새로운 서비스를 개발할 때도 어, 여러 다양한 행정학자는 어, 물론이고 법학자 또 사회학자가 다 참여한다는 것은 목표를 잘 세워야 된다는 말씀을 드린 거예요. 과정은 개발한 과정은 엔지니어가 하겠지만 그건 다른 사람이 해줄 수 없어요. 그러나 그것이 무엇을 위하는, 무엇을 위한 시스템이냐. 이거는 같이 의논하고 거기서 면밀하게 준비를 해야 된다라고 생각을 하는데요. 지금 앞에서 말씀드린 전화기나 내비게이션이나 또는 그 계산기가 학교 수업에 도입될 때도 그런 문제가 많았습니다만 은 제가 보는 관점 중에 하나는 어, 이것이 우리가 사는 것이 이게 고도화될수록 분업화되기 쉽다고 생각을 합니다. 예를 들면 지금은 모두 자동차를 운전하시고 그 하시지만 자동차 고장 나면 은그 고쳐주는 카센터에 가서 도움을 받으시지요. 그러나 이런 자동차가 아니고 옛날에 직접 엔진이 안 달린 바퀴만 달려있는 그런 수레들을 썼을 때는 고장 났으면 모두 아마 직접 고쳤을 거예요. 저는 그런 점에서 보면 앞으로 AID가 이렇게 돼서 여러 가지 위험이 있고 우리가 사실 그 모든 것을 어, 우리가 아주 낮은 수준에서부터 높은 수준까지 다 확인할 수 있었어야 되는데 이게 중간 이하는 AI가 다 해준다면 여기 굉장히 리스크가 있다. 그런 상황이고요. 그러나 어떻게 보면 은그 중간을 맡아주는 전문가 그룹이 생길 수 있다고 생각을 해요. 그리고 아까 우리 발표자들께서도 그런 퀄리티 얘기를 많이 하셨는데 그런 전문가 그룹이 어떻게 역할을 할 거냐. 
아까 전문가들을 그러한 그 실무적인 부분에서도 그것을 보장해주고 안전성과 신뢰성과 위험을 피할 수 있는 그런 걸 해주는 그런 부분들이 어떻게 만들어질 것이냐 어떻게 보면 이제 인력의 문제로 돌아온 것 같습니다. 그래서 그런 쪽으로 조금 더 우리가 고민해야 되고 그 해결 방안을 찾아야 될 것인데 이미 최치 PT는 한번 써본 사람은 안 쓰기 어려운 상황이 됐습니다. 이미 기존의 질서들이 무너지는 이런 디스럽티브, 디스럽티브 시츄에이션이 이미 된, 된 상황이죠. 우리는 뭘할수 있을까요? 감사합니다. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you know what is the role, key role of the moderator? Time management. <웃음> okay, if I fail to that, then I'm a bad moderator. Uh, well, I want to have a more time for these sessions, but lunch is waiting for you, so I have to wrap it up. Please forgive me, okay? Uh, no, I, anyway, uh, anyway, so, well, why don't we have some discussions, you know, after the session, informally, okay? So, time's to wrap it up. And uh, first of all, I have to thank you for every panel's speakers and discussions, and well, in addition, I have to thank you for all the audiences because paying attention for the two hours, gosh, it's really hard. I hope you have a reward for your time management. Thank you. Bye bye. Good day.
Uh, the uh, second the session? session? Oh, oh yes, uh, how, how, right? <laughs> okay, I'll uh, uh, hand over my mic to uh, Professor Hee Kang Kim of Korean University, who is going to moderate the second session. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, let's get started our second session ethical engagement with AI-driven technology. I am Hee Kang Kim from Korea University, and I'm the moderator of this second session. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce our presenters and discussant. Uh, the first, the Tom Sorrell, the professor of University of Warwick, and the David Professor David Wesley, the professor of the Queen Mary University, who will participate in, in online. And the third presentation by the Yudong Lee, the specialist solution architect of Amazon Web Services. And then Sam Yong Lee, the professor of Gongong University of Law School. And we have three discussants. The first, Jin Gon Son, the professor of Korea National Often University. Ki Pyeong Lee, the research fellow of KLRI. And the finally, Sonic Jo, research fellow of KRI VET. Yes. And we're gonna have expect to have the about 20 minutes of the presentations. Then we will have the uh, discussions, and we will have the often often discussion through the floor. And let's hear first about our first presentation by the Professor Tom Sorrell. I've got about 21 slides, so it, it won't take long to go through this. This is the, um, the menu, so to speak, of the, of the talk. I'm first going to speak about the Goldacre Report. Um, that's a fairly recent report talking about uh, trusted research environments, that's to say digital platforms that are safe for medical research in particular. Um, I'm going to relate that to other um, similar platforms that have existed previously in, in the UK. Um, and then I'm going to um, present a difficulty for uh, trusted research environments as they've been applied in the UK up to now. Um, you'll see what the problem is. Um, it's very simple. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Um, that's where the difficulties come in, and we'll talk about um, uh, algorithm development on a national uh, TRE. You'll see it's a very simple presentation, so there's, there's not much to it. Here's the, um, the account of the Goldacre report. So Ben Goldacre, I don't know whether people have heard of him, but Ben Goldacre is an Oxford computer scientist academic, and he was asked by the government um, to consider how medical research could be done in the UK using very valuable, unique data sets that exist in, um, in the UK for patients. Um, and uh, when we're talking about the, the data involved, uh, we're talking about uh, a very, very large data set indeed. So we have, in the UK, we have a, a data set of patient records 
for 65 million people, but over decades. So um, it's a huge amount of data, and that's only one of the important data sets. There's a COVID data set um, that's very well known now, I think, and there's um, the sequencing of the genomes of 500,000 UK citizens. Uh, that's, that's itself a huge data set. So this gives you an idea of some of the data, by no means all of the data that he's thinking about. Um, whoops, I'm, I'm going backwards. So what Goldacre uh, suggests is a certain kind of computer architecture that, um, uh, that keeps data on, these, on this platform secure and that uh, also streamlines some of the ethical approval processes um, involved in the use of medical data. So it's both privacy protecting in the sense that a great deal of attention is paid to de-identifying patients whose data is being used. Um, but it's also secure against cyber attack uh, because of the way it's designed. And there are other approaches that are distinctive to do with open coding and um, high degrees of interoperability. That's the, the general idea. So the, the idea is just to maximize the usability of data, including by speeding up standard approval processes. Whoops, I keep going backwards. So these platforms are called uh, trusted research environments. What Goldacre was proposing was that for the research that was going to be pursued on medical data in the UK, that there be two or three of these platforms designed in the way that I've just described. Um, there would be two or three for a, for a number of reasons, and they would be operating, so to speak, simultaneously or possibly as a backup, one for the other. That's the basic idea. Now, platforms like this have existed in the UK before. Um, I don't know whether people have heard of the SAIL data bank uh, in Wales, but it has existed since 2006. And what it is, is a, a kind of combination of administrative data and medical data just for patients in Wales. And it's basically um, uh, a big platform where data is encrypted and de-identified and it's separated up to a point. So content from medical records is treated separately from demographic data. If one's trying to, um, uh, to look at the demographic uh, data for particular patients, that's combined from two different sources in the sale data bank. So it's not held all together um, all the time. Um, I've included a link, um, so if you wanted to, to pursue this, you could see how the sale uh, data bank is governed. But the general idea that, that Goldacre had is anticipated, it seems to me, in this data set, which is a proven, well-known, um, you know, platform. So instead of calling, instead of talking about trusted research environments, we sometimes have a different terminology. People talk about data safe havens. The sale um, a platform is considered a safe haven for data. The same idea as a trusted research environment. And there's also this further terminology. It's all the terminologies for the same thing, which is for a safe data environment. It all means the same thing. The policy guidelines for these safe data environments in England are very recent, less than six months old. And you can, you can have a look at them here if you want to, uh, to pursue it. Just click on this link. <clears throat> but just to summarize, secure data environments allow organizations to control who can become a user to access the data. The particular data that people are going to access, what users can do with the data in the environment, 
and the information users can remove. Usually they can't remove any uh, data. And that's a problem <laughs> that we'll come back to. <clears throat> In the UK at the moment, we've got a little bit of a departure from what Goldacre was recommending because we don't have a full scale, uh, we, we don't have even one full scale platform of the kind that Goldacre wanted. Instead, we've got a number of um, nationally important data sets that are being accessed on a couple of platforms at the moment. And there's a, a movement toward having all of the, the, the platforms that Goldacre was talking about. And at the moment, um, we don't just have a, a national safe data environment, we also have regional uh, safe data environments. There are six of those in the UK. And those are meant to link data in different regions of the, of the UK. The kind of thing that's been done in Wales for a long time, but for different regions of the UK. It's important that these um, safe data environments are meant to be used not just by academics and by researchers in uh, government institutes, but also by industry. And that creates problems that we'll come to. So one of the things that's happening with these safe data environments, the ones that exist so far, is that people are invited not just to come on the platforms, but to use some of the tools that are provided by those platforms. But these tools, basically, as we'll see, are not very sophisticated and they don't include AI tools. So they allow uh, for correlations of different data fields. They allow, I think I'm coming to this, they allow for, um, Yeah, they allow for search. They allow, they allow people to correlate data fields, but those, these tools that are offered are not AI tools, and the use of these tools is supervised. So you can use these tools uh, to kind of cross-refer lots and lots of census data with medical data. You can use geographical um, analysis. You can use all kinds of analytic tools, but basically all you get is correlations of different data fields. The use of tools is supervised. People have to be trained in using the tools. They're observed as they're using the tools. They cannot have any operations on, the, um, on these platforms that have not been agreed in advance. There's keystroke monitoring. It's super, super surveilled all activities on these platforms. And the, this is an expression of the, um, you know, the government's wish not to have any patient data de-identified and basically to protect privacy. I think the scruples that are taken to protect privacy are way over the top, but that's the, uh, the approach that's being used in, uh, in the UK. Uh, I keep doing this. Now, we come to the problem. Um, one of the uses of these national TREs might be to decant the data collected from particular research projects. And I want to just describe a problem that we've encountered in one of, um, one of a UK government funded research project to do with pathology data and the kinds of difficulties that we have in running a very small-scale TRE, um, and maybe the question of what would happen to this small TRE when the project finishes. One possibility is to take this small TRE and to put it on a national platform. Do you see what I mean? But the idea of turning this small TRE, which I, I will describe in more detail in a minute, the idea of turning this small TRE into um, something that sits on a national platform um, is full of difficulty for reasons that I will come to. 
So let's, let me describe the small TRE and then the difficulty of, of turning it into something that sits on a national TRE. So what I'm describing here is the Path Lake project. Um, I've, I've been a member of that research team. The Path Lake project is a center of excellence that's been funded by Innovate UK. Innovate UK funds industry university collaborations. And in this case, um, the purpose of Pathlake is to collect whole slide images of pathology um, biopsies um, and to find patterns within those um, biopsies that predict disease or that predict different kinds of outcomes of disease, prognostics, how long people will live if they have a certain kind of disease. So this is a heavily AI-driven um, project where uh, different companies and university researchers that are funded under Path Lake come to the data lake. Um, they ask for, for um, certain numbers of slides. There are now 200,000 whole slide images on this platform. People come in <clears throat> and want to develop algorithms that help people to predict um, prostate cancer or breast cancer, sometimes other diseases that are not cancer, based on um, quantitative analysis of the structures of cells um, that can be seen using host slide images under uh, scanners, scanners that work like electronic microscopes. That's the basic, that's the basic idea. Um, so, this gives you a picture of the data flows within Pathlake. And you read this slide from left to right. You see that on the left-hand side is where the NHS data enters the information stream. It's collected from contributing data uh, laboratories that use scanners. Um, those uh, collections contribute to a local data pond at a particular participating university, then the, the data in the local ponds are de-identified and stuck in the, in the data lake, which is shown in the middle. Now, university researchers using this uh, data are able to do so with fairly few restrictions. But we also promised Innovate UK that we would allow commercial algorithm developers to have access to this data lake. And this is where the problems start. <laughs> because if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, we see the process by which commercial companies that are not members of the Path Lake project get access to the images in the data lake. What they have to do is describe the, pa the patient benefit of a certain algorithm that they wish to develop. Um, that proposal to do work, which comes with a request to use certain numbers of slides, that proposal is then seen by an access committee. The access committee is constituted primarily <coughs> of patients, ordinary patients within the NHS, and they have to be convinced that an algorithm um, that's being developed will actually benefit patients. That means that the proposers have to put their idea in a way that ordinary people can understand, also not easy. And then if they are convinced that there is a significant patient benefit from developing an algorithm, then it's approved, money changes hands, the uh, companies have to pay for access uh, to, the, uh, to the data lake. Um, I know a lot about this committee because I chair it. <clears throat> and one of the problems that has arisen, uh, which I, I will um, explain to you now, is, is the following. So imagine that a project has been approved and an algorithm is about to be developed. How does the commercial company train and test an algorithm on that platform? If it, if it sort of says, please help me to get on the platform, it means that researchers who host 
the, um, the platform have to make a lot of computer time and expertise available to help these commercial developers get into the data lake and test just the right number of, of images uh, for developing the algorithm. If they come on to the, to the platform with their code, they have to reveal their code, which is intellectual property of an extremely valuable kind, if it works. So that's a great big difficulty right there, that we're not able to collaborate with companies um, on that basis because it means that they reveal too much of their code. But if we say, on the other hand, take away some data, we violate the rules that govern uh, uh, trusted research environments because data is not supposed to ever to leave the site. So you can see that once we, in once we inject AI into, um, into these trusted research environments, we have many more problems than if people are simply invited to do some data cleaning and to find correlations and do some low-level types of analytics on, on these projects. Are you with me? Now, this, this problem <laughs> that we've encountered um, is only beginning to be realized because most of the analytics that's being done on the national platforms at the moment is nothing to do with developing algorithms. But if these national platforms are going to be good for developing algorithms, or if the Pathlake data set is going to find a home after the project is finished, they have to sort these problems out. How can these problems be sorted out? Either they have to relax the rules called the five safes, which restrict the movement of data, or they have to um, break the rules. Um, and at the moment, uh, there is no consensus on how this should be done. So um, uh, that's basically the problem that, uh, that I wanted uh, to, to bring to your attention. In order to solve this problem, we need either a relaxation in people's um, worries about the privacy of the data, which as I indicated before, seem very exaggerated to me, and we have, to, we have to say that if we trust an algorithm developer, we will give them a tiny amount of data that they can take away, and then we trust them uh, to destroy the data after a certain point. We either do it that way, or we, we face an impasse. So um, uh, the kind of solution that I favor is a sort of dilution of what people usually think of as the ethical requirements for running platforms of this kind. Instead of saying that every bit of energy has to go into de-identifying patient data and making it absolutely impossible to make inferences about who's collecting this data, um, you stop obsessing about that stuff. You know, you, you relax access for the sake of developing algorithms that could save lives. That doesn't mean that there's a simple answer to the question, which developers do you trust? But at least you get beyond this impasse, which is written in to the way that uh, TREs are designed at the moment. And sort of getting a procedure for doing that is what my next kind of research uh, will be about. It'll be a relaxed, a more relaxed ethical regime, but on the basis of arguments that privacy of medical data is way, way, way too um, overemphasized. So that's the pitch. Thank you for the presentations. And the Next presentation by the Professor David Leslie on the AIS XR technology will be performed through the video recording. Thank you. Thank you and greetings from Kent in the UK. I am so sad not to be able to be there with you in Seoul today, 
but extremely grateful um, to the Korea Institute uh, of Public Administration for extending this very kind invita invitation to me to participate in this important conference and for including me uh, in this uh, crucial conversation. So I'm gonna talk today a little bit about artificial intelligence as what I call an axial technology. That is uh, a technology that is placing humanity, if you will, at an axis of choice, deciding whether or not uh, the way we design and use this technology um, will lead either to uh, a future of public uh, benefit and uh, societal good or towards uh, a future that presents risks to the uh, sustainability of our biosphere um, and risks of uh, immense uh, global catastrophic harm. Uh, so in many ways, the swift metamorphosis of the computer age into our present era of omnipresent internet communications, networked devices and mobile connectivity has ushered in a societal sea change. We increasingly live in a dynamic and integrated digital world where connected machines containing countless sensors and sites of behavioral measurement intermingle with ever-present algorithmic systems and cloud computing platforms. Amidst such an incipient computational ubiquity, AI technologies are progressively more being directed at an unbounded problem space, an increasingly limitless field of potential applications. Indeed, as AI systems are ever more coming to play a constituent role in the critical digital infrastructure of connected society writ large, the breadth of their impacts is expanding in kind. In this cyber physical condition, algorithmically personalized services reach into the private lives of targeted decision subjects and have an active curatorial hand in real life processes of identity formation. Concurrently as scaled computational methods of attention mining, relevance ranking, popularity sorting and trend predicting steer the digital public square influencing and organizing citizens, uh, the way that citizens can interact and engage in the political, cultural, and moral life of the community. Meanwhile, as AI models continue to swiftly grow in speed, scale, and complexity with the explosion of big data and the exponential enlargement of computing power, scientists are gaining new capacities to alter the very constitution of nature. Such unprecedented technological affordances are enabling them at the microscopic level to more effectively engineer the molecular building blocks of life and to reprogram the genetic code of all earthbound organisms. Likewise, they are facilitating scientists' abilities at the macroscopic level to manipulate the climate at a planetary scale through the re-engineering of the composition of the Earth system itself. While boosters and pundits alike have embroidered this expansionist trend, calling AI the new electricity, the single most influential human innovation in history, or simply humanity's final invention, one thing remains clear. The pervasiveness and innovation spawning character of AI makes it a general purpose technology, which is transforming who we are, how we live, and who we aspire to be. AI is, however, not simply a general purpose technology par excellence. Taken together, the potential penetration of AI into all sectors of society and the protracted aggregate impacts of its knock-on effects in other innovation domains mean that it is more essentially an axial technology, which is placing humanity at a kind of turning point. That is, as these technologies gradually uh, become more pervasive, across all domains of human activity, as the scope of their impacts increasingly stretch from the depths and shallows of personal intimacy, individual well-being, and social connection to the fate of biospheric flourishing itself, humanity is for better or worse being drawn closer and closer to a kind of critical threshold beyond which, which its social reality, its world of shared experience, could fundamentally and perhaps irretrievably change. AI is axial in the sense that it places the direction of this change in the lap of the moral agency of the present, 
It places us humans and the manner in which our values, motivations, and choices steer the gathering energies of technological advancements in AI at the axis of choice, which will determine the trajectory of this change. That is, whether it veers toward the advancement of human well being and the public good, or towards possibilities for the potentially irreparable harm to fundamental rights and freedoms, and to the humanly prompted generation of global catastrophic and biospheric risks. Many scholars have stressed along these lines that AI possesses an intractably dualistic character. On the one hand, it is argued, AI technologies hold the potential to do a world of good, harnessing new methods of human ingenuity and productive power to deliver unprecedented public benefit. This expanding social utility is already evident in the emerging capacities of AI to improve the human lot across individual, societal, and biospheric planes of action and experience. In the field of health and social care, for instance, AI applications are allowing doctors to detect and diagnose diseases earlier and more effectively, to better target cancer drugs and other therapeutics, and to carry out delicate surgical procedures with previously inconceivable precision. At the wider level of supporting social and biospheric sustainability, AI technologies are helping people to combat biodiversity loss and deforestation by revolutionizing the field of conservation biology to bolster food security and societal resilience through precision agriculture and smart manufacturing, and to facilitate climate change uh, by improving, oh, sorry, to, to fight climate change by improving energy transportation, urban infrastructure. More generally, researchers have stressed the potential of AI to act as an enabler for all the targets of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. On the other hand, however, many have observed that AI technologies hold the potential to do a world of harm. It is feared that rather than advancing individual well-being, societal equity, and social and biospheric sustainability, the hastening development of AI could operate, in fact, to undermine basic human dignity and autonomy, to jeopardize social solidarity and interpersonal trust, to exacerbate or even augment inequality and structural discrimination, and to contribute to environmental degradation and climate change. On this view, at the agent level, the pervasive mobilization of individual targeting predictive analytics and other large-scale behavioral technologies have already enabled incessant practices of hyper-personalized psychographic profiling, consumer curation, and behavioral nudging that have tended to exploit the emotive vulnerabilities and psychological weaknesses of targeted people. These technologies have instrumentalized them in this sense as monetizable sites of behavioral surplus, treating them as manipulable objects of prediction rather than as reflective subjects worthy of decision-making autonomy and moral regard. Likewise, critics have observed that at the societal level, the escalating use of AI-based social sorting and management infrastructures and digital surveillance technologies promise to endanger more and more of the formative modes of open interpersonal communication that have enabled the relationships of mutual trust and interpersonal responsibility upon which modern democratic forms of life have largely been predicated. This is beginning to manifest, for instance, in the widespread deployment of algorithmic labor and productivity management technologies, where forms of ubiquitous personnel tracking and labor management can have so-called panoptic effects, causing people to alter their behavior on suspicions it is being constantly observed or analyzed, deterring the sorts of open worker-to-worker -worker interactions that enable the development of social trust and solidaristic connection, and supporting wider societal patterns of surveillance creep that ultimately have chilling effects on the exercise of fundamental rights and freedoms. Lastly, at the level of biospheric integrity and sustainability, researchers have stressed the significant environmental costs of training and tuning computationally hungry state-of-the-art AI models, like uh, the GPT series, the, the large language models and foundation models that have exploded recently, and that uh, these models are increasingly compounding uh, compounded by the carbon emissions generated 
by the hardware manufacturing and infrastructure needed to facilitate them. So for instance, in the design of uh, and fabrication of integrated circuits. Ultimately, um, this uh, con combination of uh, the carbon emissions generated by uh, infrastructure and the uh, use of the energy by the models themselves in their training and deployment are, are raising grave uh, ethical issues uh, about the overall contribution of data research innovation practices to climate change and the degradation of planetary health. Now, AI is an axial technology in just this sense. It uniquely holds the key both to the potential for the exponential advancements uh, of human well being that I mentioned, but also to the possibilities for the humanly prompted generation of catastrophic societal and biospheric scale risks, so like those I just mentioned as well. It is as yet humankind that must ultimately choose which direction this axis will turn, whether it is towards the future flourishing of our species and the sustainability of our biosphere, the sumum bonum, the greatest good for all, or towards the anthropogenic realization of its most destructive possibilities, the sumum malum, humanity's greatest bad. Let me just offer a few uh, concluding thoughts by suggesting that in considering the choice between engaging recklessly and irresponsibly in a triumphalist sprint to some non-existent technological finish line, or embracing a more planetary vision of AI innovation as a global public good that can deliver future benefit to all of, of our species and our biosphere, we must engage first in critical self-reflection on the, on the greater intergenerational responsibility that attends our exceptional possession of the moral agency of this choice itself. This is a choice not simply about the values and qualities that will shape prospects for the future flourishing of life, but even more fundamentally about whether or not we are at bottom as a species capable of collectively upholding the worth of our very own survival. For as humankind now stands at the precipice of this kind of civilizational tipping point, we do so as a dangerous species. We are a species that on the one hand is unconstrained in its pursuit of the boundless possibilities opened by the infinite generativity of its capacity for language, representation and symbolic experience. This is in fact the very essence of our poetic or creative power of techne that subtends the restless and indefinite impetus of technological innovation itself. And yet we are a species that is for precisely this reason, uniquely equipped with the intellectual competences to create the conditions of possibility for our own extermination and for the total destruction of biospheric life as such. The question then remains, how do we responsibly wield this primordially creative but potentially lethal power? Do we wield it as a power over life, a power situated in what Martin Heidegger called the naked industriousness of the modern technological worldview, a power that inframes and objectifies the entirety of the natural world as mere standing reserve, and that orders and exploits all of its living and inert resources at whim? Do we follow in the footsteps of our industrious forebears who first tore into the living tissue of the earth to harvest the fossil fuels that powered the great machines of the industrial age? Do we proceed apace down this path of human enterprise and through our relentless carbonification of, our, uh, of the atmosphere, our deforestation of the planet and our morbid reverence for limited growth and accumulation continue to irretrievably tamper with the viability of our climate to poison our soil, oceans, and air, and to enact an elimination of biodiversity at a rate of obliteration that is now surpassing the pace of the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction 65 million years ago? Or do we harness this poetic or creative power as something else, not as a springboard to the sumum malu and to the totalizing mortification of the living, but rather as a wellspring for the summum bonum and for the affirmation of the intrinsic worth of life. For we are not just a dangerous species readily capacitated to affect planetary self-annihilation, 
We are at the same time an ethical species, a species endowed with recourse to the media of collaboration, communication, and criticism by means of which we are able to constrain our penchant for technological triumphalism and to sustain the futurity and flourishing of our species whole, a species endowed with a deep historically ingrained sense of responsibility to the intrinsic worth of life as such, and hence capable of stewarding the sustenance of the biosphere as its trustees and as its guardians. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for the presentation. And the, our next presentation by the Yudong Lee on the topic of responsible AI, remo removing bias from AI ML. Sorry. I had to adjust the um, you know, microphone a little bit higher. <laughs> um, thanks for having me today here. Uh, my name is Yudong Lee. Um, I work for Amazon Web Services. Um, because of part of my work that I deal with a lot of customers who's willing to adopt AI or machine learning, um, not only in public, but um, also in the um, commercial sectors. Um, so for up until um, now, that uh, everyone um, who's presenting or um, you know, questioning uh, or from the audience that um, giving me a lot of the uh, insights uh, in terms of AI. Um, so I'm very uh, grateful today. But I hope that, that um, we'll I was gonna talk about responsible AI and ethics and you know the sort of topics today, but I figured that everyone except me has got like better idea uh, in terms of the um, AI ethics and all that. So I'll probably steer a little bit into um, different direction of my presentation today. So I'm hoping that uh, you know everyone will have like different um, view or insights from me as well. Um, well, before I kick off, that I need to clarify a few things. Um, the materials that has been provided to you today in terms of my session has got a lot of slides, but I don't think that I'll be able to, um, you know, mention everything in the material. So that's for your information later on. So I'll be, especially for this talk, that I'll be focusing on um, um, a few things. Uh, mainly, and then the rest that I'll uh, probably give it to you as a homer, and then um, yeah, after that you can um, contact me or contact someone else's in um, AWS as well if you wanted to talk further. So responsible AI, uh, I'll probably more focus on what it is and why it is important and how we can um, implement that. I was gonna use this one. Sorry, I haven't used this one before, so there will be a learning curve. <laughs> Is it? Oh, sorry. So that the slide that you're seeing here is basically the um, in a survey result from Gartner's. So what it basically I'm um, telling you is that um, the adopting AI into your existing system is already challenging. That's because of the um, nature of machine learning project or AI project. But also there are other considerations such as the um, security or you know the um, sorry I can't even read this one uh, you know potential risks and all that. So, and then the, in terms of the uh, risks and liabilities, of course AI could go wrong. Just like as, you know, any human being can go wrong. So that has been very, um, you know, problematic and looks like problematic in these days. 
Um, and we're going to look at why this is happening and how we're going to um, sort of mitigate this risk. Sorry, I apologize that uh, because of the, I've got like too many slides, I might have to skip a few slides. So please, yeah, understand that one. So there are many topics when it comes to AI or machine learning. And uh, as we've been um, discussed uh, from the morning, so there's been bias, privacy, um, but I'll probably more focusing on the um, ex explainable AI and the um, responsible AI um, throughout this session. So what is, what is exactly um, responsible AI? Responsible AI is more like a bigger um, umbrella or a um, bigger concept or framework or a set of the um, principles that covers the, your um, AI system or machine learning system that describes how, how to um, design, um, develop, deploy, and um, operate the entire AI systems especially in a way that I minimize the um, misuse, abuse, uh, poor design, or um, other negative um, you know, aspects when it comes to consequences that an AI system may um, generate. So that's the, um, this is relatively um, new terminology. So um, that's the um, responsible AI. So what you need to remember here is that uh, it is, as I said, it is more like a big umbrella that will um, overarching the, your entire um, existing AI system, if you like, or you know, the AI system you're developing. Why do we need to care? That's because of re responsible AI can help to minimize the uh, risk or the, uh, mitigate the uh, risks or liabilities that are associated with um, AI systems. And it can increase the, um, especially, uh, the, the, as I said, the uh, nature of the AI system that cost a lot of you know, time and money. So um, because of this responsible AI, it might um, reduce the, um, or the, uh, reduce the time and money uh, when it comes to the adoption of AI. It can also help the um, building AI system that serve better their users and society, which we are hoping. So there are many, many aspects of um, responsible AI. I have um, narrowed down into um, six aspects. Again, because of the time constraint that I've got today, I'll probably focus on um, a, a few things here. First one will be um, bias. I know we've talked a lot about this bias, um, but um, as I indicated earlier, I'll probably steer direction a little bit into a technical aspect and see if that um, you know, provides you any um, different point of view. I'll just give the um, you know, definition, as you probably know um, this better than me. But when it comes to bias, it's, it's everywhere. As we um, spoke earlier, you know, even human has got already um, bias. And the data that we've got today is also biased. So I've watched the very interesting um, documentary from Netflix the other day. And it was like, it was about this MIT student um, start to build the um, computer vision uh, model. And the data she got was highly um, biased. That's because of the, um, it was like the human face recognition system, but the data she got was the more of um, Caucasian based. So you couldn't really, um, you know, the, um, recognize the um, other races, if you like, um, other than Caucasians. So that um, has been a bit of issue in the um, MIT. And it was quite interesting. I forgot the title of the documentary, so I'll probably need to get back to you on that later but it was quite interesting. But just like that, this was an example. The data is already um, biased. But how are, we, how are we gonna mitigate this? Your human's biased, the system is biased, the data is biased, everything is biased. Then how are we gonna mitigate this? 
I think that's when you start looking at the uh, technology side as well. So what if there's a tool, before even looking into the data, uh, you know, the tool already could tell you that, okay, you know, this data, for example, is highly imbalanced. How are you going to deal with it? Then you have like, you know, better idea that, okay, my data has been, you know, highly imbalanced. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, produce more data, or I'm gonna, you know, augment more data. So that's when you can have like better idea how we can um, bring fairness into this biased system. So that's probably what you um, need to look into. So I'm gonna constantly check my time as well. Right. Um, yeah, bias can arise in any stage of the uh, machine learning um, building life cycle. So um, I personally don't think that a human could, you know, the eliminate the uh, risk of biases. That's why I'm keep telling you that uh, you know you should have like the tool or techniques or like even the solutions that might um, you know, assist you better not to be too biased, if you like. Um, yeah, I'll probably <laughs> skip that one. I'll probably um, talk to you a little bit more on to explainable AI. I know I've been saying this a lot these days, but I can't still pronunciate properly of oh, this word, explainable. Sorry, English is my second language, that's why. Um, so explainable AI, uh, basically that's like the techniques or frameworks that are you know, helping you explaining ML machine learning reasoning to humans. So there are two aspects of it. Um, when I started, you know, um, being into this AI word, which was like a few years ago, it was a still like black box. Whatever that uh, you generated when it comes to like the model, it's been all black box. You don't know how it works. You just, you know, put data in, you know, just outcome out. So you don't know what it is, but you just use the prediction as it is. But that has been like very um, risky or challenging. Um, to be adopted because of the ethics that we've been discussing, um, you know, in the morning sessions. So why that are explainable AI is important? That's because of the, um, you know, there are uh, certain aspects of it. So mostly um, it uh, helps with the uh, meeting the uh, regulatory requirements or policies or even the law, if you like. So there are um, many, many, um, you know, good things that I could bring, but I don't think it's like, you know, advantages that of using this one. From now on, I think we need to have this regardless if you're building or if you're dealing with the um, AI systems. So basically this slide tells you that uh, everyone needs to care about it. So I started with like um, two uh, main aspects of explainable AI. One, interpretability, and the other one will be the explainability. So in a nutshell, interpretability is basically the um, cause and effect. So what, what was the data? And then uh, you understand why the outcome is like this. And because of the data, then you've got the interpretability. Explainability, or let's say that you've got like 10 features in the data set that you're putting into a machine learning model. And then if you understand like, okay, first two features that are, it impacts the model outcomes like 50%, then you are starting to build this explainability in your AI system. Sometimes the, in technical side, it's called the uh, feature importance. So that's a very good way of the, um, you know, the, uh, having the explainability in the AI system. So yeah, taxonomies. So this is, this is quite interesting. Um, 
these days, uh, the data scientists or machine learning engineers, they uh, tend to use the uh, deep learning algorithm more than um, traditional machine learning algorithms. That's because of the accuracy has been you know, quite promising using um, you know, those the, uh, frameworks or uh, machine learning models. But the problem is that the, when it comes to um, interpretability or explainability, that's, that's uh, more challenging than the uh, traditional um, the machine learning models. But how do we mitigate this? Again, there is a techniques or tools that are, we need to use. So um, deep learning models, there are like, for example, you know, many, many layers, many, many uh, network layers. I don't think there are like, you know, many, um, you know, data scientists out there that who understand like every singularity of the, um, you know, the deep learning um, frameworks. So they do understand the, the entire big picture, but they don't even really understand the, you know, singularity of that uh, model. So that's when you probably start building, okay, that I need to have this explainability or interpretability. So I'm going to use the tool. So when I use this tool, that uh, this is going to give me insights that are uh, what will be the uh, feature that I'm uh, getting into is more important than the other features in the model. NLP, for example, like I've put the, um, you know, this sentences or paragraphs. Which part of the uh, paragraphs or um, sentences that are giving me like um, this signal? Which part is not that important? So we, we need to have this insight, you know, to have this responsible AI. There are one more aspect of responsible AI that I need to um, emphasize on today, uh, which will be the reproducibility. Um, traditionally, well, not traditionally, like I think it was like 10 years ago that uh, this concept has been developed, which was the um, DevOps. So when it comes to the uh, software development, that uh, you need to have a certain uh, you know building process, but uh, edi in addition to that, you need to have like operating um, you know the part of the process as well, and then uh, combining together, we call DevOps. Nowadays, when it comes to um, AI systems, we call MLOps. So f from the beginning up until the operations, the whole cycle we call MLOps. And then um, there's when um, reproducibility uh, needs to uh, be considered. So in MLOps concept, uh, it reduces the um, manual um, repeatable task from um, data scientists or machine learning engineers. But imagine that um, you use the data and produce the uh, machine learning model but the outcome, you got the A outcome. But next time you run it again, you've got different outcome. But you need to explain it. Why? Well, technically or theoretically, there could be a slight um, change in the um, accuracy. But that was the only thing that you need to expect. You don't expect the, uh, you know, the significant change or drastic, drastic changes in um, prediction outcomes as well as the um, accuracy. But this thing do happen. So um, that's when you need to consider the uh, versioning of everything, like versioning of the data, versioning of the uh, model, uh, even like uh, you know, versioning of the tools that are you, you've been using or you, you, the versioning of the uh, frameworks that are you've been using. So you need to track back, you need to audit back that uh, what you know, produces this outcome differently this time. So that's, that's some of the um, you know, aspect that uh, you need to remember. And then, of course, the, um, you know, the nature, due to the uh, nature of the AI system, you need to keep monitoring that, um, the outcomes. That's because of the um, you know, trend is changing. That means data is changing. That means the model that uh, you're building today will be um, you know, performing differently in the future, even like in a near future.
Like, you know, the world didn't even know about K-drama before, but now everybody knows about it, right? So that's why the uh, continuous monitoring is also a big part of the um, response of AI. I know that I haven't been touching, um, you know, the other aspects of the um, response of AI, but I hope that, that I have given you, like, you know, enough the interesting points of response of AI or even, like, different view of the response of AI that I, you've got today. So um, I think my presentation has been, um, yeah, up to here. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. And the, the final presentation by Sang Yong Lee on the topics of the characteristics of AI technology and its impact on modern legal system. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I, I have to uh, uh, apologize uh, for the fact that I have to uh, present this uh, presentation in uh, Korean because my English is, I think, is not good enough to convey the uh, exact meanings of my presentations. So, uh, I apologize. <laughs> 자, 지금부터는 예, 영어로 아, 하는 대신 이제 한국어로 어, 발표를 진행을 하려고 합니다. 양해 부탁드리겠고요. 제가 오늘 발표할 내용은 어, AI 기술이 가지고 있는 특징이 우리가 현재 살아가고 있는 오늘날의 법 시스템에 어떠한 영향을 미치고 있는가를 보여드리려고 합니다. 네, 네 파트로 구성이 되어 있는데요. 첫 번째 파트는 AI 기술의 특징을 다시 한번 환기하는 작업이 되겠고요. 두 번째 파트는 어, AI 기술 우리 이제 법체계에 미치는 영향을 전반적으로 가장 넓게 표현을 해보자면 법인격을 인정할 수 있는가라는 그런 주제 그게 가장 적절한 테마가 될것 같아서 두 번째로 그걸 다루고요. 세 번째는 이제 사법적 측면, 시블러 차원에서 AI 기술이 그 법에 미치는 영향을 살펴볼 거고 네 번째는 어 공법적 측면에서 어 퍼블릭 로 차원에서 AI 기술의 영향을 살펴보려고 합니다. 예, 이, 부, 이 부분들은 그냥 넘어가겠습니다. 다만 여기 CNN 모델을 간단하게 보여드렸는데요. 음, 이거는 저의 발표에 큰 역할을 하니까 다시 한번 주의를 환기를 해보도록 하겠습니다. 어, 은닉층, 히든 레이어에서 벌어진 일들을 어, 우리가 해석을 인간의 방식으로 해석을 할 수가 없죠. 그래서 어, 어떻게 AI 모델이 그 결과를 끌어냈는지를 논리적으로 설명할 수 없다라는 어, 그런 문제가 있는데 이걸 블랙박스 문제라고 보통 이야기를 했었습니다. 이게 법적으로도 상당히 중요한 의미를 갖습니다. 어, 여기에 보인 어, 보여드린 그림은 AI 기술의 특징. 그리고 그것이 가져오는 어, 뭐 좋은 점과 나쁜 점에 관한 것을 종합적으로 보여드리는 표가 되겠습니다. 어, 오늘날 AI 기술이 이렇게 폭발적으로 활용이 늘어나고 있는 이유는 무엇보다도 이걸 통해서 우리가 엄청난 생산성의 향상을 얻기 때문입니다. 물론 그 자체로 인해서도 사회 문제가 생기기도 하죠. 뭐, 어, 노동시장의 변화라든가 아니면 분배의 악화라든가 이 문제는 여기서 다루긴 조금 적절치 않아서 다음 기회에 말씀드리도록 하고 이러한 생산성의 향상이 도대체 어떠한 특성 AI 기술의 특성을 통해서 나타났는지를 가만히 생각을 해보면 세 가지 차원의 특성이 있다는 것을 발견할 수 있습니다. 첫 번째는 자율성, 두 번째는 합리성, 세 번째는 인간과의 유사성입니다. 쉽게 얘기해서 AI가 인간이 시키지 않아도 혼자서 일을 하고 또 그걸 잘 하고 또 어느 때는 사람처럼 하기 때문에 이 기술이 
각광을 받는 거죠. 그런데 이러한 특성들은 이렇게 우리에게 이득을 안겨다 주는 원인이 되기도 하지만 반대로 우리에게 문제를 일으키는 원인이 되기도 합니다. 우선 자율성과 관련해서 말씀을 드리자면 사람이 시키지 않아도 일을 하기 때문에 안 좋은 결과가 생겼을 때 책임지는 사람이 없을 수 있습니다. 아무도 책임을 지려 하지 않기 때문에 어, 누군가는 책임을 져야 된다라는 원리가 필요해집니다. 그것이 Responsibility라는 어, 어떤 윤리적 원칙으로 나타나게 되었고요. 두 번째로는 어, AI 모델이 가지고 있는 블랙박스의 특성 때문에 어, 도대체 어, 무엇 때문에 이런 안 좋은 결과가 생겼는지를 알기가 어렵습니다. 그래서 이걸 어, 해결하기 위해서 트랜스페런시, 투명성과 또 거기서 더 나아가서 설명 가능성, 익스플레이너빌리티가 요구가 되는 거죠. 두 번째로 합리성과 관련해서도 문제가 생길 수가 있습니다. 일을 잘하는데 도대체 뭐가 문제냐 이렇게 생각을 하실 수도 있는데 생길 수가 있습니다. 어, 사람들이 많이 관심을 갖는 것은 어, 바이어스 문제입니다. AI 모델이 이제 데이터를 통해서 학습을 하는데 어, 인간 세상에 존재하는 데이터를 가지고 학습을 하니까 당연히 인간이 가지고 있는 편향들을 그대로 재현을 해냅니다. 그래서 어, 여기서 이제 공정성이라든가 차별, 편향 이런 문제들이 생겨나는 거죠. 두 번째로 일을 잘하는데 좋은 일만 잘하는 게 아니라 나쁜 일도 참 잘합니다. 롱딩, 예, 위법행위가 문제가 될, 될수 있습니다. 예컨대, 어, 담합을 한다거나, 아니면, 뭐, 대놓고 범죄행위에 이용이 될 수도 있죠. 세 번째로는, 어, 여기 이제, 합리성 격차, rationality gap 이라고 표현을 어, 해놨는데, 어떤 문제냐면, 어, 사람들이 어떤 거래를 할 때에, 양측이 모두 AI 도구를 갖고 있다면 문제가 없는데 한쪽만 AI 도구를 갖고 있다면 둘 사이에는 어, 너무 큰 어, 합리성의 차이가 있게 되고 어, 그래서 그러한 거래 결과가 어, 받아들이기 힘들게 될 수도 있습니다. 예, 기존의 소비자법에서 많이 다뤄져 왔던 정보 격차와 유사한 성격을 띠지만 이 정보를 제공한다고 해서 해결이 되지 않는 그런 문제, 합리성 격차의 문제라서 좀 앞으로 좀 다루기 어려운 문제로 등장할 것으로 예상이 됩니다. 마지막으로 어, 초합리성, super rationality라고 표현을 해봤는데 이것도 문제가 될 수가 있습니다. 어, 최근 들어서 대규모 언어 모델, LM, large language 모델들이 나타나면서 도대체 AI가 어디까지 똑똑해질 수 있느냐 사람들이 이제 궁금해지기 시작했는데요. 음, 이런 것도 우리가 생각해 볼수 있는 문제인 것 같습니다. 그 다음에 마지막으로 어, 인간과의 유사성이라고 하는 것. 어, 뭐 챗봇이나 이런 데서 좋게 쓰이기도 합니다만 돌봄 로봇 같은 데서 그러나 사람과 비슷하다고 하는 것이 이 AI에게 어떤 윤리적인 지위나 법적 지위 애를 부여해야 되는 것 아닌가 라는 그런 이제 논쟁을 낳게 되기도 하죠. 그러면 이제 사법 분야를 살펴보도록 하겠습니다. 시간이 얼마 없기 때문에 어, 슬라이드에 많은 내용이 있지만 주요 요지를 위주로 어, 설명을 드리겠습니다. 어, 인공지능과 법인격이라는 주제가 지난 몇 년간 논의가 되어 왔습니다. 여러 가지 접근 방법이 있는데요. 저는 개인적으로 이두 번째 칸에 있는 속성 중심 접근법 그리고 관계 중심 접근법 이두 가지 차원에서 바라보는 게 이해하기 편하다고 생각을 합니다. 속성 중심 점, 접근법 즉 attribute based approach라는 것은 어, 전통적인 주체 객체 이분법을 전제로 하고 또 어, 어떤 주체가 가지고 있는 시, 실체적인 속성 이런 것들을 또 중시하고요. 또 어, 
자유주의에 좀 기반해 있는 그런 방법이라고 할수 있겠습니다. 주로는 이제 칸트의 의무론을 기반으로 하는 경우가 많은데요. 뭐 자세한 내용은 뭐 넘어가시도록 하고 핵심은 어떤 주체가 그 자체로 가지고 있는 속성이 뭐냐에 주목하는 방법이라고 할수 있겠습니다. 이에 비해서 관계 중심 접근법은 문제되는 주체가 어떤 속성을 갖고 있는지는 둘째 문제로 하고 다른 주체가 그러니까 다른 사람이 그 문제가 되는 주체를 어떻게 대하느냐, 어떻게 여기느냐를 중심으로 접근을 하는 겁니다. 어, 러프하게 말하자면 공리주의라든가 공동체주의적인 어, 접근 방법의 느낌이 살짝 나는 예, 그런 거라고 할수 있겠습니다. 우선 속성 중심 접근법에서 보면 어, 특히 이제 대륙법 계통에서는 이제 칸트의 이론을 기반으로 하고 있어서 인간의 자율성과 합리성, 즉 자유의지와 어, 이성을 어, 기반으로 해서 인간의 이제 권리라든가 권리 주체성이라든가 이런 것들을 인정을 해 왔습니다. 따라서 AI에게도 과연 이러한 자율성이라든가 합리성 같은 게 있는 것 아니냐? 뭐 이런 질문이 있을 수가 있습니다. 그런데 적어도 현재의 AI 기술 단계에서는 인간의 그 권리의 주체가 되기에 필요한 정도의 자율성이나 합리성은 존재하지 있다고 보기 어렵고 단지 도구적 의미에서 어떤 이제 성능의 의미에서 이러한 특성을 갖고 있을 뿐이라고 생각이 듭니다. 그렇다면 AI에게는 속성 중심 접근법에 따르면 법인격이 없다고 할 수도 있을 텐데 사람들은 사실은 자율성과 합리성보다는 영혼이 있는, AI에게 영혼이 있느냐, 마음이 있느냐, 의식이 있느냐 이런 질문을 많이 던지곤 합니다. 어, 물론 이러한 속성들은 영혼, 마음, 의식과 같은 속성들은 대륙법에서는 법인격 주체성의 근거로 다뤄지진 않았습니다. 영미법은 좀 다를 수 있는데요. 그럼에도 불구하고 말씀을 드려보자면 음, 영혼의 문제는 너무 종교적이니까 넘어가고요. 그 마인드, 어, 마음의 문제만 놓고 말씀을 드려보자면 기능주의적인 접근 방법, 펑셔널리스트 접근 방법에 의하면 사람처럼 어, 어떤 행위나 말을 하는 경우라면 은 어, 그러니까 사람과 구별할 수 없는 정도의 AI라고 한다면 어, 모르겠습니다만 현재 단계에서의 AI에게 어, 이런 인간과 같은 마음이 있다 이렇게 판단하기는 어려울 것 같습니다. 의식에 관해서 말씀을 드려보자면 AI에게 의식이 있는지를 물어보는 것 자체가 어떻게 보면 약간 난센스인 측면이 있습니다. 왜냐하면 의식이라는 것은 사람의 경우에도 객관적으로 인식되기가 어려운 거거든요. 주관적인 어 그런 경험, subjective experience의 문제이기 때문에 어 인간의 경우에도 의식의 존재 여부를 객관적으로 확인하기 할수 없다는 점에서 AI에게 이를 요구하는 것은 부적절하다고 생각이 됩니다. 전체적으로 보면 속성 중심 접근법으로는 AI 법인격 문제를 해결하기 어렵다는 결론을 얻을 수가 있습니다. 이에 비해서 관계 중심 접근법에 따르면 방법이 좀 보일 수도 있습니다. 예를 들어서 사람이라고 하더라도 법인격이 인정되지 않은 경우도 있어 왔고 노예처럼 또 사람이 아닌 경우에도 법인격이 인정되어 온 예가 과거로부터 있어 왔습니다. 어, 중세 유럽에서는 메뚜기 때에 대해서 종교 재판이 벌어지고 파문이 되는 일도 있었죠. 자 그렇다고 한다면 우리 현실에서 AI를 과연 어, 인격 주체로 받아들이는 그런 어떤 사회적 관계가 인정이 될수 있을까? 아직은 그건 아닌 것 같습니다. 그래서 예, 관계 중심 접근법도 법인격 인정에 충분한 어, 눈거를 제공해 주지 못하는 것 같습니다. 그렇다면 마치 법인처럼 어떤 법적 편의성만을 위해서 AI를 어, AI에게 법인격을 인정할 수 있을 것인가? 라는 어, 질문을 해볼 수가 있을 겁니다. 일부 영미법 국가에서는 
자율주행차 사고 시 책임을 위해서 어, 자율주행차를 위한 어떤 법인격을 인정을 해주는 예도 있는 것으로 알고 있습니다만 어, 제 생각에는 예, 조금 무리가 아닌가 싶습니다. 어, 우선 첫 번째로 AI에게 법인격을 부여했을 때 우리가 얻을 수 있는 법적인 편익, 리걸 컨비니언스라는 게 사실 찾기 힘듭니다. 책임 기속을 명확하게 하기 위해서다 라는 그런 논거를 대긴 하지만 AI를 단지 도구로만 본다고 한다면 이 문제는 쉽게 해결이 가능하죠. 그리고 AI에게 법인격을 부여를 했을 때 사실은 비용이라든가 위험 같은 것이 더 크게 다가올 수도 있습니다. 많은 제도적 변화가 필요하고 또 예기치 않은 부작용이 생길 수도 있을 겁니다. 세 번째로 이제 사법 분야에서 AI 기술의 도입이 가져오는 충격에 관해서 말씀드리겠습니다. 크게 이제 사법의 이제 핵심을 이루는 두 개가 있는데 어, 계약법과 불법행위법입니다. 그래서 계약법부터 말씀을 드리자면 계약법은 핵심이 되는 법리가 이겁니다. 계약은 지켜져야 한다. Contracts must be kept. 이게 핵심 원리인데 이것이 정당한 이유는 어, 사실은 어, 자유주의적인 근거를 갖고 있거든요. 음, 칸트식의 의무론, 그 다음에 공리주의적 입장에서 어, 자유롭고 합리적인 대등한 당사자가 서로 거래를 통해서 사회적 효용을 늘릴 수 있다는 라 그런 논거에 기반해 있는 거거든요. 그러면 은 어, 그렇다고 한다면 AI 이용이 약간 어, 이러한 체제의 어떤 도전을 제기할 수도 있습니다. 우선 자율성과 관련해서 어, 만약에 AI를 이용한, 이용해서 어떤 거래를 한 사람의 실제 의사가 그 AI가 체결한 계약에 구속될 의사가 없었을 경우에 과연 효력을 인정할 것이냐? 그것이 과연 사적인 자치에, 사적 자치에 부합할 것인가? 이런 문제가 있을 수가 있습니다. 오늘날 사실 많은 계약들이 AI에서 이루어지고 있고 그 법적인 효과 의사가 AI에 의해서 결정이 되고 있는 상황이기 때문에 상당히 뭐 현실적인 문제이기는 합니다. 아, 그리고 두 번째 문제는 아까 말씀드렸던 어, 레셔널리티 갭의 문제고요. 하지만 이제 지난 몇 년간 어, 법률가들이 토론을 해본 결과는 대체로 이러한 문제들을 어, 현행 법체계의 연장선에서 해결할 수 있다라는 음, 그런 결과를 결론을 내었습니다. 아, AI를 단순한 도구로 볼 것이냐 아니면 어떤 대리인의 지위를 가지고 있는 법적 주체로 볼 거냐 아니면 완전한 법적 주체로 볼 거냐 이런 견해 대립이 있었습니다만 은 어, 도구 이론에 의해서 거의 대부분 해결이 되어 된다고 그렇게 판단이 됩니다. 그 다음에 어, 합리성 격차의 문제도 여러 가지 방식으로 어, 타계책이 나오고 어, 있는데 좀더 자율적인 방식을 말씀을 드리자면 보다 많은 사람들이 AI의 이용을 할수 있도록 정책적으로 도움을 주는 방식을 생각해 볼 수가 있을 겁니다. 그게 이제 아래 나와 있는 Autonomous Approach가 되겠는데요. 디지털 버틀러라든가 AI Democratization이 중요한 방법이 되겠다라는 생각이 들고요. 다음에 불법행위법과 관련해서는 어, 어떤 문제가 있는가? 자율성의 문제가 있습니다. 어, 예를 들어서 자율주행차가 운전자가 이제 뭐 잠을 자고 있는 사이에 사고를 냈다라고 할 경우에 책임을 누가 질 거냐, 뭐 이런 류의 문제가 되겠는데요. 이 문제 역시 예, 법률가들이 검토해 본 결과 해결이 가능하다라는 결론이 나왔습니다. 전반적으로 예, 사법 분야에서는 그래서 큰 문제가 없습니다. 그럼 공법 분야는 어떨까? AI에 대해서 이제 규제 논의가 한창인데요. 그래서 요새는 주된 관심이 사법보다는 공법 쪽에 와 있는 상황입니다. 세 가지 측면에서 얘기, 어, 살펴볼 수가 있는데, 첫 번째로, 어, 규제, 자유에 대한 제한이라고 쉽게 얘기할 수 있을 텐데, 이 규제가 어떻게 정당화될 것인가. 그리고 AI에 대한 규제에는 어떤 
어, 본질적인 차이가 있는 것인가 이런 원리 차원의 문제가 있을 수 있고 두 번째로는 A에 대한 규제가 어떤 구조를 띄어야 되는가 라는 문제가 있을 수 있고요. 세, 번째, 세 번째로는 A에 대한 규제의 내용은 어떻게 형성이 되어야 될 건가 라는 문제가 있을 겁니다. 어, 규제는 결국 자유 제한이기 때문에 자유주의적, 공리주의적, 그리고 공동체주의적 어, 그 밖에도 다른 뭐 입장이 있을 수 있는데 여러 가지 철학적 관점에서 정당화가 필요하죠. 그러면 AI 경우에는 어, 어떤 근본적인 일반적인 규제와 차이가 있을 것인가? 뭐 결론부터 말씀을 드리자면 별 차이가 없는 것 같다. 기존에 해왔던 규제들이 AI가 어떤 해로운 결과, 리스크를 가져온다고 할때 그대로 적용이 되면 좋하다 라는 이제 결론이 되겠고요. 이제 산업계에서 주로 관심을 갖는 것은 주로 이제 규제의 방식이 될것 같습니다. 규제는 이제 강한 규제, 규제의 강도에 따른 분류, strength of regulation에 따라서 분류가 가능하고 또 규제의 경도, hardness에 따라서 분류가 가능할 겁니다. 많이들 오해하는 게 AI가 신산업이고 발전시켜야 될 그런 산업이기 때문에 약한 규제를 해야 된다라는 이제 식의 주장을 펼치는 경우가 많습니다. 그러나 그것은 적절한 주장이 아닙니다. 왜냐하면 AI 기술이 워낙 광범위하게 활용되고 있기 때문에 위험이 과연 큰 위험일지 작은 위험일지 미리 알기가 어렵습니다. 오히려 여기서 중심이 되는 개념은 관념은 규제의 경도라고 하겠습니다. 어, 위험의 정도를 미리 예측하기 어려운 신산업이기 때문에 어떤 경직된 rigid regulation보다는 유연한 regulation이 필요하고 그걸 위해서 어, 구체적으로는 잠정적 규제라든가 절차적 규제 또는 자율 규제 또는 원칙 중심 규제와 같은 것들이 활용이 되어야 된다고 생각이 됩니다. 어, AI 규제 이제 구조는 어때 어떠해야 하는가? 방금 말씀드린 바와 같습니다. AI도 역시 신산업이죠. 그래서 어떤 어, 리스크를 미리 알수 없기 때문에 다른 신산업 규제와 마찬가지로 어, 유연한 규제가 필요하다라는 얘기가 되겠고요. 어, 그 다음에 AI 규제의 내용은 어떻게 결정이 되어야 될 건가? 보통 리스크 중심으로 접근을 하죠. 리스크의 크기에 따라서 규제의 강도가 결정이 되어야 된다라는 어, 그런 방식으로 접근하는데 사실은 리스크의 크기, 단순한 크기, 매그니튜드만 중요한 게 아니라 어, 리스크의 속성, 캐릭터, 네이처 이런 것도 굉장히 중요한 속성을 갖습니다. 어, 어떠한 어, 리스크는 우리가 받아들이기 힘든 형량 자체가, 비교 형량 자체가 불가능한 그런 리스크도 있는 거죠. 실제로 최근에 EU AI법 법안을 보면 어, 그렇게 리스크를 어, 단순히 경중만 따지는 게 아니라 속성을 따지는 것을 음, 찾아볼 수가 있습니다. 시간이 남았나요? 시간이 남았나요? 아, 2분이 남았네요. 예. 예, 요거는 마지막입니다. 예. 아, AI 규제의 실질, 실질적 내용을 우리가 이제 어떻게 형성해 나갈 거냐라고 할때 사실은 규제의 정당성 근거하고 연결시켜서 생각을 해볼 수가 있습니다. 그래서 만약에 기본적 자유, fundamental liberty에 어떤 해를 끼치는 경우다라고 한다면 어떤 이익 형량 과정 필요 없이 어, 규제가 가능할 거라고 생각이 됩니다. 특히 이 맥락에서 중요한 것은 어, 감시라든가 검열, 국가에 대한 감시나 검열 같은 것들 절대 허용할 수가 없을 것 같고요. 또 치명적 자율무기에 관한 규제도 이 범주에 들어간다고 생각이 됩니다. 어, 이거는 이제 의무론적 정당화, 그러니까 자유주의적 입장에서 정당화를 할 때, 규제를 정당화할 때 이런 얘기가 나올 수 있고요. 두 번째로 어, 어떤 평등을 침해를 하는 경우, 평등의 문제는 어, 뭐 자유만큼은 아니지만 그래도 거기에 뭐 버금갈 만큼 중요한 정의 원칙이라고 할수 있겠습니다. 존 롤스의 체제를 따라 왔는데요. 어, 요 경우도 에 역시 어떤 비교 형량에 의해서 이익 형량에 의해서 우리가 규제 여부를 결정하기는 어려울 것 같습니다. 다만 
아, 이 개인적인 입장으로는 최근에 차별이라든가 요 편견이라든가 요거에 관한 논의가 조금 과장되어 있는 것 아니냐. 아, 특히 공정성의 개념, 페어니스의 개념에 관해서 다양한 다의적인 정의가 가능하다는 점을 생각을 해보면 조금 어, 신중하게 논의할 필요가 있다는 생각이 들고요. 마지막 어, 세 번째는 이제 공동체적 가치의 침해를 이유로 규제를 하는 경우입니다. 저는 약간 이제 자유주의적인 입장에 서 있는 사람이기 때문에 이런 이런 이유를 공동체적 가치를 이유로 AI 규제라는 건좀 어, 반대하는 입장입니다. 특히 최근에 대규모 언어 인공지능은 이제 인간과의 상호작용을 내용으로 하기 때문에 공동체적 가치 침해를 이유로 한 규제 논의가 활발해질 걸로 예상이 되는데 어, 신중했으면 좋겠다는 생각입니다. 그 다음에 이것이 이제 마지막 장표인데요. 여기 나와 있는 것들은 경쟁의 침해라든가 아니면 다른 사람의 이익과 권리의 침해라든가 어, 아니면 분배적 목적에서 어, 이제 자유를 제한한다든가 이제 그런 세 가지 경우인데요. 세 가지 모두 사실은 공리주의적 근거에서 인정이 되는 것들입니다. 따라서 이익 형량을 통해서 규제 여부가 결정이 되고 규제의 정도도 결정이 될수 있다고 생각이 됩니다. 아, 하나 더 있네요. 이건 뭘까요? 아, <웃음> 아 요거는, 예. 아, AI 규제 이제 독특한 특성이 하나 있다면, 아까 그 블랙박스 구조, 논리, 저, 그 논리를 이제 AI가, AI가 결, 한 결정에 논리를 우리가 알수 없다는 것 때문에 생기는 어떤 투명성, 책임성을 인정하기 위한 규제들에 관한 내용입니다. 그러한 규제가 중요하다라는 생각은, 어, 뭐, 그 자체는 어, 맞는 얘기입니다. 그런데 문제는 뭐냐면, 어, 이 투명성 규제에 관한 논의가 너무 과열된 나머지, 이거를 강한 규제라든가 경직된 규제로 어, 하려는 경향이 보입니다. 심지어는 개인정보보호법과 같은 약간 관련이 없는 어떤 어, 그런 법체계에 의해서 이 목적을 달성하려고 하는 것도 보입니다. 이거는 어, 약간 문제가 있는 것 같습니다. 이 투명성 규제는 어디까지나 수단적 규제입니다. 어, 규제는 그 AI 사용에 의해서 어, 생겨나는 실체적인 위험의 속성과 정도에 따라서 규제가 결정이 되어야 되기 때문에 에, 그러한 위험의 정도를 파악하기 위한 어떤 투명성 규제는 그 자체로 강한 규제일 수는 없습니다. 예, 그런 점을 좀 유의를 해야 되겠다라는 생각이 들었습니다. 결론을 말씀드리자면 AI의 도래를 맞이해서 어, 법학자들이 참 많은 토론도 해보고 했는데 어, 근대법이 어, 토대부터 흔들리는 것 아닌가 하는 두려움도 갖기도 했습니다만 요즘에 논의를 보면 저도 그렇게 생각하고 어, 근대법은 어, 그렇게 큰 충격을 받은 것은 아니다. 예, 여전히 자유와 평등과 인간의 존엄성이라는 가치가 어, 중요하게 작용을 하고 있다고 라 말씀드릴 수 있겠습니다. 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the all for presentation. Uh, we will proceed the discussion session, but before the discussion, we would like to have like a uh, five minute, five minute break because the professor Deb Leslie is connecting the online, but it seems that he need he need a little bit of time to secure the, his connection. So we will have a five minute break, and we will restart at uh, three thirty five on time. Yes, He, he's already there, <laughs> but we will have five minute, five minute break. Okay.
Thank you very much, Higan Kim. Uh, my name is Jin Gon Son. Uh, I'm working for Korean National Open University as a professor in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, my major is mathematics and computer science. So it is very honored to be here, as well as very thrilled because of uh, so many terms, uh, jargons used to in ethics, philosophy, and legal and regulation. But I, I'm still happy to be here. Uh, I do, I will do my best in my humble English. Uh, today, I talk about the, uh, slightly about the, the full presentation and the conclusion with my thought. The, the first presentation, Safe Data Environment, uh, Tom, a professor of University of Warwick, de delivered a presentation on safe data environment. He emphasized the importance of ensuring that artificial intelligence system operate in a secure and safe environment that protect sensitive data such as uh, medical, personal medical data in UK and maintain uh, privacy. Uh, with the increasing use of AI and machine learning in various sectors such as healthcare, it is crucial to establish standards and guidelines for AI development and deployment to ensure uh, preventing the uh, protection of uh, privacy as well as ethical consideration uh, all together in to get integrated into the design and operation of AI system. Uh, he highlights the gold care uh, reports. I, I have uh, never heard about his name, but uh, uh, so that uh, researchers as well as the uh, commercial sectors person can use the data uh, of medical data, de-identified, annotated, full slide image of uh, tissues, uh, maybe have uh, cancers or not, something like that. And uh, he talking about the path lake too, uh, overall, uh, his presentation uh, gave us some uh, best practices of UK, uh, the personal medical data, to consider uh, privacy protection. The second presentation, uh, talking about the responsible AI, uh, last night I uh, the read all his the, the slides and make uh, some notes and uh, summarize here. Uh, Mr. Yudong Li, the specialist solution architect at Amazon Web Service, focused on the issue of bias in AI and machine learning. He argued that remove the bias in AI and machine learning is, is essential to ensure fair, transparent, and unbiased system. He explained the concept of responsible AI and outlined its six key components, such as fairness and bias evaluation, explainable AI, and reprodu reproducibility auditability, accountability, continuous monitoring, secure, security and privacy, and human intervention. 
In my personal opinion, uh, I believe these are uh, not just components of uh, responsible AI, but rather characteristics that responsible AI should have. Uh, he provides detailed ideas. I, I like it, it, his presentation slide because a, a lot of information. And uh, uh, he's come from the ICT field. That's why, I guess, for removing bias in AI and machine learning for each of these six components. And uh, thank you very much, especially for giving us home homework today. And the third one is a characteristic of, uh, actually, I forget that the second uh, presentation uh, presented by David. Uh, okay, this uh, last presentation is about the characteristic of AI technology and its impact on modern legal system. Professor Lee from Gangwood University presents on the characteristic of AI technology and its impact on modern legal system. He discusses four main topics. The first one is characteristic of AI technology and AI and legal personhood, AI and legal responsibility, and last one is AI and its regulation. In particular, while discussing AI and its regulation, a lot of jargon to me, uh, he proposed uh, several important questions uh, from a legal perspective, such as uh, how are regulations justified? Are there fundamental differences in AI regulation? What should be the structure of AI regulation? How are the contents of artificial intelligence regulation determined? The last one is what are the characteristic of regulation that accompany decision making automation? This question highlights the legal consideration that must be taken into account for regulating AI and he provides insightful opinion on each of them. Uh, 지금부터는 한국말로 하겠습니다. 아, 왜냐하면 그 데이비드가 얘기한 거는 매우 철학적인 얘기들이 많아서 그의 용어를 제가 똑같이 얘기할 수 있을까 걱정이 돼서입니다. 어, 데이비드는 그 액셜 테크놀로지라고 해서 아까 그 인터프리터가 번역하기로는 축성 기술이라고 얘기를 하던데요. 그만큼 앞으로 우리 인류 미래의 진행 방향 말하자면 축을 결정할 수 있는 그런 기술이라고 얘기하시는 것 같았습니다. 어, 어쩌면 질주하는 인공지능 기술을 그대로 둘 것이냐 아니면 심지어 제가 듣기로는 생명권이라고 번역을 한 리빙 라이츠를 우리가 우리 스스로에게 유지시키고 또 어떤 사람 우리가 아닌 다른 사람뿐만 아니라 인공지능에게까지도 어떻게 보면 생명권을 위탁할 수 있는지 우리가 생존할 수 있는 종인가 스피시스인가 이런 매우 철학적인 이야기들을 하셨습니다. 예, 그리고 뭐 그가 얘기한 것처럼 음, 인공지능이 이렇게 발달하게 된 배경도 어, 뭐 예를 들어서 빅데이터처럼 데이터 양이 커졌고 그 다음에 컴퓨팅 파워가 어, 처리할 수 있는 만큼 어, 그런 상황이라고 말하시면서 이딴 것보다도 휴메니티를 유지하면서 할수 있을까 인공 그, 제가 듣기로는 인, 이해하기로는 어, 데이비드가 뭔가를 결정해서 어, 우리한테 보여준다기보다는 어, 어떤 하나의 큰 질문을 준게 아닌가 
그런 생각을 해봤습니다. 어, 저는 이 자리에 초청 받아 오면서 걱정한 게 바로 이런 어, 법적인 리갈 터미널러지라든가 이런 걸 내가 제대로 이해할 수 있을까 이런 생각을 하면서도 어, 인터디스플러너리한 이런 미팅에 어, 오게 된 것은 어, 제가 그 컴퓨팅, 어, 컴퓨터 사이언스 그 다음에 이러닝을 하면서 어, 지금은 어, 국제 표준 개발에 에, 한국 대표로 나가고 있습니다. 근데 그 표준이라는 것도 여지껏 생각해 보면 어쩌면 레귤레이션과 매우 유사한 것 같다라는 생각이 들어서 여기에 오게 됐습니다. 어, 표준이라는 것을 포괄적으로 정의하면 어디 적용할 수가 없고 매우 스페시픽하게 적용을 아, 그 주약을 표준을 만들면 예를 들어서 220V에만 쓸수 있게 이렇게 해놓으면 다른 거는 쓸수 없는 매우 스페시픽하게 됩니다. 그러니까 표준을 매, 매우 그러니까 내로하게 정의하면 명확히 쓸 곳이 정해지지만 일반적으로 많이 사용될 수가 없, 없습니다. 근데 법적인 것도 어떻게 보면 러프하, 뭐 포괄적으로 정의해 놓으면 아 이거는 누구나 지켜야지 어, 뭐, 뭐 교통 법규 자, 잘 지켜야지 뭐 이, 이런 정도인 건데 예를 들어서 어디서 스, 스피드 리밋을 어, 5마일 이상 초과하면 예를 들어서 뭐 어, 어, 100 플랑을 내야 된다. 그런다면 매우 스페시픽해서 사람들이 잘 지키겠죠. 네, 그러한 느낌에서 우리가 이 어, 오늘 또 발표한 내용들을 또이 세션의 제목을 보면 에티컬한 것과 관계해서 인공지능 기술을 어떻게 레귤레이션 할 건지 사실은 음, 그런 면에서 드리고 싶은 말씀들이 있었습니다. 어, 제가 며칠 전에 GPT 가지고 우리 컴퓨터 과학과 교수님들은 지금 큰 걱정입니다. 뭐 다른 과도 어떨런지 모르지만 우리끼리 얘기가 예를 들어서 뭐 C++, Python 뭐 이런 얘기 하면 알아들으실 분들이 많겠죠. 어 저도 저희 쪽 자학원을 쓰면 그렇습니다. 그런 프로그램 랭귀지 같은 것을 코딩을 하는데 예전에는 야 이거 문제가 이거니까 해결하는 아이디어 알고리즘을 만든 다음에 그걸 C++ 프로그램 랭귀지 또는 파이썬 프로그램 랭귀지로 어 네가 코딩해서 제출해 그거 내가 그걸 이벨리에이션을 해서 평가해서 너희들 점수 줄게 근데 아시다시피 챗 GPT는 제일 잘하는 게 파이썬 코딩입니다 그러니까 우리 교수들끼리는 야 이제 우리 뭘 가르쳐야 되느냐 이거 갖고 얘기를 하고 있습니다. 그래서 GPT 때문에 도무지 안 되겠다. 그러니까 학생들한테 GPT를 사용하지 말도록 하자 이런 얘기를 카페에서 얘기하고 있었는데 옆에 부산 사람이에요. 근데 부산 남자 둘이 사투리를 써가면서 얘기를 합니다. 아마 한 남자가 여자한테 채였나 봐요. 이런 걸 영어로 얘기하기가 참 어렵죠. 네, 채였는데 뭐라 그러냐면 야 걔가 널채찰 필요 없을 거야. 아, 찰 이유가 전혀 없어. 영어로 얘기하면 it's impossible이죠. 근데 대구, 아, 대군지 부산 사투리인지 에이 아이다 이러더라고요. 여기서 좀 웃으셔야 되는데 왜냐하면 저는 지금 Artificial Intelligence 얘기를 했거든요. AI다라고 하더라고요. 그래서 아 맞아 우리는 에, 이걸 인터프리터가 잘 해석하실런지 모르지만 어, 제 생각에는 에, 마지막으로 이어령 교수의 에, 말씀을 드리는 걸로 끝낼까 합니다. 이어령 교수가 몇년 전에 돌아가셨는데 한국의 대단한 에, 천재 교수라고 평가되는 분이 어, 말하고 경주를 하면 인간은 반드시 진다. 
근데 왜 말을 하고 경주하려고 하니? 쟤는 너보다 분명히 빠르다는 걸알 텐데. 말한테 이기려고 하지 말고 말을 올라타거라 라는 말을 했다는 거죠. 근데 우리가 그러기 위해서는 야생말 같은 아까 데이비드는 질주하는 AI라고 얘기했는데 그 질주하는 야생마 같은 인공지능 기술을 우리는 걱정만 하지 말고 올라타서 인류의 좋은 방향으로 액슈얼하게 우리의 정말 축성 기술로서 어, 사용해야 될 것이다. 단 이때 야생마를 길들여야 되니까 오늘 같은 이런 전문가들이 모여서 레귤레이션에 대해서 진지하게 그리고 에틱스에 대해서도 진지하게 생각해야 된다고 생각합니다. 이상으로 마치겠습니다. Thank you for the discussion. Um, next discussion by the Dr. Ki Pyeong Lee, and we will hear the old discussion. Then I will hand over the mic to have a, a quick response to by the presenters. Then open to the uh, discussion to the floor. Hello, everyone. My name is Ki Pyeong Lee. Uh, I work for KLRI. Uh, because my English is not, uh, not good, so I using Korean uh, uh, speak about this topic. Uh, 오늘 먼저 초대해 주셔서 너무 감사드리고요. 어, 뭐 저는 사실 AI 전문가도 아니고 또 이쪽 분야에 대해서 많이 그 법제도 연구를 한 사람은 아닙니다. 그래서 오늘 사실 어, 오전 세션부터 그 오후 지금까지 많은 그 훌륭한 그 발제자 분들의 발제를 들으면서 일단 공부를 많이 했고요. 어, 근데 이제 너무 많은 내용들을 또 발제를 하시고 또 너무 그 다양한 분야, 뭐 기술에서부터 아주 다양한 분야, 분야들을 많이 하셔가지고, 어, 제가 많은 것들을 좀그 소화를 하지 못했어요. 그래서 제가 좀 이해한 부분 중심으로 말씀을 드리고요. 어, 일단은 뭐네 분이 그 발제를 하셨는데 상당히 좀 내용도 복잡하고 또 분야도 상당히 좀 다른 부, 부분이라서 제가 뭐다 이렇게 말씀을 드리지 못하고 한두 가지씩만 짧게 질문하는 형식으로 하겠습니다. 어, 첫 번째 그 발제해 주신 교수님 영국에서 이제 멀리서 오셨는데 어, 좋은 내용으로 발제해 주셔서 고맙습니다. 어, 제가 이제 사전에 발제문을 받아서 이렇게 좀 읽, 읽으면서 공부를 좀 했고요. 어, 이제 아까, 아까 여기 이제 좀그 발제문에 없던 내용들을 발표하신 부분이 있어서 일단 그거 먼저 질문 하나 드리면요. 어, 지금 현재 한국에서도 그 의료 데이터를 활용한 연구를 허용하는 방식으로 어, 저희 한국 정부에서 지금 추진을 하고 있습니다. 어, 대충 이렇게 내용을 보니까 그 데이터, 데이터 중점 연구 병원이라는 그몇 개의 병원을 정부가 지정을 하고 그 병원하고 연구자들 그리고 제가 알기로는 그 커머셜 쪽에 있는 그러니까 기업이나 이쪽에서도 어이 의료 데이터를 이용한 연구를 할수 있게끔 그러니까 같이 이렇게 공동으로 연구에 참여할 수 있는 이런 어 방식으로 지금 그 한국 정부에서 프로젝트를 추진을 하고 있습니다. 어 지금 이 AI와 관련해서 AI 규제와 관련해서 어, 핵심적인 쟁점은 역시 어, 이 좋은, 제, 좋은 데이터를 가지고 좋은 결과를 어, 만들어내는 것 이것을 어떻게 강제할 것인가 어떻게 뭐 규제할 것인가 이게 핵심이고요. 그러다 보니까 결국은 어떤 데이터의 품질 문제라든지 데이터 보안 문제, 프라이버시 침해 문제 뭐 이런 부분들이 어, 논의의 핵심입니다. 항상 그러니까 어떤 법적인 규제나 이쪽에서 보면요. 어 근데 이제 아까 저희들이 이제 기본적으로 개인, 개인 의료 데이터를 사용할 수 있다, 연구를 한다라고 하는 이 전제, 그걸 허용하기 위한 전제로서 어뭐 저희 법도 그렇지만 모든 법에서 어, 익명화된 데이터를 사용하도록 강제하고 있습니다. 그래서 저, 제가 이제 기술을 모르기 때문에. 데이터를 익명화시키고 식별이 불가능하게 만든 데이터만 연구의 대상, 활용의 대상이 될수 있다라고 저희들은 법으로 이렇게 하고 있는데 여기서 말한 익명화된 데이터 혹은 비식별 데이터라는 것은 저희 법, 법적인 입장에서 봤을 때는 
어, 이 익명화된 비식별화된 이 연구가 가능한 이 데이터를 사용 중에 혹은 사용 후에 식별이 가능한 데이터로 변경할 수 있다라면 이거는 법적인 의미에서 익명화된 데이터라고 볼 수가 없습니다. 물론 잠정적인 익명화된 데이터라고 어 말할 수는 있겠죠. 그러나 제, 저희들이 만약에 법에서 허용하는 이 익명화된 데이터 혹은 비식별화된 데이터라고 하는 것은 어 어떠한 방식으로도 그 데이터에 대한 그 익명성을 다시 복원해낼 수 없다라는 것을 전제한 것이지 그게 가능하다면 저는 법에서 그것을 허용하지 않을 거라고 생각합니다. 그런데 이제 기술의 한계가 있기 때문에 어 어떤 어 예측하지 못하는 그런 방식으로 어 익명화된 정보가 다시 원래 그 정보를 확인할 수 있는 정보가 될 수도 있겠죠. 가능성이 전혀 없는 건 아니지만 어쨌든 그것은 불가능하다라는 그 전제로 어 익명화된 혹은 그 식별할 수 없는 비식별화된 그 정, 데이터를 연구에 활용하고 기업의 어떤 어, AI 그 개발자들이 활용하는 것을 허용한다고 생각합니다. 근데 약간 이제 질문은 아까 교수님이 그 아까 영국의 그, 그 사례에서 NHS 데이터를 가지고 연구를 하는데 그 익명화된 데이터를 가지고 쓰는데 기업들이 참여하면 그것을 다시 그 정보에 대한 어떤 그그 식별을 할수 있는 것으로 지금 아까도 말씀하시더라고요. 그런 위험이 있기 때문에 어 기업들의 참여는 막아야 된다라고 이제 아까 말씀하신 것 같아요. 그래서 그 부분이 조금 더 추가적으로 어 보충 설명을 해주시면 좋겠습니다. 어 그다음 이제 첫 번째 발제에 대해서는 그 하나 질문을 드리고요. 그다음 이제 두 번째 그 저기 교수님 데이비드 교수님 발표하신 거는 약간 현장에서 바로 이제 말씀하셨는데. 어, 뭐, 너무 이제 추상적이고 어려운 그 내용으로 하셔가지고 사실은 뭐 저희 법하는 입장에서는 뭐라고 좀 말씀드리기가 어, 어려운 것 같습니다. 어쨌든 그두 번째 교수, 그 교수님 발표 내용은 어쨌든 AI, AI라는 것은 장단점이 있는 것 같다. 장점도 굉장히 많이 나열해 주셨고 또 반대로 우려되는 부분들, 단점일 수 있는 부분들도 많이 말씀을 해 주셨습니다. 근데 이제 제가 이제 이 AI 윤리와 관련해서 뭐늘 들었던 생각은 뭐냐면 왜왜 왜 지금까지 저희들은 인류는 굉장히 많은 첨단 기술들을 개발을 했고 많이 사용해 오고 있습니다. 그런데 이렇게 어, 어떤 저도 A, 저는 AI 하나의 제품이라고 생각하는데 어떤 이 첨단 기술 제품에 대해서 이렇게 윤리 논쟁을 이렇게 많이 일으키는 경우는 거의 없었던 것 같아요. 그래서 심지어 이제 법을 하시는 분들도 이 AI 윤리, 도대체 윤리와 법은 도대체 무슨 관계냐? 도대체 이 윤리는 뭐냐? 우리가 보, 법을 만들 때 그럼 이 윤리를 어떻게 법제화 해야 하느냐? 이런 논의들을 막 하고 있습니다. 근데 여전히 이 윤리는 뭐지? 법은 뭐지? 그럼 AI에서 또 윤리는 뭐지? AI에서 왜 윤리를 또 강조하지? 왜 이걸 규제를 하려고 하지? 이런 어, 아주 그 혼란한 얘기가 지금 되고 있고요. 그래서 어, 이제 제가 조금 근본적인 뭐 질문일 수도 있는데 어쨌든 AI와 관련해서는 왜 이렇게 윤리 문제를 마, 이렇게 많이 제기하고 논의하고 그 그것을 가지고 이제 규제를 하려고 하는지에 대해서 혹시 어, 견해가 있으시면 말씀을 해주시면 좋겠습니다. 그다음에 그 다음에 그세 번째 발표해주신 그 아마존 예, 박사님 발표 관련해서는 아까 그 편견 문제 부분만 제가 좀 언급을 하고 싶어요. 그래서 어 제가 개인적으로 그 아마존이나 이제 이 AI를 개발하는 기업 쪽에 계시는 분들을 좀 만나 보면요. 굉장히 걱정을 많이 하고 있습니다. 정부가 정부가 AI 개발에 대해서 어 과도한 규제를 하지 않을까 많은 걱정을 하고 있고요. 근데 이제 AI가 규제 정부나 이제 이법 법에 법 법에 종사하시는 분들 중 주로 그쪽에서 어 AI를 규제해야 된다라고 하는 그 가장 그 핵심적인 근거라고 할까요? 근데 그게 아까 이제 말씀하셨듯이 어떤 윤리의 문제. 근데 이제 윤리도 사실 이렇게 들어가 보면은 이제 또 내용이 뭐냐면 어 이제 이런 편향성의 문제, 공정성의 문제 이런 얘기거든요. 근데 이제 그 중에서도 가장 핵심적으로 그 키워드가 뭐냐? 바이어스트, 즉 편향된 이거더라고요. 그래서 어 바이어스 바이어스트 데이터가 AI 안에 들어 있으면 안 돼. 그리고 바이어스트 아웃풋이 AI를 통해서 나오면 안 돼. 일단 이게 
어, 지금 이 윤리 관련해서 AI 윤리 관련해서 법적으로 규제하려는 아주 아주 중요한 근거라고 할까요? 뭐 대상이 될 수도 있는 거죠. 이제 그렇게 돼 있습니다. 근데 개인적으로 제가 어, 이게 좀 어려운 게 과연 법이라는 게그 명확하지 않은 이 용어 상황을 법이 과연 규제할 수 있을까? 예. 편향성이라는 것 자체가 사실 객관적인 객관적으로 규정할 수 없는 거잖아요. 보는 사람마다 저게 편향됐다. 또 어떤 사람은 전혀 편향되지 않았다라고 판단할 수 있기 때문에 굉장히 이 편향성을 판단하는 것 자체가 어렵습니다. 근데 그래서 이제 법을 어떻게 만들더라도 결국은 해석의 문제가 들어갈 수밖에 없는 거죠. 그래서 어 제가 그래서 이제 AI 이후의 AI 액터라든지 기존에 나와 있는 여러 그 AI 규제에 관련된 법안들을 살펴보면 어이 편향된 데이터, 편향된 결과물에 대한 규제 얘기를 하긴 하는데 이 편향된 결과가 뭐냐라는 법적 정의를 찾기가 매우 힘들었습니다. 그런데 어 캐나다에서 그 알고리즘 그 AI, AI 데이터 액터라는 그 법안을 만들었습니다. 그 법에 보니까 유일하게 어 편향된 아웃풋에 대한 바이어스 아웃풋에 대한 법적 정의를 했더라고요. 근데 그 법적 정의를 또 보면 되게 궁금했어요. 이 어려운 용어를 어떻게 어 리걸 데피니션을 했을까라고 봤더니 어 사실은 기존에 있는 캐나다의 인권법에 금지하고 있는 차별 금지 사유 요거더라고요. 그러니까 기존에 있는 법에서 이미 금지하고 있는 내용의 그 차별 금지 내용 요 내용이 결과물로 출력이 되면 이것은 편향된 아웃풋이다. 요렇게 지금 그 법적 정의를 했더라고요. 근데 무슨 얘기냐면은 결국은 새롭게 정의하기가 매우 어렵다는 거고요. 그래서 어 현재까지 그 편향된 어떤 뭐 어떤 결과물이다라고 얘기할 수 있는 거는 이미 기존에 법으로 합의된 내용들을 다시 한번 이 법에서 그냥 갖다가 쓰는 인용하는 방식이란 거예요. 새로운 입법이 아니라는 거예요. 제 말, 제가 말씀드린 거는. 그래서 어, 그이 윤리와 관련해서 뭔가 법을 만든다는 것은 매우 어려울 것이다 라고 저는 이제 보고 있고요. 그래서 이제 지금까지 나온 그 법들 중에서 가장 높은 수준으로 엄격하게 규제하려고 하는 법은 EU AI Act입니다. 그게 가장 그 구체적이고 아주 뭐 금지하는 것까지 지금 금지되는 AI 뭐 시스템인가요? 거기까지 지금 그, 그 제, 제안을 해 놓은 상태고 나머지는 나머지 법들은 거의 절차적인 것들을 규정하고 있어요. 그래서 어 이제 법으로 이거를 규제하는 것은 매우 어려울 것이다라고 이제 보면서 보고 있고요. 그래서 마지막으로 이제 우리 그, 그 금국대 교수님께서 발제하신 부분인데 이제 결국 이제 법적인 측면에서 이제 AI 규제에 대해서 쭉 설명을 잘 해셨, 해주셨고 저는 사실 대부분의 내용에 대해서 이제 동의를 했어요. 그래서 그 교수님도 결국은 법으로 할수 있는 게 어, 많지 않다. 또 하나는 뭐냐면 사실 지금 현재 AI와 관련된 관련해서 나타나는 뭐 윤리적인 건 법적인 건그 모든 이슈들을 제 개인적으로는 한국이 가지고 있는 기존의 법률로 거의 다 해결할 수 있다라고 봅니다. 즉 새로운 법률의 재정 필요성은 저는 거의 없다라고 봐요. 그래서 어, 마지막 그 교수님한테 제가 질문 드리고 싶은 거는 현재 우리 뭐 지능정보화법, 뭐 개인정보보호법 여러 법률이 있는데 이 법률로서 혹시 현재 AI 현재 가지고 있는 뭐 AI AI가 가지고 있는 문제라든지 아니면 가까운 미래에 생길 수 있는 AI로 인해서 발생할 수 있는 문제를 해결하는데 어, 기존에 있는 법으로 어, 해결하기 어렵다. 그래서 지금 당장은 아니지만 뭐 10년 혹은 20년 후에 우리가 이런 것들은 법으로 만들어서 해야 될 것이다 라고 혹시 그런 게 있으면 하나 소개해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 예, 뭐 이상으로 제 발표 마치겠습니다. Okay, thank you for the, your discussion and final discussion by the uh, Dr. s o n g i k j o and please go ahead. Uh, <coughs> Good afternoon. My name is Song Ying. Uh, I'm from the Korea Research Institute for Vocational Education and Training. <coughs> It's great to be here at this conference discussing such an important and urgent topic of our time, AI and ethics. Our session today titled uh, Ethical Engagement with AI-Driven Technology brings together a variety of presentations that address different 
ethical issues related to AI. I find it interesting to see how presenters from diverse backgrounds, philosophy, computer science, and law understand and address the issues of AI ethics in their own way. <clears throat> but despite the different focus areas of the presentation, all presenters share the similar concerns regarding the potential threat that development and commercial expansion of AI may be posed to ethical principles such as privacy, responsibility, and control of autonomy. The presenter seems to agree that adequate human control and pragmatic regulation over the development and use of AI are essential and that humans should be held responsible for their actions involving AI. <clears throat> I agree that these are the important considerations as it's crucial to ensure that AI is developed and used in a way that is aligned with the ethical principles. I'm a sociologist and recently working our research on the impact of AI on the labor market and the development of human capability. Uh, <clears throat> so what I'm going to discuss today is about some broader issues underlying our approach to AI ethics and regulations, which I believe may not have been directly addressed in today's presentations on ethical engagement with AI. So rather than focusing on specific ethical principles at stake, such as privacy, autonomy, transparency, responsibility, or discussing detailed regulations for AI, I want to discuss uh, so-called the social condition for ethical engagement with AI. So especially I will be raising some questions about how AI affects the creations, delivery, and consumptions of knowledge. So first, AI-driven knowledge provision through the algorithms by connecting and combining uh, uh, fragmented elements of existing knowledge sets a new social norm of knowledge creation and use. Before AI, ordinary people tried to make efforts and even be challenged to learn to create, use, and understand. That is internalized knowledge. Usually such a learning process of creating and using knowledge requires lots of effort, patience, perseverance, contingency and tolerance. Learning is a key process of authentic knowledge creation on the grounds of such social norms and values. But the algorithm-mediated learning process demands the value of efficiency and convenience at the expense of such a sometimes laborious and arduous learning process. The authenticity of the knowledge we create on the basis of such values such as perseverance, patience, self-compromise, or, or tolerance is replaced by the knowledge of provisions and consumption with the value of convenience and efficiency measured in principle, I think, by the reduction of time to process. <clears throat> in other words, algorithms are setting up new norm for the way knowledge is created, produced, and consumed with different values that are more favorable and compatible with the competition among individuals rather than compromise and cooperation among people. So following on from the previous questions, the driving force behind the development of such AI-mediated knowledge provisions and consumptions is increased competition. By far, many people have been con concerned about the impact of AI on human jobs and labor market, seeing it as man versus machine, machine or uh, collaboration between man and machine. In terms of knowledge creation, I think, however, I think it's neither man versus machine nor the collaboration between man and machine, but rather more likely isolated competition between man-robot versus man-robot with less and less compromise and cooperation among people. In this sense, we are witnessing the paradox of AI. That is, we are experiencing more isolated competition even, a, uh, even as AI promises to deliver more convenience. So regarding this paradox of AI knowledge provision, is it we uh, who want such convenient, more competitive AI or the AI technology itself? Otherwise, what else? One thing for sure, assuming that super intelligence is really a distant future, is not AI itself. Indeed, it is a few giant AI corporations and capital behind the image of autonomous AI that are driving this AI paradox. It's very strange to me that current state of AI does not have full autonomy to be responsible for anything. 
But most of our social attention is concentrated in the autonomy and responsibility of AI and how we control it, assuming that AI has or can have autonomy soon. However, it is a giant corporation that are driving the AI paradox, I think. So behind the speed of unchecked AI innovation competition to increase the efficiency and profitability is the capitalist drive to monopolize knowledge along with the normalizing new social norms. So who controls this competition for AI innovation? It seems that the current competition for AI invention is driven by the desire to monopolize not only knowledge, but also the ways of producing and consuming knowledge. And we haven't seen such monopolistic moves of this kind before. It failed once, and it is back again. Since the mid-90s, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, had heavily invested in creating the web-based encyclopedia called Encarta whose quality was guaranteed by a small group of editors and elite world-class contributors. The aim, was to, the aim was to monopolize the human knowledge through the purchase of production services, but it failed because of a more democratic way of producing and using knowledge, namely Wikipedia. But now Bill Gates has returned with an even more popular weapon to monopolize the knowledge, as you know, the ChatGPT. <clears throat> He is not trying to monopolize the product of knowledge. Instead, he is trying to monopolize the ways of connecting and combining and producing knowledge and the ways of consuming it with the benefits of convenience and speed. The previous attempt may have been an economic strategy to monopolize the product or service, but current one is a social and cultural uh, uh, strategy to monopolize and normalize the ways of thinking and learning. If such a few giant AI uh, uh, companies were to succeed in monopolizing and normalizing knowledge productions and consumption, they would have unprecedented economic, social, and cultural power. If so, what ethical matters would be left for us to discuss? So Karl Polanyi criticized the satanic meals of capitalist commodification over land, human labor, and money which cannot be commodified and he conceptualized the social reactions against such market invasion into human society as a double movement. At the moment, I'm thinking of knowledge and information as another element that cannot be commodified and monopolized, especially. What Polanyi implies in his idea of double movement, capitalist disruptions need to be socially embedded in ethical, social, and institutional arrangement against the rapid expansion of capitalist marketization. From this perspective, I think an important social condition for engaging with AI ethically is not only a question of how to regulate and control the competitive AI technological innovation, but also questions of how to slow it down and secure the humane way of a time limit, because it seems that the time limit is set up by the corporations. <clears throat> so to me, what underlies both over-regulation or the under-regulation is a time limit set up by the competitive race among AI giants to monopolize the social, economic, and cultural power. Therefore, what needs to be done for ethical AI is to first and foremost to slow down the ever accelerating trade mill of a giant AI corporation racing to monopolize the provisions of AI uh, uh, knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. And now I'll, I will hand over my mic to these presenters to have opportunity to respond to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to, to all the discussants uh, for coming up with questions. It's, uh, I know it's thankless, but um, thank you for doing it anyway. Um, uh, I just wanted to clarify in answer to, um, to two of the speakers, I wanted to clarify the um, the position that I was arguing for. So, one position that I was arguing for <laughs> is that in the case of these trusted research environments, um, it is a good idea and ethically permissible to export data from them. So, I disagree with folks who say and design uh, trusted research environments as if you could never take any data out of them. 
And the reason I said that was because um, the, the precautions that are taken against de-identification are already extreme. Because in order to use a trusted research environment, not only do you have to apply and say that you're worthy to work on the data, not only do you have to make clear who you are, but every single thing that you do on the trusted research environment is intensely monitored. And then in addition to that, they say, you mustn't do anything with that data. You mustn't use any code with respect to the data that we haven't approved in advance. That is overkill, you know. These are people who have to prove their credentials as responsible researchers. So what I was saying as a modest proposal was, um, if the cost of having all those restrictions is that you cannot have uh, some commercial development of um, algorithms for medical treatment, for God's sake, there's, they're too restrictive and you should permit modest exports of data under certain conditions, for example, that data be destroyed after a certain length of time. That is anyway quite a typical policy that's used for big data banks everywhere. Uh, it's just a question of sort of trying to relax the sort of fetishization of privacy that, um, that we, we have uh, these days. Uh, people overdo it. Um, even when it's not necessary uh, to do it. It's already plenty restrictive enough. That's what I was saying. So, um, one of the morals is, <laughs> contrary to many people who work in this area, I think you have to do ethics in a way that enables the most benefit to be created. You don't only do ethics by uh, worshiping human rationality, uh, human agency, human autonomy. That's just, you know, it's, it's a kind of, it's a kind of over-worship <laughs> of, it's, it's, it's respecting us more than we need to be respected, if you see, see what I mean. It's this sort of sublimation of human agency and human autonomy, way over the top. That's what I was trying to say, and, and that's, an unusual position. That's why I want to identify it. I wasn't just saying, what do you do with these platforms? You know, here's a little one, here's a big one. How do we combine them? There's a bit more ethics to it than that. So I pass on to the next guy. Yeah. yeah. Professor Leslie, do you have something to respond to the discussions? I, I do. Uh, can, can you hear me well? Is yes, it, we can hear. Yes? Okay, great. Yes, uh, just uh, first let me just register appreciation for the excellence of the, the comments from uh, Jin Kip Young and Sung Ik. Um, I have three, three quick things to say, hopefully quick. Um, first, uh, to, to Jin, who, who used this uh, really great image of at the end of, of, of taming the horse and how we need to think of, uh, in a sense, the question of who's, who's steering the technology by, by in, a, in a sense, seeing seeing it as 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 a uh, as an element that we are uh, that that we are steering, um, it's it's really interesting. When I've given uh, similar talks in the past, um, I get comments back like, "Oh, the horse has left the barn," right? In the sense that the technology has gotten away from us, and I always respond by saying, "Well, we have to." You know, be careful uh, about uh, not being too technologically deterministic, right? So giving the technology its own agency and uh, and kind of ceding our own ability to control uh, and, and to dictate the the future of of our use of the technology. And what what came to mind when when Jin mentioned this image of taming the horse actually is I'm not sure if there's any Sigmund Freud uh, fans or or scholars out there. But in civilization, it's discontents. Um, Freud uses uh, this uh, really interesting image of the id or the, the unconscious, right? The, the will, what he called the cathected kind of drives of, 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 our, of our kind of humanity. He, he uh, likens this to the horse. And he says the ego, right? Or the, the agency to 
kind of steer the world around us, he, he likens this to the rider. And I, I just point that out because I think it's, it's a really nice, um, it, 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 it's a, it, it has a nice resonance with this image of taming the horse. But I point it out because, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I mean, heard a little. I heard a little feedback. But I'm just pointing this out because what Freud is doing is actually saying that the horse itself is us. And I just want to point out that we shouldn't think of the technology as the horse. We are always, um, whether it's the choices that we make responsibly or the or the reckless choices that we make that might cause harm, we are always in the driver's seat. The horse itself will never be the technology because we are the ones that are exercising um, the agency behind the technology. And I think that, that also speaks uh, really uh, nicely to Sung Ik's uh, point about um, competition and uh, the way that, in a sense, the, the ecosystem now is, is being driven by um, certain, uh, we might call it uh, ethos of market fundamentalism or capitalist ethos. Um, as well as uh, mechanisms that are moving us towards the centralization of power in big tech corporations. For me, this is the id. For me, this is what we need to tame. This is what we need to address because if we uh, see the runaway technology as runaway and not controllable, then it will get away from us. And the excesses of market fundamentalism, of, of, of autocratic tendencies to centralize power, um, in, in capitalist economies and mer meritocratic myths will take over and, and we will um, not be able to steer the technologies responsibly. Um, second comment is just also to Jin. Um, yes, I left the, the, the question as an open question. The future, our technological future is an open question that, that needs to be tackled by society. Um, that's just to say that none, no, no one of us is in a position to dictate the future of technology. The, the society itself, our future, our futures must be determined by democratic choices, right? We need to um, engage in uh, conversations about where we want to go with the technology um, in order to have, have a kind of a collective decision-making in terms of where we're steering the technology. And that also, uh, by the way, links in with Sung Ik's uh, uh, evocation of a Polanyi's double movement, because that is the second part of the double movement, right? It's this idea that it's the people, it's, it's, it's those who are impacted by, by larger techno and economic um, structures that need to, to have the, the, the force, the pushback to, to um, determine the future. And one last quick uh, comment, it's to uh, Kip Young about the relationship of ethics and law. Yes, um, one way to look at the law, and this is, I, I think, how um, we need to look at it in terms of AI and regulation, is that law is always dependent upon uh, the, a normative infrastructure to provide a kind of justific justificatory um, basis or architecture by which the law becomes legitimate. That, that's a, an argument that's made for instance, by Jürgen Habermas. And one, one interesting bit about artificial intelligence that has pressed this um, issue of ethics in the law, I think, to a, 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 a new level, and I think this was pointed out, that this is a kind of exceptional um, level, is that artificial intelligence uniquely serves a surrogate cognitive function in the world. And that means that it's standing in for our decision-making in ways that other technologies don't. What that creates are accountability gaps, right? So whereas you can hold me accountable for the reasonableness of my choices in the world, you can't necessarily hold a, a software system accountable in the same um, normative and legal sense, right? And so what we need to do then is to reconsider the kind of normative issues surrounding that surrogate cognitive function and that is really what I think is driving this um, renewed attention to the ethical foundations or the normative foundations of the way we treat AI in terms of its regulation, in terms of the standards, and in terms of, of the statutory interventions that we need to make. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. And then... 
Yeah, um, first of all, um, thank you very much for um, you know, all the uh, comments on my presentation. Again, that has been giving me like a lot of insights and the even like you know, inspiration as well. So I'm very much grateful. A um, couple of things that I wanted to mention. Um, the, the topic that I presented today was responsible AI, which wasn't um, existed before. So from my memory, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, AI started like 1970s, 60s, around that you know, period. Um, but even back then, we didn't have like the concept of um, you know, MROPs or responsible AI at all. So these are relatively a uh, new terminology. The reason for this is basically uh, we're not like as a technical um, you know, uh, person um, in this room, we're not just focusing on the uh, technology. We're not just focusing on the uh, model accuracy. We're not just focusing on the, um, the algorithms here. We also consider the other aspects of AI systems. So one way, the way that I see this is the all the you know, smart people not only focus on the um, you know, framework or algorithms to make AI system better in terms of accuracy, but also the, uh, consider the other aspects, such as the, uh, meeting the um, requirements, meeting the uh, regulations and the, and the laws as well. That's why we've got this you know, the new concept of res responsible AI. So probably um, I would like to, um, well, you know, before I uh, come to this um, conference that uh, uh, I thought myself that uh, maybe my role here is the giving you um, a bit of, you know, different view or like even like questioning um, on your, um, you know, the view here. So, um, what if we, we just you know always focus on the you know the data is biased or human is biased or even model is biased but and then you know put the uh, regulation or law or you know all the other boundaries on this matters but what if we focus on something else like um, let's say that uh, you know we've developed this great AI system is this AI system responsible? You know, do you do you have like mechanisms to provide the explainability or interpretability of the system? Then maybe yeah, that's that's all we need. Like we don't really need to uh, put red tapes to um, you know the advance the uh, technologies to um, make human beings better. So that's probably uh, my personal opinion, but that's some questions that I would like to um, raise. Um, so yeah, um, that's probably uh, my uh, comments. On, uh, yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. <웃음> 예, 아, 오늘 이제 토론자 분들께서 많은 좋은 말씀 주셨습니다. 네, 저한테 가장 직접적으로 질문을 던져 어, 주신 내용은 어, AI를 위한 새로운 법이 필요한가라는 질문이었습니다. 어, 제가 아까 발표했던 것처럼 AI 기술은 신기술입니다. 따라서 그것이 일으킬 수 있는 위험의 종류나 어, 정도는 미리 어, 사전적으로 정해지기 어렵습니다. 따라서 AI에 대해서 일률적으로 어떤 어, 강한 규제가 이루어져야 된다라는 지, 그런 주장이 잘못된 것과 마찬가지로 AI를 위해서 새로운 입법이 법적 조치가 필요 없다라고 얘기하는 것도 좀 어, 섣부른 것이라는 생각이 듭니다. 예를 들어서 자율주행 자동차가 이제 출시가 레벨 5, 4, 5 단계의 자동, 자동차가 출시가 된다면 어, 그것이 도로를 다닐 수 있도록 하기 위해서 새로운 어, 규제가 마련되어야 할 필요가 있을 것이고요. 어, 또 기존의 법 제도 가운데 새로운 어, 기술적 환경 아래에서 더 이상 타당성이 없는 것들은 수정되거나 폐지될 필요도 있을 것이고요. 그래서 주의 깊게 기술의 발전 또 그것이 사회에 미치는 영향을 살펴보면서 적절한 시기에 
적절한 수준의 입법을 할 필요가 입법적 조치를 할 필요가 있다라고 생각이 듭니다. 그리고 이제 다른 토론자분들 말씀 중에서 제가 이제 코멘트할 것이 있는가 생각을 해봤는데요. 어, 예를 몇 가지가 이제 어, 어, 제가 말씀드릴 부분이 있는 것 같습니다. 아까 데이비 교수님께서 대답을 주시긴 했습니다만 윤리와 법의 관계는 무엇이며 왜 AI에만 윤리에 관한 이야기를 어, 거듭해서 하는가 라는 질문에 대해서 저희 견해도 데이빗 교수님의 견해와 비슷합니다. 윤리라고 하는 것이 법의 토대가 되죠. 특히나 우리의 자유를 제약하는 그런 규제의 정당성 근거는 최종적으로는 윤리에서 찾을 수밖에 없습니다. 그리고 아까 발표했던 것처럼 어떤 윤리적 입장들이 다양한 윤리적 입장들이 있습니다만 어, 크게 어, 자유주의적, 공리주의적, 공동체주의적 윤리 로 이해가 될수 있고 어, 그러한 윤리적 기준에 맞춰서 새로운 규제를 형성해 에, 새로운 법을 형성해 갈 필요가 있다 이렇게 생각이 듭니다. 왜 AI에만 윤리 이야기가 계속되는가 그 이유는 AI 기술이 기본적으로 인간의 판단과 의사결정을 자동화하는 기술이기 때문입니다. 어, 매뉴얼 레이버가 아니라 우리의 판단과 의사결정에 직접 영향을 그러니까 판단과 의사결정을 직접 자동화하기 때문에 윤리 문제가 많이 나온다고 생각이 들고요. 최근 들어서는 어, 이를 넘어서서 어떤 예측, 생성, 특히 생성의 영역까지도 AI가 어, 침투하고 있기 때문에 어, 윤리 이야기를 피하기는 어렵다는 생각이 듭니다. 어, 그 다음에 어, 언더 레귤레이션과 오버 레귤레이션을 모두 피해야 한다는 이제 코멘트가 있었습니다. 그래서 음, 상당히 적절한 말씀이시기는 한데 굳이 이제 덧, 제 의견을 덧붙여 보자면 저는 오버 레귤레이션이 언더 레귤레이션보다 훨씬 어, 해롭다라는 생각을 가지고 있습니다. 왜냐하면 오버 레귤레이션을 하게 되면 우리의 자유가 부당하게 제약되기 때문입니다. 어, 언더 레귤레이션이 있을 경우에 우리가 덜 보호받는 측면이 있습니다만 어, 당초 국가라는 것이 개인을 어, 이렇게 어떤 후원자적 입장에서 어, 어, 조력을 하는 것이 국가의 기본적 가장 원초적 기능은 아니라고 생각되기 때문입니다. 그리고 마지막으로 어, 익명정보와 비식별정보와 관련해서 이제 어, 질문도 있었고 소렐 교수님께서 답변도 주셨었는데 이건 약간 어, 용어의 사용에 있어서 오, 오해가 있었던 것 같습니다. 어, 비식별 기, 기술, 비식별화, de-identification은 it's a technical term입니다. 어, 어, 그에 비해서 어, anonymous data or pseudonymous data is a legal term. 그래서 어, 비식별화가 된 정보가 익명 정보에 해당될 수도 있고 가명 정보에 해당될 수도 있습니다. 영국은 얼마 전까지 유럽의 GDPR 체제 하에 있었고 GDPR은 가명 정보에 대해서 일반적인 개인 정보와는 달리 좀 완화된 규제를 하고 있기 때문에 그 영국의 데이터 데이터 레이크였나 데이터 그, 그 메디컬 데이터의 활용이 가능해진 측면이 있다라는 생각이 들고, 어, 감형 정보도 어디까지나 개인 정보의 일종이기 때문에, 예, 일종이기 때문에, 어, 그에 대해서 어, 시, 주의 깊은 어, 취급이 필요하다는 점은 지적을 해야 될 것입니다. 다만 저는 이제 소래 교수님 견해에 동의를 하는데 기업이 어, 자신의 영업 비밀을 내놓으면서까지 어, 과연 이 제도를 이용할까라는 것에 대해서 회의적이다라는 말씀은 공감이 되고 조금 더 이제 많은 뭐 한국에도 비슷한 제도가 있습니다만은 많은 연구가 있어야 되지 않을까 어, 하는 생각이 듭니다. 감사합니다. We already ran out of time, but I think we can. Uh, if
there are some questions in the floor. You can get a couple questions. We gather a couple questions and to the presenter would have a response to the question. Um, I, I actually don't have a question, but it's actually comments um, as a practice p uh, perspective. Um, so Tom, thank you for your presentation. Um, in a practical perspective, um, we um, in the financial industry is um, having the same concerns and the pain points. Now, um, obviously, removing the red tape is very difficult. Um, and the approach that we took was to go work around what they actually want in order to um, make some leeway for the developers to progress with their AI and machine learning solutions. So a quick comment um, on that one was we introduced a concept called data products. So with the data sets, production data in the data lake, we categorize them. So in the context of medical data, you might have pathology data, you might have customer data, as well as um, prescriptions as well. All of these um, on a need basis based on the private and privacy law, um, we have segregated those into um, different blocks for the people to use. So that probably might be something that I would like to share from the Australian context. Uh, in relation to uh, the IP um, pain points, um, how we uh, tackled that was we used the legal instrument, NDA, so non-disclosure agreements. Now, uh, it is a legally binding um, document in place, uh, hence um, the governance um, committee which uh, you are chairing, um, all the members of them are signed off on the NDA so that if an organisation wants to come in and play around in the playground of the big data platform, uh, they can they can do that. So just sharing that with you. Um, the other comment that I want to share with um, Professor Lee um, was while I was listening to your um, presentation, there was a case in Australia where um, it was at the back of the Royal Commission um, where they have investigated the practices of all the uh, big four banks. Now, obviously, the defendant uh, was uh, the banks, and the bank was judged. They were questioned, and the defendant was... This was in the context of uh, financial crime. They defended themselves very well, um, saying that we follow the policy, we follow the process and the standards, etc. Uh, but... When the judge um, made his final comments, he said, uh, I understand that all the banks has followed the policy standards and the processes. However, um, a question that I want to, that this was a good remark, uh, a renowned judge saying, have you, also, uh, have you also thought about the spirit of legal? Now then that comment really um, sparked my, my mind because if I look at a lot of um, the things that you need to regulate, not all of them are possible to regulate, and then there will be dependencies and there will be clashes. Hence, I just want to um, put a open-ended question mark saying, have we actually thought about the spirit of AI? And while you were presenting, I actually looked at the dictionary saying that, oh, what is spirit? And the spirit is the attitude or intentions with which someone undertakes or regard, uh, regards something. So if we, I think there, there might be some answers towards that. So that is one uh, small comment that I wanna um, leave, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to um, respond a bit to, uh, to, to both of these, um, I mean, to what Professor Lee was saying. Um, which is there's no tension at all between being very strict in regulating AI and being liberal. There's no inconsistency there at all. Um, uh, you, you need a, an argument. <laughs> Essentially, you can be very strict with AI because it interferes with autonomy in some cases. I don't go as far as David in thinking you know, that it's a surrogate cognitive function on the scale that he seems to think creates a sort of watershed. Um, I, I think there, there are issues there. But um, you know, I don't think a general deregulatory um, uh, attitude has to be adopted across the board. Um, and, and certainly, I was saying, in the case of medical data, 
irrespective of the difference between anonymization and pseudonymization, I was simply saying the design of these platforms is already so restrictive um, and so protective of privacy that it's arguably overprotective. No autonomy is, needs to be protected that much, I was saying. It's already super protected. Um, so it's not, not at all complacent, but it is calling attention to whether some things are fetishized um, a little. That's all. Uh, we can get one more comments or the questions. That will be the, our final question. 한국말로 질문에 하겠습니다. 그 어, 영국의 그톰 소렐 교수님에게 그 영국의 상황에 대해서 좀 궁금한 게 있어서 여쭤보고 싶은데요. 그 아까 어, 데이터 레이크나 이제 그이 디지털 트랜스포메이션의 어떤 그런 정보의 정책이 강하게 추진되면서 개인 정 어, 개인 정보 어, can you hear the translation? Could you could you repeat again? Uh, your your questions. 네, 그 저기. I wonder about the UK. Yes. Uh, 네, 그 저기 영국의 그런 어, 상황에 대해서 여쭤보고 싶은데요. 그 디지털 대전환 시대에서 어, 그 데이터 레이크나 이제 이런 식의 모델이 이제 데이, 어, 데이터를 조금 더 원활하게 활용할 수 있는 어떤 그런 환경이나 생태계를 조성하려는 그런 어떤 시스템 모델이 어, 그 각국 어, 영국과 마찬가지로 한국 정부에서도 이제 많이 고민을 하고 있는 부분인데요. 그런 어, 정부의 어떤 강력한 디지털 대전환 정책의 그런 상황에서 어, 개인정보 보호의 정책에 어떤 영향이 있었는지 예를 들면 뭐 익명화의 어떤 그런 해석적인 부분이나 아니면 그 차, 차분 프라이버시라고 하는 디퍼런셜 프라이버시라고 하는 어떤 개념적인 그런 어, 개인정보에 대해서 바라보는 관점이 어떤 법적 해석에 영향을 미쳐서 구체적으로 데이터를 활용하는 데 있어서 어떤 어, 규범적 기준에 영향을 미치고 있는지 좀 궁금합니다. I can answer that. I, I mean, what, what is happening with these, um, with the Goldacre report and with, um, with some of the um, principles that have been adopted by the NHS, the so-called five safes, um, which regulate what you can do with data on a safe data environment. And basically, you can't do very much at all. <laughs> You're able to use some not very uh, sophisticated analytic tools, but you're not able to train algorithms uh, so far. So um, uh, I don't think that any of this has been thought through by a lawyer. Um, I think it's, it's sort of being developed as a kind of uh, extension of thinking behind GDPR and because it's being done by people who aren't used to thinking systematically about ethics, there are a lot of, there's, there's a lot of questions that can be asked about it. And also, one can ask, what is the UK government's goal <laughs> with respect to AI? Do they want to use it as a vehicle for, you know, economic uh, 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 dominance in the world uh, in, in a certain kind of technology? Um, if so, who are the agents of this uh, uh, type of, of, of advance? Is it researchers in universities? Is it startups? Is it any company anywhere in the world? I should tell you that in the case of Pathlake, we have applications from people in India. We have applications from, um, from some Russians who it's not clear where they're applying from. Uh, they have many addresses. Uh, the, and, and these folks are not data scientists. They're, they're people with uh, degrees in international relations who've been out of university for two years. Um, uh, all kinds of people 
are involved in this in this uh, in this game. And I don't think anybody's thought through what the regulatory regime should be. But what's happening is a lot of funding is being directed at AI, both in development of algorithms, um, these large platforms. Uh, should you be in the cloud or should you use something something else? All these kinds of questions are being at attacked simultaneously by scientists and the AI regulatory regime, I think, is sort of running to catch up, if that. I don't know whether David agrees with me. Um, so the answer is there isn't sort of sophisticated thinking uh, saying how do we update GDPR to deal with every single kind of AI and certainly not with medical data. But the reason that medical data is so important is because the data set that, that exists in the UK is globally absolutely un unique. Um, the size of it, the, the longitudinal detail of it, it's in many, many different ways an absolute treasure that one wants to protect against loads of people. So um, I don't think any of that's been thought through properly. <laughs> Okay, uh, we've covered various issue, ethical issues in our sessions, and probably the ethical question will be the one of the most heated but sensitive questions that we have. And how to deal with the such ethical question is the one um, unavoidable one that we have. And I hope that the our discussion today would contribute to broadening and deepening our understanding of the ethics and AI. Thank you for all the participants and your enthusiastic presentation and active discussions and the audience. Thank you. That's, that's all for the, our session, second session. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to be finishing the story.